IB Nation, welcome back to the Irish Breakdown Podcast live here on a Monday, which means it's time for Notre Dame football mailbag. We are just gotten the spring football season officially kicked off. You know, we had some coverage late last week. It started on Thursday, and we are just going to be rolling into the future, my friends. Sunday, St. Patrick's Day, we're going to have the big pot of gold offer events. So you're going to see a lot of 2026 football recruits that are going to be offered by the University of Notre Dame. I think we saw an initial list a little bit and there's like over 80 guys that are going to be offered that day. So you guys better get ready for that. Of course, we'll have spring football. Brian is continuing to give you guys the spring previews of each position. And we're going to be talking obviously about the practice availabilities in the future, but every Monday, no matter what, unless scheduling, I guess conflicts, but otherwise we're always going to have a football bell. We'll let you know ahead of time if it's (laughs) not going to happen, but yes, sir. Folks, it's a great way to get a week started because little <clears throat> transparency for y'all. I'm a little bit sleep deprived, but anything that can get you juiced up for a Monday, nothing more than a football mailbag because you all, the great chat members at IB Nation, get to lead this conversation. So if you are new with us here for the first time or you don't listen to rules very well, I'm going to lay out the rules. Mailbag <laughs> or an MB before the question in the chat. To help me and Brian distinguish what is a mailbag question and what is you guys just having a nice little banter in the chat. So we're ready to get started here, though. You can ask as many mailbag questions as you want. We will be here as long as it takes, and we will answer every question hey, hold on. that is doable. The, there is a limit. As long yeah. as it takes. We would be doing some seven-hour shows, but we're going to do as right. much as we can, right. and I am oh, yeah, very, true. very much true. looking forward to true. it. Yeah. True, true, true. Yes, very yeah. good point. Very yep. good point. And, yes. and no alien that's, questions, Tommy. Let's get right. No, no alien questions. No, que- that's not that's not meant to be. It's, let's start here with my man Anthony Solomon. Anthony with the super chat. Anthony, thank you so much for super chat. It's always very much appreciated. I should have mentioned in the intro that super chats get thrown up to the beginning of the line. So if you want to get your question in as soon as possible, super chats are very preferred. And thank you so much, Anthony. As always. Says, Brian, I hope the renovation is going well. I appreciate the quality content during this difficult time. Yeah, it has been surprisingly harder than I thought it was going to be to get content done, Ryan. You know how much, I mean, I'm driving back and forth from one place to the other, and it's uh, been a challenge. It's been like, I even thought today, I was like, oh, hey, the guy just left. The guy doing the flooring just left, and and maybe I'll do one from, from here. And then, of course, they pull back up, and there's been some you know, as you expect, Ryan, some problems along the way, they drilled the hole that, you know, we're getting an Island put in and they drilled the hole that's going to go up to the Island to give the electricity in the wrong spot. So it was like out and about. So they had to do all that. It's just been like, it's been a lot of headaches, but I'm told that that's typical of this type of thing. And um, yeah, so our new fridge is going to come in next week, our new washer dryer, because that was where the root of all the things happened was the washer uh, problem. But yeah, it's been uh, it, it's it's going it's getting there, Ryan. About two more th- two or three more weeks left, but at least there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel now. We actually have floors now, which is nice. nice. You know, we've been walking on these, you know, what's underneath our floors, but they laid the flooring down late last week, and so that's nice. So the girls are happy about that because they can run out to the bathroom, you know, through their normal way now, and uh, so it, it's been good. And uh, you know, just li- finally seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, man. That's that's the exciting thing. So I appreciate you, Anthony. How, how, house renovations and repairs are always fun. I think Henry oh. David Thoreau had it right. We just need to just get rid of all our worldly possessions, go out into the woods, and just live by ourselves next to Walton Ponds. I think that that's going to happen. If I, uh, I, I, I've been talking to Angie about this. I'm trying to get her to quit her job and <laughs> do my, you know, because she's always like, I want to have a garden and I want to do this and I want to do that. I was like, we well, can't do all that when you're working as much as I am. So, right. so, but, uh, yeah, we finally got our garden, um, sort of it, when we bought it, it was just overflown with weeds and we've been dealing with that um, for six years. And this past summer, uh, we finally had a kid from local high school that was doing some, it was mowing our lawn. He was like, Hey, I'll, I'll clean that nice. out for you. And so he cleaned it out, he mulched it, he, you know, so we're going to get, um, some raised flower beds to put in or raised garden 
beds to put in this year. So yeah, I, uh, I, that would be great, Ryan. You know me, I'd find a place out in the middle of nowhere, set up myself a nice little shooting range and oh yeah, yeah, it'd be wonderful, but I don't have money like that. So I can't, <laughs> can't do that. Unfortunately, you just, you, you just, you just live by, by the, uh, by the land, yeah. man. You, yeah. you hunt your own food and you yeah. make your own fires and yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm glad I was born in the the generation I was born in. So yeah, let's yes. rock it. Let's rock and roll with some football and some uh, some recruiting questions and some team questions and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we, plan. gonna start off a little recruiting question, all right? From Riker Ferg. Riker, thank you so much. Thoughts on the new December signing day period? So for people that missed this announcement, there's potentially a third signing day. It might be added in 2025, but for 2024, they basically had moved up the. December signing day up a couple weeks. So it's the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, but before conference championships. So they kind of tucked it in between Thanksgiving and conference championships. It's before kind of the championship is. games, not after. That's so it's, ridiculous. I, I believe it's a week before the championship games, but it's after Thanksgiving. So it's like tucked right in the middle e- there. Either yeah. way, it's dumb yeah. in my opinion, <laughs> right? I mean, the whole point was to take some of this December burden off of coaches. So now every team that's playing in a conference championship game has to balance between getting their players signed and coaching. It just it's silly. But yeah, the the only look. Let's be real. The only reason they're moving it up is because they want to get guys signed before coaches leave. Exactly. Let's be honest about that's the only justification there. The whole the whole talking point was, you know, we need to change the December period and, and start one at the beginning of the year, blah, 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 because the December period is just too stressful, too busy. And it is. It's right. insane what these coaches have on their plates. They got to deal with the transfer portal. They yeah. got to get kids signed. There's like 80 plus teams are playing in bowl games now. It's crazy. You know, like yep. it's just nuts. And you've got Christmas. It's it, it's it's too much on their plates. It, it is. I will defend them till to the to the hilt. But then they don't want to make the sacrifices to make it lighter because they don't want the early signing period in this. Like the big coaches don't want the summer signing period, right? Because the summer signing period means like those kids you can't recruit and you can't flip and you can't do all these kind of things, right? Sure. The only yeah. reason to move it up this much in December is because it, less chance that you lose kids when your coaches leave. That's right. all it is to me, Ryan. And so I I, I think there should be you, you two signing even, periods, February yeah. and either June or July, the mm-hmm. late June, late July, one of those two, but, and then, then February. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's what they're talking about in 2025 is a potential, um, a potential third signing day and early signing day in June. I would actually like it a little bit further back into the summer because right. I think June's a little bit early. Like it's a little bit early it's for right a guy after, making the full decision. Yeah, you know what I mean? Official like, visits. Like, yeah. like late July, like cool. You want to sign and you're good to go. Let's let's rock. Even if you like, wanted to do mid July, because you know yeah. you, late July you're getting ready for fall camp. I, I kind of understand that, right? But at least move it back to middle of July because, like you said, Ryan, these kids are taking visits all through June, mm-hmm. and exactly. you know it, it's a. It's a process. You don't want to make but, an impulse decision. Mm-hmm. Like it'd be nice to have a couple weeks to like make sure that you're fully committed and you're fully solidified. And yeah, it, it's just I mean the December thing with like the the moving of the signing days is, is part of it. Also, was I, I I heard someone one time I was like you know oh it's it's also because you're right it is very difficult on coaches in in December like it it is a lot of hustle and bustle and hecticness especially around Christmas time. But you moved up the you're moving up the signing day right after Thanksgiving too, right? So it's not like you're just fully you know getting away from you know giving them their christmas and stuff it's like now they're you're ruining their thanksgiving you know what i mean right. you're gonna be on the on the phones the whole time during thanksgiving right. when it's supposed to be another big family holiday right so i i don't think right. that it's a a fix to either side of it like i think it is what it is i'm just very interested to see what they do with that potential early signing day period because i think that they that can do a lot of good if done right but we'll see if they do right. it right or not yeah i have little optimism that they're gonna do it right we had another question from, and this is Super Chat, from AST12321. Thank you so much. Barring any injury in the quarterback room, do you think odds are greater than 75% that Steve Angeli is quarterback two for every regular season game? I, I would say less than 75%, just personally. And and again, you guys know where this comes from. This just comes from, I just don't think Steve has the talent of other players in the roster. And I think the advantage he had last year of being so much old, you know, more experienced in the system is somewhat gone now because they are learning a new system. 
Now, right. Steve has made a habit since he's committed to Notre Dame of proving me wrong. And if he does again, great. I have nothing against Steve Angeli. I just look, Ryan, I'm at practice and I watch these kids throw and it just it's just different. It's just different when Kenny Minchie and CJ Carr throw it. And and so to me, the only way that I could see them justifying having Steve as quarterback number two once we get to the fall is if they're just saying we he, he's experienced. That that right. that's the only reason I could see it. So um good kid. I, you know, and I don't love talking down on him because everything I hear about him is just exactly what you want. The couple of times I've talked to him, he's been super kind and gracious. I, I think he's a phenomenal young man. It's just I have to call him like I see him. And there's just other kids that have significantly better physical gifts than what he right. has. So, um, but like I said, Steve Angeli has made a living making me, you know, like I didn't, I don't think he's that good of a player. And he goes out in a bowl game and has plays pretty well, you know, yeah. does a lot of good things. And so uh, if he proves me wrong again, great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not rooting against the kid, but I just think the other kids are better. So I I would go lower than 75%. If there's a real competition for number two, right? I'd go lower than 75%. Because let's be honest, Ryan, you heard Marcus yeah. Raymond. There's no quarterback competition at the number one spot. Let's be honest about that. I think there most is. people understand that. Most people understand. I would also – He I has also, to also, say that, by the way. He has sure. to say that. Well, I would I would also say this too, Brian. To lower the, the it under 75, I too, I think that you need to – under because like let's say hypothetically – Steve Angeli is your backup quarterback the entirety of the 2024 season. Let's just say that in theory. There's also a, a, a like there's also a reality where what if Riley Leonard's banged up for a game and someone has to start in that instance, someone else is going to be QB two, right? Someone else is going to be the main backup in that football game. So I think when you're talking about just him fighting for the backup job with two other very talented quarterbacks on the roster, on top of what if an injury happens? You know, what if something sustained? There's a bunch of things that I think. What if he gets hurt? You know, God forbid Steve gets hurt and then he's relegated to QB4 in an emergency situation, let's say. I mean, those things happen all the time. So I would say less than that just because things change so quickly in college football, man. They really do. Yeah. I mean, it's we'll, we'll see what happens. But there's a lot that obviously could change between now and September and September into December. Like a lot of things could change in between those two periods. Yeah. Yep. Andy Estime Trucking LLC. I wonder if he's going to rebrand now that Audric is not a part of Notre Dame anymore. But that he's we'll Audric for we'll life, man. I think Audric for yep. life. All right. <laughs> Which teams or team or teams? Colorado, Michigan State, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, and Nebraska. Do you anticipate making the biggest jump from last season, and why? You know, Ryan, it, it's kind of funny. I, I actually there's a couple teams on there that I think are going to be better teams than they were last year but i don't know that it's going to necessarily be reflected in the schedule and georgia tech's the first one that pops in my head because i actually really like that roster right i mean for like a mid-level yep. like power five team they've got a quarterback that's a dynamic run throw kind of kid i'm i just he's not dynamic run throw guy. he's just a dynamic playmaker you know he yep. makes a ton of mistakes but the guy you know makes a lot of plays they've got some good athletes they've done well in the portal the, the running problem back's is good. number 11 yes. i forget his name but he can he the, bounce he pops the problem is, Ryan, their schedule this year is brutal. I mean, they they open the season up playing Florida State and Ireland. They have to play at North Carolina. They have to play at Virginia Tech. They have to play at Georgia. Their home games are against NC State, Miami, Duke, and and oh, they also play at Syracuse. Although I, I don't, oh, they also play at Louisville and at Syracuse. The Louisville game is going to be extremely hard. So think about that, Ryan. Away from home, they're playing Florida State and Ireland. Louisville on the road, North Carolina on the road, Virginia Tech on the road, George on the road. They get NC State at home, Miami at home, Duke at home, and they have to play Notre Dame. It's at home, but they've given up playing on campus to play at Mercedes-Benz. So it's right. not even on their campus now. That is a brutal schedule. And yep. so I think it's going to be harder for them to make that jump beyond seven and six so they could have a better team but the record won't, won't reflect it because of yep. that schedule. Uh, but of those teams, I mean, look, I think Nebraska's got a chance to make a several game jump this year, Ryan. I think Virginia Tech has a chance to make a jump this year. They've got a quarterback that I really like now that he's kind of their guy for the whole season. And, uh, you know, their schedule's not easy either, but it's more manageable, certainly more manageable than the one that that uh, Georgia Tech has. Georgia Tech plays Notre Dame and in, in, uh, Georgia at a conference. 
Virginia Tech's out of conference schedule is Vanderbilt, Marshall, Old Dominion, so and and uh, and Rutgers. That's their out of conference schedule. So Ooh, fight Rutgers. and they and they they do get Clemson at home, but they don't have to play Florida State or North Carolina. So their schedule is a lot more manageable. Colorado, yep. I think, is going to be better. I think the team that could make the biggest jump, Ryan, for me. Uh, so to get to the to the answer, now that I've done all this role, you know, going around, even though I don't think they're going to be the best team of this group, well, I think they're going to make the biggest jump is Michigan State because they have the furthest to go. Like they they sure. they're, they were the worst team last year of this group. Or they like three and nine, four and four and eight last year. Jonathan Smith. Really excellent coach, in my opinion. Brought yep. over a lot of the guys with him from Oregon State. And getting Aiden Childs to come with him to, to be his quarterback, to me, was important. They're not going to be a great team, but I could see them jumping into bowl eligible. I'll say this. He has gone to bowl games with rosters that aren't as good as the one he'll have at Michigan State, in my opinion, uh, early in his tenure at Oregon State. So uh, that would probably be the one that I think could make the biggest jump, even though I don't think they're going to be the best team of this group. sure out, out of those teams and i think they're very interesting teams ndsme trucking lc by the way i think that you put some very interesting rising teams on the in, the couch football landscape i would go colorado as one of my two just because you now have a second year on the fbs level with Shadur sanders you have a second year with 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 travis hunter you have some talent obviously skill talents i think the biggest thing about colorado last year is they're offensive and defensive lines were awful like it was really bad although i think a couple of their pickups offensive line wise are very overrated i would say that is their offense if you ask me point blank do i think colorado's offensive line is gonna be better this year than it was last year yes absolutely yeah. for overrated sure. but awful. still better than the yeah really oh, not very better. good players they had and, last year. and and they're going into the big 12 which right. i think i mean the pac-12 last year was a loaded conference really man good. there was a lot of good teams yeah. big 12 i think you'll have Decent depth. Like, I think there are some good teams in the Big 12, yeah. but I think that Colorado will be on a more level playing field with some of those teams compared to where they were with the Big 12, Pac 12 last year. So I think Colorado's one. The other one I'm really buying into is Virginia Tech. I was not a big f fan of the Brent Pry uh, hire. Like, I think that Brent Pry is a really good coach uh, as a defensive coordinator. I wasn't sold on him being a head coach, but year two under him, they bought in, man. I, I, I mean, the roster bought in, and they didn't have a ton of defections this offseason either. So you got yeah. Kyron Drones, a quarterback. You got their pass pass rusher Powell Rowland, who was quietly one of the more productive pass rushers in college football last year. He's coming back. The running backs coming back. That's pretty productive for them. So I think Virginia Tech's and their their left tackle Xavier Chaplin, I think, is one of the young stars of offensive linemen in college football. The starting left tackle number sixty five. So all that together, I think Virginia Tech is on a very good trajectory with Brent Pry. I think they've bought in. And I think they believe with what he's what he's preaching to them, which I think is obviously part the biggest hurdle that you have to get over when rebuilding a program. And, and Ryan, can we talk about how important it, how Virginia Tech is such an example of how important it is to have a good quarterback? I mean, they were such a different team when they went from Grant Wells to Kyron Droves. I mean, they were yeah. such a good team. Uh, and, and, and they didn't get Baylor a lot wishes of... That they could, Baylor wishes oh, that they could have yes. kept drones now, man. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And they didn't get a lot of transfers. They only got four transfers, but they picked up Aeneas Peebles, which was a yes. really underrated pickup. He was actually Duke's most productive interior defensive lineman last year from a, like a tackles for loss and stat sacks kind of standpoint in that rotate because they had the the two kids, Dwayne Carter and, and Jamie on Franklin, who were kind of the big power guys. And then sometimes yeah. they put Dwayne uh, Carter outside and put yeah. Aeneas inside, and then, of course, Aeneas would rotate in with them, and he was he's a completely different player, undersized, athletic, fits really well into what they're trying to do at Virginia Tech. So that was a very sneaky good pickup for Virginia Tech and, as and well. They, and they got him away from Penn State because I was told that Peebles was probably going to go to Penn State and because obviously we know Brent Pry's uh, ties to Penn State. But the other thing that I think is a good sign for them building is that Brent Pry made a living off of recruiting Virginia really well when he yeah. was at Penn State. So I think keeping some of those in-state yep. talent at Virginia Tech, it's a good sign of things to come, I think. Because I think it's good yep. when Virginia Tech's good, man. Like for a long it time, is. it was just a dependable, good, tough, good, just very good football team under Coach Beamer. So I think getting them back would be a good thing for college football. That's what, that's what Frank Beamer did that really got him rolling at Virginia Tech. He focused so hard on the in-state kids. 
Like if you go back and look at Virginia, they were they were getting some Virginia kids, obviously, especially early in Chris and George Walsh's tenure. I mean, you know, look at a lot of the guys. I think Sean Moore was from Virginia. I think Herman, uh, well, Chris Slade was, and and uh, Terry Kirby and a lot of those guys. But like they yeah. would do a lot of Pennsylvania, a lot of Jersey. You mm-hmm. know, some of the academic type of kids. Frank Beamer hammered, especially when I was in high school. You know, he was. It was such an important like everywhere I went when I started recruiting Virginia back in the early two thousands. Everywhere I went, I would always see a Virginia Tech coach. They hammered the in-state kids. Like, you remember Ryan Williams running back, Ryan? I remember sitting with his coach, and Virginia Tech had just left talking with him. And and they just made a living recruiting state of Virginia. And they went away from that. Yeah. Justin Fuente went away from that for a while. And then, uh, you know, the, the other coaches since since him, have, or before him, or excuse me, not since him, but one of the things Brent Pry has done since he's replaced him is he's tried to get back to Virginia. And you look at their signing class this year, their high school signing class, Ryan, it's Maryland, Virginia, 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 Ohio, North Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina, North Carolina, Iowa, Maryland, Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, Florida, Georgia. It's a lot of Virginia kids in there. But also yeah. the Maryland DC area, the North Carolina area, that's where he made his living back in the day. And so, oh. and I think I see one, two, like there's let's see two kids from, from Virginia Beach. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's an area that was huge for them back in the day that they've got to get back to as well. So um, yeah, he he's he's doing some good things. And and to your point, not having a bunch of kids jump in the portal says a lot yeah. about the buy-in Absolutely. that he's getting within the program as well. It's a very good point. Yeah. Well, I, I think you're in a good area that, you know, you, you start out by making sure that there's a little bit, you're not going to put a full fence around Virginia, but a, a little bit of a fence to be able to keep a lot of in-state talent in. But then you can extend a little bit more to the DMV Catholic schools, right? To get into those schools. Then you can have, obviously he has some, he has some roots in Pennsylvania. So maybe you get up to Pennsylvania a little bit into New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Like you have a base where you can bring in some talent if you're Virginia Tech, yep. especially with Virginia still kind of, just not being yeah. a, a much of a threat in state right now. So you can and kind they of just don't fight. recruit the same kind of guys in state, right? I mean, they just never have Virginia and Virginia Tech are looked at completely different. One's kind of the, the uppity, you know, white collar type of school. The other's a blue collar type of school, the perception wise, you know, and, and uh, it, it's very interesting, very interesting, but those are all interesting teams. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how all they do. Colorado, Ryan, you, you brought up going to the big 12, they yeah. didn't do themselves any favor out of conference this year. They're kicking the season off at home against North Dakota State. Then they Ooh. play at Nebraska, at Colorado. Their Big 12 schedule is Baylor at home, at UCF, home against K-State, at Arizona, mm-hmm. home against mm-hmm. Cincinnati, at Texas Tech, home against Utah, at Kansas, home against Oklahoma State. So it's very challenging, but as you said – the one difference is, is in the Pac-12, there were teams that were that were still much more athletic than them around the roster. Yeah. You're not going to get quite that in the Big sure. 12. I mean, there's still some athletic teams in the Big 12, but not to the level of like you've got to play Oregon, you've got to play USC, and you've got to play UCLA and teams like that. It's just a different animal in, in the Big 12. It so is. I'm curious to see how they're going to do this year. But I still feel like in the Big 12, if you're not good up front, you're still going to struggle. And that's kind of where I still see a little bit of that problem. I'm, I'm with you on that. Good question. All right. I think, did we have a super chat? Nope. We didn't have a super chat down there. Let's get back to Irish blooded. Irish blood said after, well, sorry, other than Marcus Freeman, if you had to choose one current college football head coach to lead Notre Dame to that coach's first college national championship, who would it be? I'd, that's a good one. I'd probably go Kalen DeBoer. And the, yeah. and the reason I say that, Ryan, is because he has shown he doesn't need a bunch of five-star players. He's a great, great X's and O's guy, and he can develop players. I mean, he's just been a winner. I feel like that Kirby Smart's right now, you know, I think has the the best resume in college football, right? I mean, of, of the guys yeah. still in the game. But I don't know if you know, would I don't know that Kirby would thrive in South Bend, Indiana, re- recruiting the way he'd have to recruit. I, I don't know that it would be the same from a town acquisition standpoint. And so can Kirby win with not having the best roster out there? Well, he has never done that. You know, Georgia, mm-hmm. he's always had the best roster. Kalen DeBoer has shown he can win without having the best roster. Sure. And you think about what he could do with some of the quarterback talent that Notre Dame has right now. Like, just take away Notre Dame. Let's just say this current staff isn't part of the equation. This isn't to say, oh, he'd be better than Mike Denver. I'm not – it's not the point. 
the point is, is that if he was the head coach, imagine what he could do with the talent he'd have at Notre Dame with this receiving core and this quarterback room and things along those lines. Could you imagine like junior version of CJ Carr playing for Kalen DeBoer yeah. or junior version of Kenny Minchie playing for Kalen DeBoer? It'd be fun to watch in my opinion. So he, he's probably who I would go with. I mean, I think the favoritism obviously plays in here. So it's who you like, right? So Kyle Whittingham has always been my guy and he's kind of, Similar ish cloth to what you just said. I mean, he's obviously a defensive guy compared to DeBoer being an offensive guy, but he has won a lot of football games with a lot less talent compared to some of his opposition. So, Kyle Whittingham for me. Well, and personality wise, he'd fit in Notre Dame, right? I mean, very blue collar. You know, people would like him. You know, guys would want to coach with him. So, yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a good one. It's funny. Defensive guy goes with Kyle Whittingham. Offensive guy yeah. goes with Caleb DeBoer. Well, very uh, on brand for us, Ryan. Very on brand. Yes. Had next question was yeah. from sorry. I'm trying to mix it up. I'm trying to not always, <laughs> you know, there's some people that got their questions in early, so I'm trying to mix it up a little bit. Ida Benami says, Brian, Josh Pate used your great Notre Dame independence analogy about the 1980s on his show last night. That's the top argument for our Notre Dame family. We had somebody else had mentioned that as well. So um, now Josh did say that he was going to use it. He said in our show that he was going to use it. So I, I kind of anticipated. Uh, Reese Whitman also said it. He said, Coach D, did you see that Josh Pate used the knowledge you taught him about college football independence on a show last night? Thank you for the great content as always. Well, you are, you are both welcome. But um, let, me, let me bring this one from Iden back up. Well, I guess I, I unstarted already. But, yes, Iden and, and Reese, he said he was going to use it because here, here's the reason I wanted to bring Josh on. A, he's knowledgeable. He knows what he's talking about. And B, he's fair. He's on, he's intellectually honest. And 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 what I what I how I evaluate intellectual honesty, Ryan, is you do your due diligence to learn things, not spend things, but learn things. And anyone who is intellectually honest and has con, you know core convictions is gonna you're gonna have to give me something to change my mind. But if you can change my mind, like I, I heard, um, uh, I was listening to an interview that Andrew Clavin did uh, recently, a little snippet of it. But he said, "I don't mind being proven wrong because if I get proven wrong, it means I learned something." We should always thirst for knowledge and and search for knowledge. And sometimes you have the knowledge and you know it, but if somebody can prove you wrong or, or give you insight that maybe like, "Hey, I know this to be right, but I just don't know how to argue it," and then you hear someone argue it. And he's like, hey, that's a great way of arguing it. So that's the reason I wanted to have Josh on because he is intellectually honest. He's someone who has an open mind about things. He's He's got core convictions, but he's also open to learning. And, and that's something I think we should all strive for. And so when I said that to him and he used it, because the, the point I made, Ryan, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to it. I know you've had no. some sick kids the last couple of weeks, but... You know, it, it was this whole independence thing about, you know, these, these fans saying, oh, you know, why does they think they're better than us and et cetera. And I, and I pointed out that in 1988, when Notre Dame won the national title, the number one, two, four, and five teams in the country were all independent teams. And in the 1980s, so there's 10 champions for, from 80 to 89, there's 10 champions. Six of the 10 champions were independents. Miami, Notre Dame, and uh, uh, Penn State all won titles that year. Notre Dame won one, Penn State won two, Miami won three. And there was only like there was like a big there was a big big eight team. You had an ACC team because Clemson won it. You had an SEC team. Georgia won it, and there was one other. But you know, it, Notre Dame never changed. Everyone else changed. Everybody else went away from independent as they pursued money. So this whole thing, Notre Dame's greedy. No, they all left for bigger dollars. It wasn't Notre Dame that changed? It wasn't Notre Dame that was greedy? It was everybody else that was greedy? Notre Dame has has been. They turn down it's, bigger deals. It's kind of or, funny because I, I feel like more teams got actually around them got greedy, but it also made Notre Dame more valuable because they kept their independence. Right. right? Which is kind of but funny like, how that works. Yeah. But Notre Dame from a pure TV dollar standpoint loses money by staying independent. That's that's known, but they just they don't need that. You know, they don't need the TV dollars to survive. Where a lot of these people don't think they can't make ends meet it without the TV dollars. So it is kind of funny, but it was a good conversation, and I'm glad that Josh uh, did what he said he was going to do, which is is use that in the Notre Dame conversation. I didn't get a chance to listen to it yet, but I'm going to go back after the show and listen to it. I like Josh. So, yeah, if you haven't li if you haven't listened to him, I would encourage you to listen to him. You know, he's yeah. he's got a little bit of SEC tilt, but he's very fair uh, and very knowledgeable. It's a different type of show than ours. It's not a 
dive deep in a scheme and X's and O's. It's more of like a sur- not surface level because that sounds disrespectful. Before more big picture topics yeah, of broad, conversation, broad yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. right. Yep. And, and which you have to be when you're covering all of college football. You can't yes. dive. We can do. We can afford to take those deep dives because we cover one team. Right. You know, right. but uh, it's a little bit different. But yeah, it, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Can, can I just say it's nice to see Tommy Guns back in the chat. I feel like I haven't seen him yeah. in like 20 days or something. It's I been don't know. Wild, right? Where's he been, Ryan? I don't know. <laughs> it's like he was in a different identity or something for a period of time. Yes. I don't know. <sighs> Gosh. All right. Skylar at the back on track top five teams in each of the power five conferences for the season. And how would Notre Dame rank in each five? If that conf- in that conference. Well, I mean, look, I have Notre Dame as a top seven to eight team this year, you know, seven to 10 is fair. I think with some of the losses that teams have had, I think Notre Dame should be ranked ahead of Bama. I think Notre Dame should be ranked ahead of Michigan. Now teams like that, uh, you know, but, but they're, there's ranked as high as five. So, I mean, they're going to be top one or two in, in every conference, every conference or, you right. know what I mean? So that that's it right there. Like we have a question about you know, how they fare this schedule. I mean, it, you know, going into the season, Notre Dame is going to be in the top two and every, I think they'd be, I, I would say, I'm trying to think of, they'd be second in the big 10 for me mm-hmm. behind Ohio state. They'd be second or third in the sec behind Georgia. Yeah. Maybe Ole Miss, Ryan, maybe. Just because Ole Miss was eleven and two last year, sure. ranked in the top ten, they had a they had a better record than Notre Dame. They had some big wins last year, and they had a really good portal session. I would rather have Notre Dame's team than Ole Miss's team, but I, I think if you're being fair, you can make a case for that. Mm-hmm. But at worst, third, they should be ranked higher than LSU. They should be ranked higher than Bama. They should be ranked higher than anybody else in the SEC. In the Big Twelve, they'd be ranked number one. In the yes, uh, ACC, for me, they'd be ranked number number two. Uh, about, maybe uh, number um, one. How about in the pack two? Where do you think they would rank? The pack two? I don't know, man. They're definitely top three for sure in the pack. Two. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They'd clearly be number one in the pack, the pack two. I'd probably put Notre Dame first over Clemson just because I think Notre Dame still had an overall better team than Clemson. I think Notre Dame has a better situation yeah. coming back, but I do like what Clemson has coming back. And the fact is they beat Notre Dame like soundly last season. I mean, they were in control of that game from start to finish. So you can't discount that. So, you know, at sure. worst, number two, I would have Notre Dame. I mean, Ryan, you know, I've I've talked about how I think this Florida State team is still going to be pretty good, but I don't see them being thirteen and zero good like they were last. I think they're more ten and two, which means I yep. have have them below Notre Dame. So sure. I, I'd have them first or second in every one. I think the only one you could make you could argue with them being third would be the SEC. I I personally would have them higher than Ole Miss. Ryan, I don't know what your thoughts are. I would have them are. higher than Ole Miss. I was thinking about like Texas coming in though. Like that would be an interesting the SEC. Uh, yes, yeah. that's that's yeah. it. Yeah, Texas deserves to be ranked Maybe higher third. Than yes. Maybe third, right? So third. still third, but different team ahead yeah. of them. And and so, yep, that's a good how, one. How, how, about, how about the Big Ten with Oregon coming in? You still have no nah, I, I still I, I do. If, because they're – it comes down to I like Dylan Gabriel, but I just – I would tr- – in, in a – Game between him and Riley Leonard, I'm taking Riley Leonard. I think Notre Dame had fewer bad losses than what Oregon had. I mean, they had some really big losses last season. I just think overall their record is – or their their uh, their roster's better. And I think Oregon was a very good team last year, no doubt. But when I look at Oregon last year, Ryan, I, I just my, – my, my question is similar to kind of what people say about Notre Dame. My thing is, who'd they beat? Right. They, they only played – one team all year that was really good and that was Washington and they lost both games. You know, I mean, their, their next best win is what Liberty. Right. Right. I mean, they beat USC by nine. I think it was like two weeks after Notre Dame destroyed them, you know, so, you know, actually three weeks after I destroyed them. So I, 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 it's hard to count the, you know, the org, they both blew out Oregon state, but that's really hard. That's really unfair to compare them because, Oregon beat a much better Oregon State team than the one Notre Dame beat, if we're being honest. Uh, so I, you know, I like Oregon, but losing Bo Nix, losing Bucky Irving, losing Troy Franklin, losing the corner. What's his name? It's Kyrie. Is it Ky- how do you say his name? The Kyrie Jackson. Jackson. Kyrie. Kyrie. They lost some good players. That's some guys coming back, but they lost some really good players. And and I just would I would take Riley Leonard over Dylan Gabriel. That's just that's just my thing. So um, mm-hmm. you could make, but you could. Ryan, I'll say this, Ryan. That's my case for Notre Dame. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you for ten minutes if you want to take mm-hmm. Oregon. They were a better team last year than Notre Dame was. That just they were. Yeah. And if we're doing it based off 
where teams were last year, then obviously they'd be behind. But and and the one Big Ten team that other people bring up is Penn State. I definitely don't think that Notre Dame. Oh should no, be I would have Notre Dame above Penn State. Yeah, I would have Notre Dame above Penn State. Yeah, no doubt. yeah, yeah. Now top five teams in each conference, Ryan. Uh, Big Ten. Let's just go no particular order. Just you know, here's the five: Ohio State for me, yep. Oregon as you mentioned for me. Uh, mm-hmm. Penn State is a top five team in that league. Mm-hmm. After that, I, I really think Michigan's going to take a big step back next year. I See, I, I don't actually. I, I don't like know. a step back as in like Convince maybe me, right? they're I'm open to it. Yeah, like, maybe they're nine and three or ten and two. Like I, I could see that, but like I don't think they're going to like fall off the face of the earth in the big time. I really don't. I, I see them being like an eight and four team next year. To be honest with you, see. their schedule's yeah. really rough. I don't I know who that. they're now. Now my opinion could change post spring if they get a quarterback. Sure. That's that's really where a lot of it comes oh, from. Apparently they like the orgy kids, so we'll see. I don't we'll know. We'll see. We'll, we'll yeah. see. Uh Michigan's in the conversation there. I'm trying to think of some other teams. I'm curious to see what kind of jump that Wisconsin is gonna make. I don't love you know, I like Tyler Van Dyke. I, mm-hmm. I we haven't seen him be the guy he was a couple years ago in a while. And mm-hmm. I don't I don't love that fit in that offense, to be honest with you. Um Wisconsin's in the conversation. I think Washington's going to take a big step back. That is one oh, yeah. team for sure that's going to have a, a tough drop. Any, who would be your Iowa? Five? Maybe Iowa. Iowa maybe. Yeah, that's maybe yeah, that's Iowa. That Iowa. They're always. Going I mean, they, they won like ten games last year, didn't they? I know it's going to be a yeah. now, and but <laughs> they get uh, Cade McNamara in the back next year, which I think should help them. And, and I do, yeah. I did. I mean, their 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 OC hire was a solid hire. It wasn't a great one. It's Tim Lester's a solid offensive line, but it's way better than what they had. Yeah. Way better than what they had. And if Caden yeah. McNamara gets hurt again, I think your boy from Jersey is going to be in a better position to Lane take is. over that job as opposed to Marco, Deacon Hill. Marco. Yeah. Yep, and he gives them a much more um, kind of I know that, playmaker. I, I, know they, I know they probably wanted to preserve the red shirt, but I could not believe that they didn't go to Lane is some, t- some point last year when yeah. they were trying out Deacon Hill at quarterback. <laughs> I think it was honestly, Ryan, I think you said you nailed it, the red shirt, but it's just kind of like, look, yeah. we can beat these teams we're playing with. We're not playing for national title. We can beat the teams we're playing by just running the ball and playing defense because the Big Ten right. West last year was bad. Yes, it, it was bad. really bad. Yes. And um I remember even know. watching them against Michigan, man. And I'm like, dude, if they had a competent quarterback, yes. just okay offensively, like they would have been in that game. It yeah. was just they couldn't do anything against the Michigan defense, like at yeah. all. Like, so I like awful. that, Ryan. So we'll go Ohio State, Oregon, yeah. Penn State, Michigan, Iowa. Is that okay. is that fair yeah. for that one? Yeah. Uh, ACC, it's it's in again, no particular or Clemson, Louisville, Florida State is mm-hmm. is there for me. I'm going to have okay. Virginia Tech in my top five just because yeah. I like their schedule, their quarterback. I'm trying to think who the top, who who would be just again, this guy's just off the top of our head. And we haven't like really, really yeah. broken this down. ACC is kind of rough. Georgia Tech, maybe. I don't know. Georgia Tech. There's, in there. I would, I would like that. Well, because ACC, yeah. you know, they're not, we can't count the Georgia Notre Dame games because they'll be in the ACC. Right. Miami's an interesting team, you know, getting Cameron Ward. I think that I'll, could make I'll, them. I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, I'll I'm it with I you. See it with Miami. <laughs> that that could make them interesting to watch this season. North Carolina with Max Johnson, I just don't love to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, they were a four loss team with Drake May. You know, right. where are they going to be? Although I do love Ontario Hampton. He's a really good back. Yeah, he's a good runner. Yeah. So that that would be I'm trying. Uh, NC State. There you go. That that's it. I'll, I'll take NC State yeah. as my fifth for now. Dave Dorn always feels a solid football team, right? He does. And, and, and the kid they got a quarterback, I think, is is he's very overrated from a national standpoint, but he's a really good fit for Robert and I's offense, what, in my opinion. Oh, they got uh, oh yeah, they got uh, Grayson McCall still, right? Yeah. Grayson McCall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Grayson McCall. Yeah. yeah and they've fine. got some good talent at skill positions. Like, you know what I mean? Like he's just he's gonna get the ball where Robert and I designs the ball to go. He's, he's a solid he athlete too. Bit. He can yeah. move a little bit. Yeah. He's a good athlete. So I think he'll fit that offense pretty well. So let's go NC State. Um, Big 12, I mean, you got to go Oak State to me at the top. You got to go K-State at the top for me. Utah. Those are the first two. Um, yep. I think TCU has a bounce-back season and will finish in the top five. Ryan, I do. Utah, Utah right? as you said, Utah's clearly. Over, yeah. clearly. Yep. And then my number five, Kansas. I, I would I would feel better about Kansas if, if I knew that Jalen Daniels was going to be healthy all year. Is Devin Neal back right. for them? The running Devin back? Neal is back. Okay. Came back. Then I'm yep. going Kansas number five. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, until Jalen Daniels gets hurt again. I, I just, I love Lance Leopold losing the OC. It hurts, but Lance Leopold's yep. been 
Lance, Lance is an offensive coach. coach so yeah, it'll be he's, fine. he's a good coach. That's my yeah. five, Ryan. Anybody that you'd pound the table, BYU maybe? Uh, I mean, Colorado's a sneaky team in the Big 12, but we'll see how much mm-hmm. step forward they take. Yep. Let's go SEC, Ryan. Well, let's go top five in the Pac-2. I'm going to go Oregon State and Washington State in that one. You you on board with those guys being at the top of that league? I still feel so bad for Oregon State, man. They were they were on a good trajectory. They're Jonathan a good Smith program. And just got yeah. laid out to the side, yep. unfortunately. Good program. Uh, SEC, Georgia, Texas, yep. Ole Miss are definitely I, – I actually – I'm going to go LSU in the top five because they've been the top five of that league the last two years. They've got sure. good talent coming back. You know, Brian Kelly's a solid football coach. Those are those are four. Uh, probably go mm-hmm. Oklahoma would probably be my next one, Ryan, but – you know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to think. I wouldn't have a And M in there yet. I wouldn't have Auburn in there yet. I wouldn't have, obviously, yeah. not Arkansas. Um, trying to think of some others. Not Mississippi State, Missouri. I think is going to take a little bit of a, 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 a kind of come back down a little bit moment. You could make a case for Missouri being in that conversation. They had a heck of a year last year, yeah. but I think there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors on that one. And then Alabama, you know, yeah, schedule schedule fit out pretty nicely for them and. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, their schedule is going to be a little bit more challenging this season uh, mm-hmm. for them. Tennessee, maybe, you know, if, if Nico can if Nico can yeah. figure it out and be a sophomore, you know, have it be a sophomore breakout, Tennessee could be could be a fun team to watch. They, they might they might they might have the best pass rusher in college football in 2024, by the way. James Pierce Jr. is a freak okay. of nature. Dude looks so, like Javon Curse reincarnated. We got Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Missouri kind of battling for that fifth job that fifth spot. Did you mention right? Alabama? Did you mention Alabama? I don't think they're going to be in the top five. Wow. You know, top five. You know, wow. Yeah. I, I think they're going to be, enough. I think they're going to be better than a lot of people think. I think they're going to be a nine and three type of team. Cause like, but nine and three run doesn't have you in the top five. I mean, the way that yeah. the sec is. So yeah. Cause who, who would you, would, would you put them in over Bama? This is an honest o- question. Would them, I mean, LSU, over-hook. would you put Bama in over LSU? Top five, um, maybe relatively in the same spot. I would put them over Oklahoma, though, for sure. I'm not, okay. I'm not in Oklahoma. So Georgia Oklahoma. for sure, Texas for sure, Ole Miss for sure, yeah. LSU for sure, right? Oh, so man. what about Tennessee? I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure yet. I, I haven't seen sustainability Missouri. with them yet. I need to see sustainability. Missouri, Missouri, I think is going to be a, a solid. I mean, they went what ten and two last year, right, in the regular two, season. The so maybe the, they. Yeah. Maybe they'll eight and four, nine and three. I mean, they'll still be yeah. a good team. I don't know if they'll be quite ten and two yeah. as they were last. And, year, and they but. catch some breaks with their schedule this year or last year. Yeah. They don't. They're not going to catch the same kind of breaks this year. But they don't. It's still they got to play at Bama, at A and M, Oklahoma at home. But they don't play LSU. Yeah. They don't play Florida. They don't play Georgia. They don't play Tennessee. Right. So and their non conference is a joke. It's Murray State, Buffalo, and Boston College. It's ridiculous. Oh, Murray, the Murray State baby, the Racers. Yeah. Got it. So you'd have Oklahoma, Alabama in contention with Mizzou and Tennessee, but not Oklahoma. Is where you're at on that one. Oh no, I would have. So um, I would. I would have Oklahoma over Tennessee for sure. Missouri okay. and Oklahoma, I think, are fighting there. So you'd go there. Bama. Oklahoma, Missouri, then Tennessee yeah, competing Tennessee. for that this spot. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that's I, that's that's where we're at for now. I just yeah. need to see sustainability with Tennessee. Like I, I like a yeah. lot of what is happening with Josh Heupel, but I, I just I want them to be a little bit better this last year after having to reload yeah. a little bit. And I just thought they were they were okay. They were okay this past year. They well, Ryan, great. they have they had a guy with the lead arm talent, I'm told. Yes. By Twitter. First round arm talent, really. Year generational arm talent another honest. example of people not knowing the difference between arm strength and arm talent but that's a, yeah. another co- whole different conversation he's, for a whole he's also different day. also i don't care if you throw about 80 yards if you're one of the worst deep ball accuracy throwers of all time but it's fine there you go it's cool i'm getting i'm getting major kyle bowler vibes whenever i watch Oof. Joe Mills Jam- Jamar- jamarcus russell maybe but yeah either way yeah. It's not great. you know why i i hesitate i'm he- i hesitate to say jamarcus Sh- russell because everything i've ever heard about joe milton is he's a good kid that works hard Sure. You know, good teammate and all that kind of stuff. Jamarcus was right. none of those things. I had a funny story, right. and it, w- it wasn't a negative on Joe Milton, but apparently Joe Milton talks about himself in the third person, which made me uh... – <laughs> so... Are you serious? Yeah. I Not to throw too much shade, but I was talking to an agent down in Indianapolis. He's like, yeah, I was recruiting him for a while, and he started talking about himself in the third person. I stopped recruiting him. I'm like, yeah, yeah. makes sense. <laughs> that totally makes sense. That is hilarious. Never heard Joe, that before. Joe, Joe, Joe doesn't go to that facility. Joe doesn't yeah. go there. Okay. That is hilarious. It makes me think of the – you ever seen the show Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Yes. yes. Terry loves love. 
right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I can't trust somebody that talks about themselves in the third person. Oh man. my gosh, that is ridiculous. Uh, Ryan ridiculous. Ryan's gonna answer now. Okay. Right. Like, yes. Okay. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> Brian's gonna Brian's gonna pull up this next question. So right. let's let's right. roll. Estimate ND estimate trucking LLC with another one. What player position changes have been made that you don't didn't agree with during the Freeman era so far? Well, the big one, Ryan, you and I have talked a lot about. I thought they made the move of Junior Tillamaka to, to Viper way too soon. I just have never seen quite the fit there. I would have liked to see him stay at Mike and compete at Mike. Um, right. And if they were going to move him to, to defensive end, I would have rather seen them move him to the, the big end position where he mm-hmm. could play with a little bit more power. I just don't see the the twitchiness off the edge for a Viper, the length right. really to, to thrive there. So – that's really the biggest one. I, honestly, Ryan, for me, the, the moves that I've had the biggest issue with are the ones they haven't made. You right. know, certain guys, I mean, why not put Clarence Lewis at safety? Why not put Jaden Mickey at corner? And maybe that, or Nickel, maybe that still happens if Christian Gray beats him out. But it's more so stuff like that. But I haven't had a lot of sure. position changes that I've just been like, what are you doing? Right. You know, I just, yeah. it's the junior yeah. one's really the only one. Like, like Jun- Burnham made Jun-Jun's sense. Like, one. You look yeah. at Josh Burnham and you're like, that guy is already too big I'm, to play a linebacker you know i am interested about the josh burnham thing because I'm, I'm not necessarily against him playing big end but he's only 240 something pounds so i'm still kind of like would i have I, just moved i, I was told by someone quickly? very close to him he's over 250 now he i know he's listed he's at like 242 okay. but he's over two he's been yeah. 250 all gotcha. 252 is what i mean he's been hovering around 252 all winter okay. is what i've been told okay. yeah gotcha. so yeah we'll, we'll see if that's true but yeah. um no I, I didn't love that one but it's kind of like who are you going to play there you know, that, that, that would have been a question. And I think it's, you know, for some reason they seem to like junior more at Viper than, than field end, which it's a bit Junior's of a head scratcher right. to me. Yeah. Junior Taylor mock is a really strange one. Cause he's like very, he's a very linear player too, right? Like he's physical and downhill and like that type of dude. And like Viper is a position where you need to change direction and bend. And like, that's just not really junior's thing. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that's just, it's just very strange. Very, very strange. Yep. I agree. I agree. All right. We got Riker Fur with the question. If you held your own state of union address of college football, what will you say? Oh man, I need much more prep- preparation for this one. <laughs> it would, it would, it would basically boil down to, you know, the, the, the college football nation is, is not well, right? We're sick and we need a cure. And the cure is a lack of greed. We need to care more about, protecting the game while also not sacrificing making sure that we're taking care of the people that make the game great and for too long we only cared about the people whose you know whose pockets were being lined right now the only reason to go to a 14 team playoff is because you want more money it doesn't make the game better it doesn't help us have a better feel for who the champion is. The 13th and 14th teams are not going to go on a magical four to five game run and win a national championship. It's about money. And if we are smart, we will care about the game and we will care about the people that make the game great. The coaches, the players, the officiating, right? Investing more money and making that better. You know, all the people that are part of it. And then understand that if we're taking care of those people, and we're looking at what's best for them, it will make the game great, and we will still make our money. We don't have to destroy the game to for, for the immediate need of it. And I would talk about that. I would I would talk a lot about, you know, making NIL what it was meant to be. You know, I would talk about, you know, we do not want to make players employees. That is not the direction to go. But we also can't define amateurism the way that we have for the last hundred years, which was literally designed to ensure that players, well, it wasn't designed this way, but it quickly turned into this, you know, designed in a way to, 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 to protect our bank accounts and our pockets. They're, they're not professionals. They can't make any money off of this. And so I would talk about some, some things that I believe would allow players to have a seat at the table without them having to unionize or become employees. And, and so it would re- really be a lot about that, about we, we are ruining this great game because we care 
so much about the almighty dollar when if we were not morons, we could understand there's a lot of money to be made without sacrificing what makes this game great and without right. doing the things and, and, and saying we, we, we're, we, we care about players. If you want players to be employees, you don't care about players at all. At all. Like we we're talking about this on the so you're gonna be okay with guys getting cut in the middle of the season if they're not getting the job done. You're gonna be okay with players getting fined for being late to practice and being late to 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 class or you know, not having the right attire and all these little things that professionals get paid. You're gonna be okay with all that. No, that am I saying that they shouldn't get paid? No, they should get a piece. I've said this before. Here's what it should be: we should have a revenue share system in which whether through collectives, through partly through collectives, but also partly through a rev share where every player at the Division I level gets an X amount of dollars. Now, Power 5 guys get a certain amount. Group of 5 guys get a lesser amount, but that's guaranteed. Whether right. it's 20000 25 30 whatever. Guaranteed every player in college football. Then whatever you make on your own through NIL, no cap. You make If you're worth $10 million to advertisers, my man, God bless America, go make $10 million. You know what I mean? But still doing it in a way where we're protecting the student-athlete part of this. Because when did student athlete become a bad word? Like that's the craziest thing ever, you know. Because when you become employees, then the, the athlete part, the student part, no longer matters. Because yeah. if you work for me, I don't give a rip about you going to class. I need you to help me go win this football game, you know. And uh, beyond what it's already that way in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. But we should be fighting <laughs> against that. We should be we should be creating a system in which. Schools that aren't 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 doing what it takes to make sure their players are being prepared for success in life are the ones being, you know, de dealt with punishments. You know what I mean? I'd say we need to get a system where this is what enforcement is going to be. Everybody's on board. And if mm -hmm. you get caught doing it, there's no freaking lawsuits because you've signed that we're all agreeing that this is going to be the rules that we all live by. Yeah. You know, and so there's just a lot of things. And then part of it would be we're going to do away with the NCAA. And we're going to create a new system which does all these things that we need to do. Because I don't think you can do what needs to be done, Ryan, under the banner of the NCAA. I just don't. But I also don't think anymore. the direction that we're going now is better than the NCAA. That's the problem. Right. Oh, I hate the NCAA. Well, so do I. But the system we're creating now is not better than the NCAA. It's worse. Right. Right. It's worse. Oh man, it's it's so sad. I mean, because you, you mentioned it as far as like not caring about going to class and stuff. It's like they people, some colleges haven't cared about their students going to class for like 40 years at this point. Like it's so sad. I remember I was listening to CJ Pro size on, on the podcast that he does, Brian. I don't know if you heard this one, but he was talking about how he was doing pre-draft training and he was talking to some guys and they were like talking about like just their degrees and stuff that they got and stuff. And the one guy was like, Oh, um, he was like, uh, um, CJ was like, what, do, what did you study? He's like, dude, I didn't go to class. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I didn't go to class. And CJ just looked appalled there. He's like, dude, I almost got my second degree before I left Notre Dame and you didn't go to class. <laughs> like, wild. And dude. guess what? CJ was still a heck wild. of a football player. Yes. On a heck of a football team. That's the whole and thing still, that pisses and, me and off. He, and he's doing well after his NFL career right. was over. So yeah. Christian Wilkins was part of two national championship teams. Left in five years with two degrees. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, you can do that. Right. But it's just places. I have a friend of mine who was a professor at Alabama in the 80s. He's mm -hmm. like, dude, if I ever tried to bust one of the players at Alabama for not coming to class, I'd lose my job. Right. Right. You know, it's just, it's sick. It's sick because yep. that's, you're, you're not using young, you're not, you don't care about young people beyond what they yeah. can do for you. And once they have no value to you, you don't care. Absolutely. And that's the sad part about it. And that's the stuff that I would focus on. I, I, I do. We had Irish blood. It says in high school, I thought Kenny Minchie had a great platform, but arm strength wasn't as good as some other quarterbacks. Do you think arm strength and range have improved? And do you think it is up to par to start if needed? I actually thought he had a pretty decent, arm, strong arm as a senior. I mean, junior and senior, his sophomore arm strength was not great, but his jump started he was skinny. He was yeah, super skinny. Yeah. yeah. And he got fee filled out in the lower body as he got older. I, I think by his junior senior year, especially pre shoulder injury senior year, I thought the ball came out pretty good, Ryan. And and uh, but it certainly it's gotten stronger because he's older and he's been in the college weight room, so it's certainly gotten stronger. So uh, yeah, it, it it's improved. I, I would I would not necessarily agree with your original premise, but it certainly has improved. Do I think it's up to par to start? Look, if Kenny Minchie ever doesn't ever start at Notre Dame, it has zero to do with arm talent, zero. 
Zero. Do you think? It just I, means I, somebody's I, better. Somebody else is better. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. I think you just need to get stronger overall. I mean, you talk about his yes. platform and his base Irish blood. I think that that was always solid. It's just about adding good weight to his frame. And I think they got him up to, as a freshman, I know at one point he was listed at like 219. I know he's brought yeah. that weight down now. It's probably good that he brought the weight down a little yeah. bit, get a little bit more a little flexible. Bit, he had a little bit of bad weight on there and then get him back up to 215 to 218. I, yeah. I didn't see him, obviously, during their first practice, you know, the media availability. But I always thought that compared to at least CJ coming out of high school, Steve, what I've seen of Steve and even Riley, who I think Riley has a very natural release and a pretty w an easy whip, but I, I still think that he might arguably have the talking about Kenny Minchie. I think he might have the best arm speed of anybody on the on oh, the it's roster. Not close. Yeah, it's gotten faster, yeah. Ryan. I mean, I watched him. Yeah. It's gotten faster, but the thing that I said after the practice is the ball just comes out of his hand, and it, it may not. Here's what I said, Ryan, and I I, I think you'll understand what, what I'm saying here because yeah. I know you've seen this before. I don't know if they got on the jugs machine if he would mm -hmm. have the fastest miles per hour. But here's right. what I do know. The ball gets from his hand to the receiver faster than anybody else. Maybe that's yeah, because of how quick fast. his release is, but yeah. it, it does. And and so, look, I'll say this. If C.J. Carr or Kenny Minchie ever are not starting quarterbacks in Notre Dame, it has zero to do with arm talent, arm strength, anything related to arm. It's either right. A, they couldn't pick up the system, or B, somebody was just better. And that's possible. But, yeah, Kenny Minchie's arm talent is absolutely where where you want it to be a guy that can impact. Now, can he read the defense? Can he get the ball where it needs to go? Can he, to your point, right, can he hold up over the course of a 16, 17, you know, 16-game season if they make that kind of run? You know, can he can he mm -hmm. do the things with his legs that Mike Denbrock likes to do to some degree? You know, does can he be fried? I mean, those are all questions for him and CJ because they're so young and they haven't done it. But, right. Just the ability to, to to just pure arm talent without any other yeah. context. Both of those kids are ready to play now, like right now. Sure, it's that's the why other like, things they've got to figure out. That's why I like Deuce Knight so much because it's like he has pure arm strength, but he also has a very fast arm. Like yes. the arm speed is very good on him, despite him being a little bit of a longer guy. So yeah, man. You know what's funny, Ryan? I think his arm speed on high school. Actually, you know what we talked about this. I think his arm yeah. speed in high school film is better than it is when he's doing seven on seven. Yeah, he's probably more relaxed than the uh, mm -hmm. seven on seven stuff. Yep. No, no yep. rush. There's not the same take his time. Yeah. 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 We had Irish blood with another one. He says, of the three quarterbacks not named Riley Leonard, do you believe Mike Denbrock could most easily use Kenny Minchie with many of the same packages as Riley would have? What changes do you think might be needed for each if called on? I actually think CJ Carr would best fit the things that Riley Leonard does. I think CJ Carr is a better athlete than Kenny Minchie is. Okay. And he's a more natural runner. Kenny Minchie's a guy that's going to be a bit of a use his legs to move around in the pocket. I think CJ's probably yep. the most natural runner. If it's if not him, then it's Steve. Because Steve can do that. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Minchie's actually the guy that that to me least resembles Riley Leonard as an athlete and how you use him in that regard. Now they are yep. very similar in they are the two best guys at 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 changing arm angles and and you know quick delivery and those type of things are similar, but as far as how they're used in packages and things along those lines, as throwers, they're similar. As runners, they're very dissimilar. Although Kenny's a, like I said, a little bit more naturally accurate than Riley is. He's just got a little bit more natural throwing ability than Riley had as, as a younger player, but uh, a different kind of athlete. Yeah, well, I think that I think the good thing is is that although CJ Carr, Kenny Minchie, and Steve Angeli are all different in their own ways, they all are also similar enough where you can utilize them in the same type of system. Riley is kind of a he's a little bit of a different cat compared to the other three players. Like he's a little bit taller, he's a little bit longer, he's obviously a better running threat than all three of those guys. I, I think that Honestly, a great question would be Irish blood is going into the 2025 season when those are your quarterbacks on campus. And I know Deuce will come in and he's kind of the outlier considering, you know, kind of similarly to what Riley Leonard is now. But I think when you're talking about a top three, potentially, if if all three do stay at Notre Dame going into 2025, that your, your system is going to be very similar for all three of those players. Like, yeah, maybe I'll dial up a, re, a zone read with one compared to the other. But for the most part, you're going to run a lot of RPO looks. You're going to do things, get the ball out of their hands quickly, accuracies. Re, you know, you're probably going to run a lot of screens and do that type of stuff with them. So 
the offense that he runs, similar with the three quarterbacks outside of Riley Leonard, I think are going to be pretty similar. So, if God forbid something happens to Riley this year, or you're even talking about going into 2025, I think that your offense, no matter who the quarterback is that gets the nod, you're going to be able to do a lot of the same thing, same principles that you want with each of those quarterbacks, potentially. That's a great point, Ryan. Yeah. We had Ida Benami says, as a diehard IU basketball fan, I'm as sorry. much as a – sorry. What's that? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to I oh. <laughs> Gotcha. As much as a diehard Notre Dame fan, how's that? How's that work? Can you be a fan of? Both There's a lot of that in Indiana because yeah, sure. football's obviously king at Notre Dame, and then basketball at Indiana is. I mean, if, if you're someone who's over 35, 40, I mean, you grew up in the Bobby Knight era, even at the end of right. the Bobby Knight era. You know, basketball right. is king, and I mean, the freaking movie Hoosiers is based on Indiana Hickory. And sure, Indiana, you know what I mean. So. Sure. Yeah. I miss Bobby Knight throwing chairs across the uh, across the court. Um, great, <laughs> sorry. So let's start over here. As a diehard Indiana basketball fan, as much as much as a as much as a diehard Notre Dame fan, is it it is a great feeling to know how advanced and a better place Notre Dame football is in comparison. The university and the head coach both united. I would argue even the Notre Dame basketball team is in a much better situation right now than Indiana basketball team. I, I haven't I, watched any. I, I've actually been watching a decent amount of college basketball this year. I haven't mm-hmm. watched any Indiana basketball. So I don't yeah, they're not good. Their team this and they year. just had some big time five star kid just decommit recently. Yeah, so yeah, it's a it's a big loss for them as well. Look, I mean, I, I tweeted this over the weekend, Ryan. I, I think the future of Notre Dame basketball is in great hands. I mean, obviously Niall Ivy. This is not the first year Niall Ivy's had success. I mean, they won the ACC regular season championship last year. They've been to the Sweet 16 each of the last two years. They had that rough COVID year, and they've been a Sweet 16 team the last two years. But, you know, she's showing that she can get this team to, to you know, play hard, play well, scheme yeah. well, defend well. They just got to continue to improve their personnel a little bit in the post. We've talked a lot about that. Don't need to rehash it again. But for this team to go out this year and win the ACC tournament championship without Olivia Miles, Without Cass Prosper, Kylie Watson goes down. Emma Rich, five star guard, freshman guard, gets hurt early in the year. She was gonna, she's a six foot one three point shooter, Ryan. And then yeah. they lose Kylie Watson in the semifinals, who was playing really good basketball. She's one, she's their biggest post player and, and really only true post player that they have in the rotation because Maddie Westbow's more of a stretch four, you know, and a th- you know, three than she is a, a true post player. And then Maddie steps up in the, you know, and, and, um, the championship game plays well down in the post. And and on what's what was great about it, Ryan, is El- Hannah Hidalgo played really well in the second half of the title game. She did not play well the first two games of the tournament. And they still right. destroyed Louisville and still destroyed Virginia. Or, well, they were destroying Louisville, came back, and then they won it late and pulled away late. And then they destroyed Virginia Tech, who didn't have Liz Kitley. So, like, they – like, that's a they had six girls playing in that championship game, Ryan, against a team that had beaten them. Like multiple times that NC State knocked them out of the NCAA tournament a couple years ago, not just mm-hmm. beating them in their league. So to to play that way was and again, it was another it was a comeback victory. So this team is showing that they've got a lot of grit. And I don't know that I would always say that about the last couple of years about the women's basketball right. team. And so that was good to see. And then of course they've got a five star post coming in next year. And I mean, almost the entire roster has a chance to come back next year. You know, and so it's it and and look, Micah Shrewsbury's team isn't very good, but I love watching that team play, man. And as the talent Mark, gets better, Marcus Byrne just set the freshman scoring record, oh, right? Man. Went over Troy yeah. Murphy. Yeah. yeah. I know it's I not mean, a necessity, they, obviously. They but, had yeah. yeah, but they had gotten some big wins down the stretch. I mean, you know, and they came back, they came back down to earth a little bit against North Carolina, who's just a way better team than they are. But sure yeah, the team that team plays hard, man, and, and they battle. And as the talent gets older and better, you know, you got Cole Serta coming in next year, Sir Muhammad coming in next year, who's going to help him, Nazi Muhammad's kid, Ryan. And yeah. and they're in on some top 100 players in the 25 class too. So I, I think the the basketball pro – look, the big three at Notre Dame to me is as healthy as a trio as it's been in a long time. There was like a little stretch where the football team was pretty good, like when the women's team won the championship and then the men's team was – but like that, that's when the men's team was kind of coming down a little bit. The men's team had had some great runs in a couple of years before. Uh, mm-hmm. So like there was that stretch like around 14 and 15 where they were pretty good. Um, when yeah. the women's team won a championship, the men's team was kind of coming down. So this is, as, I mean, as far as the foundation, they have a chance to be as good as they've been as a trio in a very, very long time. And they're all led by good people too. I mean, that's the thing you hear about them. 
women's college basketball is really exciting this year too. Cause I mean, I know everyone's obsessed with Caitlin Clark and what she's been doing, but I mean, you Hannah Hidalgo and then the young, what's it? Juju Watkins at it. Yeah. USC, USC. Right? She's falling. She's, she's, big she's time. good, man. She's really good. Yeah. <laughs> and USC is really good. And you know, obviously South Carolina is dominant again this year. Yeah. yeah uh, LSU is disappointing girl, for what man. they it's were wild. last year. Yeah. But they're still <laughs> like 26 and five, you know what I mean? They're still really good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's going to be a fun tournament and, and UConn's top 10. I mean, they, you know, Paige Beckers yeah. is healthy, so they're, they're a decent team too, but they're not what they used to be, but it's, it's going to be sure. a fun tournament. I just, I don't know if Notre Dame's going to have a chance to make it run in the tournament because I just don't think they have the depth. So, like South you, Carolina looks pretty unbeatable to be honest. Well, they're yeah, they're, good, they're, they're pretty good, <laughs> but like just Notre Dame, just six girls healthy. I mean, I don't, yeah. I, who knows what's going on with Kylie Watson, but that did not, that injury did not look good. So I don't yeah. know if they're going to be able to make a run this year, but if they can get everybody back next year, and man, they're going to be really, really dangerous. Yeah, really dangerous. But I'm, I'm sorry. You should maybe think about um, switching your allegiances, my friend. Just go all Notre mm-hmm. Dame. All right, yeah. I've done it recently. It's you. You can do it, buddy. You can do it. All right. We got Coleman Smith says, "Is Micah Bell one year away? If not, there where will George Clark play since he was brought here for a similar role as Thomas Harper?" Well, those two things, I mean, those – Jordan Clark's going to play nickel whether Micah Bell has a breakout season or not. I mean, he was yeah. brought here to play nickel. Let them both play, man. If they're exactly. both good enough but to play. Like, they did play. that last year, Ryan. I mean, Thomas yeah. Harper played more snaps than Jack Kaiser, but Clarence Lewis still played a decent number of snaps in the slot. I mean, yeah. if you're going to rotate Cam Hart and Benjamin Morrison out occasionally, you're going to rotate your nickel out occasionally. So yeah. – to me, having a guy like Jordan Clark gives you a little protection to where if Micah Bell is ready to play but not ready to be the guy, then you have somebody there. And then if Micah Bell breaks out and he's ready to go and play a bunch of snaps, and you can still play them both. Yep. And uh, and it gives you a match. I had an article out there today, Ryan, talking about how I think the biggest key to the secondary really being elite this year and being the best version of itself is Christian Gray and Micah Bell both breaking out because right. it just gives so much speed to that position. And with Micah playing in the slot, some of the things that you saw from him at the army game where he's a burner, but he can get outplayed by bigger guys. It's harder to do that against him in the slot because he's going to have help, you know, linebacker safety, all the types of things. You should play against smaller receivers inside too than outside. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, so I think that gives them a lot of, I mean, when Benjamin Morrison's your slowest of three corners in that situation, Mm-hmm. You've got some dudes now. So uh, will that happen or not? I don't know. I just I just want to hope that he has a chance to play and earn playing time. Whether it's the guy or not, we'll see. But I just want to see some growth from him this year because, man, you think about that, him and Christian Gray in the same secondary with that kind of speed, mm-hmm. that, that could be fun to watch. Yeah. Very well, I think the, I think the good thing is that although they played the same position, I think him and Jordan Clark are also very different athletes. So you can do different things with each of those players potentially too. So if they're ready to play, man, let them both get in. I want to respond to this thing from Andrew Gilmore regarding okay. uh, uh, he, position changes. Uh, he I, says I, the I question saw, is easy. Yeah. They asked their leading wide receiver to play DB last spring and he transferred. They could have used him a wide receiver last year. No, they couldn't have. I mean, look, guys, there's a reason that that he left – and there's a reason they asked him to do that. Like, let's let's not assume these coaches are idiots, right? Like, I'm I'm not someone who's like always believe the coaches. You guys know that I don't buy into that. But there's a reason for that. And the reality is, is Lorenzo Styles wasn't playing well at receiver. He was struggling to catch the football, and he asked to play DB. Let's not forget Andrew what position he's playing at Ohio State. He's playing DB at Ohio State. He wanted to move to DB. They didn't ask him to move to DB. So let's just make sure that that we're going to get that one correct because that's not an accurate um, portrayal of what happened in that situation. Now, was there a, a bad situation in regard to the relationship with the position coach and things along those lines? Yes, there was. And that was true with a lot of players. But Lorenzo is the one that made the decision to move the DB, not the other way around, which is why he chose Ohio State knowing he was going to play defensive back at that position. So, no, he was not going to help them a receiver this year. And there was nothing that he showed in 2022 that may, should make anyone think that he would have been better than Jaden Greathouse or Rico Flores or anybody else who played last year. Because one thing those guys could do, they catch the ball. And that's obviously a a big, big part of it. 
Iden Banami says, from all the Notre Dame reporters, et cetera, the one person everyone said caught their eye, had in common, was Chris Mitchell, especially his speed, breakout season loading. Iden, look, I love dr drinking the Kool-Aid after one practice, but there's another question about from one practice. One practice is great. They didn't have pads on. I mean, they they, they we didn't. They weren't like doing team stuff the way that you would see in practice eight or nine. I mean, they were doing stuff, but one practice was not enough to see that. Like, there we're we we know a whole lot more about Chris Mitchell from what we've seen on film than what we saw in one practice without pads. Right. You know what I mean? So you want to you want to find out if Chris Mitchell's capable of being a breakout this year. Don't worry one second about what he did in one practice without pads. Go watch the Arkansas game last year. Right. Do that. Go watch him against Jacksonville State last year. Go watch mm -hmm. them against Liberty last year. Go watch them against the best teams that they played last year. That's when you'll have a sense of, okay, can this guy translate those skills to this level? And that's right. going to give you a much better sense of it. But the one thing I will say is the the surprise that, that I have heard from my sources is they thought he was fast, Ryan. You know, they thought he had yeah. good speed. It's part of the reason they went and got him. Sure. They didn't recruit a 6'1", 175-pound kid because they thought he was going to be a great contested catch guy or a third down chain mover. You know what I mean? Like yeah. <laughs> they brought him, but they are surprised at how fast he is, or at least he's been since he got to Notre Dame. Like makes, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, even, even just working with the strength and conditioning program, all due respect to FIU, but obviously Notre Dame's a little different supports animal. are going to be better in that, yeah. in that scenario. He's gained like so. five or six pounds already. And, and so, yeah. yeah, he's even faster than they thought he was going, I, 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 I'm not going to lie. Like I watched him on film and I really liked him at FIU, but I'm like, man, that yeah. kid might be 170 pounds. Like he yeah. might be 170 pounds. I'm he's not like, sure. About I think that. it's like 183 or something like that. Yeah, is what he's up to I now. thought I saw, yeah. I was like, Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. He doesn't look a whole lot different than Will Fuller looked Ryan. Honestly, just on the, looks yeah. like, like I'm not comparing physically. their speed. I'm talking yeah. about physically, like their body yeah. types or, or where to your point, he looked really skinny on film. Yes. Now the thing we liked about him is he was still a tough kid. For being small, pretty, like, pr pretty one, long for a smaller guy. Too. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You remember the catch he had against UConn? It was like it was a it was like a seam route that he bent inside and he caught it with like three guys converging on him, and they all yeah. hit him and he kind of bounced off of him. Like he's a pretty tough kid for his size, but I don't care how tough you are when you're a buck seventy five or a buck seventy two or seventy three. Like seventy five looked like it might be a little generous at yes. when he was at FIU, if I'm being honest. And I think Agreed. Ryan, by his response, agrees with me. Well, I don't I, care I, how you are when you're going against the Cam Hart, when you're going against right. Will Johnson, when you're going against Kool Aid McKinstry, as opposed to the right. the guys in Conference USA. I don't mm -hmm. care how fast you are if you can't get off that jam, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, that's I, that, that I honestly, place I honestly would be there would be kind of be alarm bells ringing. I know it's only one day, but if if Chris Mitchell wasn't dominating a non padded practice, I would be like, hmm, that's a little troubling. I this don't ain't know about the guy. That one. Yeah, right. This ain't the guy. Well, well, now well, watching well, him just run right by Jade Mickey. You're like, yeah. all right, that's that's impressive, you know. But sure. again, let's see what Jaden can do when the pads are on, right? That that's right. the whole the thing. Is I just on them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. It's one practice, but guys, you should never have too much of an emotional reaction. It's fun. We learn stuff, and it's good to see, and this is all fun, and that's why I reported mm -hmm. on it. And it it's more confirmation of certain things. But if you had an opinion on something coming into into practice, one practice should not change your opinion unless it's something is some like. Okay, he's six three. I thought he was six one. Like that's about the sure. only type of stuff that one non padded practice should change your opinion of, uh, based on what he had on film. But it, it, but for me, right, it was confirmation of okay, this kid plays at the speed that you want a, a guy at Notre Dame to play at and be right. a potential difference maker. Same with yeah. Jaden Harrison. Mm -hmm. Now Jaden Harrison needs a lot of work route running wise and. Catching he's the ball at times man. and all, but he's man, explosive. he's twitchy off the line, dude. He really is. Yeah. Again, that's something we saw from him as a kick returner, but just not as much as a receiver at Marshall because it's mm -hmm. the way that they used him. But you call you could see the speed, man. Like, look, I, the two fastest receivers they had around are the two transfers. I mean, that's and it's yeah. not really close. I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not surprised that Jaden Harrison's a great kick returner after watching him and in, in just kind of going through the drills because that dude is densely built man he's pretty powerful in our breaks too like i'm not surprised at all that he can break some tackles and he yep. can make some things happen so yep he's he's got a little bit of that running back type of build yep as opposed to receiver i would love to see him on some jets this fall man i, I think that that would be a, or some screens like get him out in space a little bit let him break tackles i think it would be very interesting here's one for you ryan that i will i will ask this one for you uh this is from coleman smith are we gaining any traction 
with new wide receiver offer in Ohio State commit Javon Javon Boggs, who is a 2026 20, player, correct? 25. 25? 25. Okay. Yeah. Who's so the, he's committed who's to 25. Who's the 26 receiver commit they've offered? Is it Chris Henry? Chris Henry is okay. Ohio State. He just transferred okay. to modern day. Yeah. So Javon Boggs is a 2025 wide receiver. He's out of Coco in the state of Florida. He is committed oh, to Folsom. Ohio State. Yes. Yes. So um, he's. So his teammates, Brady Hart, the 2026 quarterback that is visiting Notre Dame this offseason. So uh, it was funny. Brady Hart actually tweeted out after that offer was extended to him with, you know, the eyes looking emoji or whatever type of thing. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we'll see. We'll see, Cole. I mean, first and foremost, I think Notre Dame's got to try to get him to campus potentially because to my knowledge, and I've talked a little bit to Javon, that he has not visited Notre Dame. And obviously he's committed to Ohio State. And anytime you're committed to Ohio State as wide receiver, it's a little bit yeah. tough. You know, it's not the easiest thing in the world. So we'll see if they're able to get any traction. I mean, if Brady Hart ends up with Notre Dame, if he ends up committing it at some point, then maybe that improves your your pitch there a little bit. But you know, obviously beating Ohio State for a wide receiver that's already publicly committed is not going to be the easiest thing in the world. So we'll see. So one of the things I was told, Ryan, is yep. part of the reason Notre Dame's been a little bit more aggressive with kids like that in 25 and 26 is the expectation of what they think the offense is going to look like in the fall that's 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 the thing so they're like look if we just get in the yeah. game and have these kids that return our calls once the fall comes you know get them on campus once the fall comes maybe we can change their mind so we'll, we'll see how it plays out but we'll see he's listening yeah. right that's that's a good key. player he's man listening. he had yeah. like he had like 20 touchdown catches last yeah. year or something like that with brady hart so yeah. he's a pretty good player man yeah pretty good player. i like brady hart I do. I think he's really Pretty talented. Hard, yeah. Some good quarterbacks in the 26. You and I were talking about this a couple weeks ago, man. That is a loaded. Yeah. Well, I I, I even said it on the show on Friday. I was like, there's um like in the 2025 class, you know, obviously getting deuce night. I liked a few of the quarterbacks that were on that list, but like there were one or two. If Notre Dame would have ended up with them, I would have been like, mm, I don't know, man. Like, yeah. but this 2026 Top class, like, literally, there's like five to six kids. I'd be like, Cool. Yeah. I'm good with that. Like, I'd be very okay with them being Notre Dame's quarterback in 2026. There were like four kids that I looked at in 25 that I thought were needle movers. Yeah. It was like Deuce, Bryce Underwood, McIntyre. George McIntyre. And then to yep. a degree, KJ Lacey. I really yep. like KJ Lacey, but I wonder how what the ceiling is at the next level. Like, I, it's a great yep. high school quarterback, but what's like the KJ ceiling Lacey. at the next level? You know, yep. but the, after that, it's like there's some good players, but like there's a lot of other guys yep. I looked at. I'm like, eh, you know. Well, I even I even use this as an example. Like, I would have been okay with Antoine Hill if you believe in your quarterback development because that kid's yeah. freaky. But like, Super if they would have got Cutter Bowley before Cutter Bowley yeah. um, reclassified to 2024, I'd have been like, mm, all right, whatever. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Yeah, wouldn't, depth wouldn't have been guy. my guy. Would not it's a depth guy, guy after CJ. That's what it would have been, in my opinion. That's how I would have felt about it. Yep. All right, we had Ida Benami says, what is it, what, sorry, what is it you guys are hearing, seeing on why the coaching staff likes Jerome Bettis Jr.? Well, number one, size. He's a uh, he's a tough kid. He's a pretty strong kid for his size. Uh, played, he does whatever you're asking him to do. Ryan, you had a two-part interview yep. about Jerome, and that was the one thing that his high school coach kept saying. Like, dude, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, if Jerome put on 30 pounds and went played <laughs> H-back and we asked right. him to play defense and he said, no problem, coach, I'll play defense. You know, he's just the, kind of that kind of kid. And the thing yep. that people have to understand is not every kid is recruited to be a star. And there is a need for a guy that will come here and work his butt off for four years and, and, and understand that, you know, his time may not come till his junior or senior year. And, and so they see size, they see, and the thing is of all the skills that we talk about that he doesn't have, we rarely talk about the things he does have, which is right. really good size and Great really hands. strong hands, like yeah. really strong yeah. hands. He yeah. just doesn't have the explosiveness. But there's a there's a bit of a gamble that Notre Dame is willing to take that the DNA is going to kick in at some point in time when it comes to the speed. Now, I don't buy that because his dad wasn't fast. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what made his dad a great player. Uh, his dad was great speed. I mean, had good speed for his size, but like nobody was like Jerome Bettis. Wow, what a elite speed guy! So, yeah, you know, it's so, it's someone, someone even it's asked size. me if Jerome Bettis could be a, a running back down the line. I'm like, nope, too high. No, cut. he won't be a running. Yeah, back. he's, he's six three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's all those things, and and yeah. and again, I don't think Notre Dame has any illusions that right now Jerome Bettis Jr. is going to come here and surprise people and be our next Michael Floyd. There's no illusions right. of that. 
But again, not every kid, because here's the deal, right? If every kid you recruit is a stud, you're going to have ex- happen to you exactly what happened to Ohio State the last couple of years. Look how many five-star top 100 guys have left the program the last two years. Noah Rogers left. The kid from Texas left a couple. I mean, you Aiden can't Ballard, have Ballard, right? Jane Ballard. Yeah, no, not him. That's the he was from Kentucky. The kid oh, from Brown. Um, Brown. Well, they had That's him. The Brown. kid from Chicago left. I'm, I'm yes. trying to remember. Just give me a second. I'm going to find it. Um, he was a, a top ranked kid from Texas a couple of years ago. You're thinking of the Brown kid from from Illinois. He left as yep. well. Yep. But when you have that many big time kids come, you're going to lose some guys. It is Caleb Burton. That's oh, that's who it was. But but that class was a great receiver class. Mm-hmm. Caleb Burton, Keon Grays, Caleb Brown, Kojo Antwi. Two of those guys are already gone. It was 22 class, Ryan. That, that, that they they were just through their sophomore years. They had a great receiver class last year with Cardinal Tate and Brandon um Brandon Ennis and Noah Rogers. Guess what? Noah Rogers is already gone. That's still a really good receiver yep. class. But the point is, is you're gonna have these guys leave. You bring in guys like Sean Terry, you bring in guys like Jerome Bettis. They're going to be guys that are going to be more program guys. Now, they may end up having an impact. Sean Terry does some things we really like, but he's yep. not a guy that's coming in. If I'm not balling out by my freshman year, I'm out of here. You know, yep. I mean, there, there's a need for that. It's program building. And I know that some of you don't like that because it doesn't help you win recruiting ranking wars, but they're not trying to win recruiting ranking wars. They're trying to win a national championship, and you've got to build the program the right way. Right. And so that means sometimes a kid isn't being brought in to be a star. Now, Elijah Burris is a different deal. They're not bringing Elijah Burris in to be a program guy. They think he has a really high ceiling to eventually grow into that. We'll see if they're right or wrong, but they're bringing him in. Like So basically, Burris, Terry, and, and Bettis are all being looked at completely differently. They think Burris can be a dude. They think Sean Terry is a niche player, but he's excellent at that niche. And then Jerome Bettis is more of a big-bodied program type of kid that we hope the light goes on for at some point in time down the road. Very yeah. different guys. And then they're hoping that the fourth guy is going to be a dude. And that's that's kind of what they're looking to do. Yep. And and so that's just the reality of it. And, and I know that some people don't like that. I get it, Ryan. But not every kid is being recruited to be a star. Joseph Reed yep. was not brought to Notre Dame because they think he's going to be a first-team All-American as a sophomore. He may be, but that's not what he's being brought in to be. They're not bringing him in thinking he's going to provide the same impact that they're hoping that they get from Bryce Young or Chris Burgess Jr. That's just not what he's being recruited to do. That's what team building is about, yeah. right? Teddy Rezac is not being brought in with the with the thought of having the same impact as Kingston Viliyama Asa. Just, just isn't. Doesn't mean they don't like him. Doesn't mean they don't think he can be a starter for him. It just means that's our star. That's the guy we're hoping is a three-year starter and a fifth-year player, right? That that's the reality of it. It's just a, it's different. It's different. Yeah. Well, Notre Dame needs to finish that wide receiver group to kind of in that yep. conversation, right? Like you can't just miss on a star and just take a solid role player again because that's what we would call a underwhelming class at that point. So yeah, they they're 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 filling up on the roles. They need to find a guy that is a stud in the class, a guy that can help them pretty early on. So we'll see mm-hmm. if they can or not. That'll make the class. Yep. That's it, Ryan. You nailed it. It's the finish. Yep. The finish is going to define ultimately what this class is, is all about, in my opinion. Yep. You are correct. We have two parter here, Ryan. Ball bean. Oh, sorry, ball peen Shillelagh. This is part one. Most high profile coaches have something that they're remembered for. Mike Leach's high flying offense, the way Coach Orgeron said go tigers, etc. Go tigers. Part two, when Marcus Freeman retires after winning five-plus national championships at Notre Dame, what will he be most remembered for besides the national championships? Uh, also, the national championships will be what yeah. he's most remembered for. You know, I, if I were to say what would his impact be, if I could compare it to a former coach, I think it would be a lot like Bobby Bowden. Now, very different personalities. But if you – have you ever seen the thing that ESPN did about the 99 team for Florida State, Ryan? If you ever get a chance to watch it, so. watch it. I don't think so. Yeah. Because the thing that they'll always say is like this guy, like, yes, why'd they play for Bobby Bowden? Because they're like, this guy loved us like he was our dad. A lot of us didn't have dads. Now, Notre Dame doesn't have as much of that issue as some other schools. But like, like that's the thing is like this guy does it for the right reasons. 
Bobby Bowden yep. coached for the right reasons. Yes, he wanted to win. He wanted to compete, won two national championships. You don't have the success he had as a coach if you're not a competitive dude. But at the end of the day, anyone that, that knows Bobby Bowden, anyone know about that program, whatever you think about this scandal, whatever, he cared about his kids, genuinely cared about his players and developing his young men. That That's something he took pride in. They weren't just – you know, resources for him to use to get his own glory and game. He cared about them. And I think that's something he's known for besides the championships. It's that was a, that was a guy that, that truly understood the mission of being a college football coach, which is to yes, compete, win championships, all that. But it's also about what impact are you having in the lives of these young men? And for me, I think that would be, that would be the thing I think he would be most known. I mean, that's what Lou Holtz is most known for, right? I mean, completely different yep. type of person Lou, than, than than Marcus Freeman. But but other than winning championships, what are the things he's known for? The funny stories, but the fact that his players adore him, adore yep. him. And now they didn't always do it when he they were there. They'll tell you, be, his players say, "Hey, I didn't I didn't necessarily have the same feeling I have for Coach Holtz now that I had then." You know what I mean? Because sure. then it was he was hard on me. It was you know. But I, I, as I got older, I understood, okay, he was trying to do something beyond just go win football games. He was trying to develop me as a man so I could go out and be successful in my life. And I think those are the things that I think Marcus Freeman will be known for, um, you know, because there's nothing like scheme-wise like Mike Leach or, you know, those type of things that, that um, you know, I think it'll be about. I think it'll be about that, the relationships. At least that's my hope. Well, Anyway, right. I, I I think football fans will remember him for being a genuine and charismatic person, and I think that all women out there and everyone <laughs> probably will remember him for being very handsome, which he is very handsome. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I've had a couple times with my wife. I'm like, hey, uh, and you took a few too many pictures of Marcus Freeman in this pregame. Yes. Um, yes. You know, so <laughs> can we get the players, please? <laughs> it's, it's it's like what it's like the NFL Network broadcast of <laughs> Sam Hartman's hair flowing, right? Like there's yeah, you remember. Yeah. It's like, really, yeah. guys, do we have to with more of this hair talk? Come on, give me a break. Oh, man, it's an e it's an easy sell for the recruit mothers, man. You go into the household yeah. and just, yeah, just keep looking at them. You're good. Yep. Yep. Oh, my goodness. All right, let's get down to uh, let's go with Tommy Guns. Here we go. Tommy Guns, good to have you back, man. It's like you disappeared for a little while. Who makes it far farther, the women in the NCAA, NCAA tournament or the men's in the NIT, assuming they get into the NIT? Well, I, I, I just – I don't think they're going to get into the NIT. I was about to say, they have a Ryan. losing record, right? Like, usually you don't yeah. get in with a losing record, now, right? They'll occasionally have some teams that get in with losing records if they're, you know, whatever – I don't know what they use anymore. RPI type of thing is there. But, yeah, I mean, they're 12-19 and 19 and 7-13 in the league. So, uh, there's a whole lot of ACC teams. Now, assuming they get into the league, I'm still going with the women's team. I mean, yes. the, the men's team right now is a great story. I love how they finished the season and just the way that they battled down the stretch. You know, I mean, they've, they won what five of six at one point in time. Right. But then they mm -hmm. lost their last two because they just don't have the horses yet to really get to that point. But sure. uh, I just, even, even shorthanded, I still think the women's team has every opportunity to still be a sweet 16 team. When I talk about the women not making a run, do I think they have the ability to win their first two games in the NCAA tournament? Of course. I, I mean, I'd be shocked if they didn't, yep. you know, whether it's a four seed or a three seed. What I'm more referring to, Ryan, is I don't think they can make a deep run like Elite Eight, Final Four, Championship, the way they're currently constructed because there's so many players out. Right. I mean, you can't you can't make that that run with six players. You just mm -hmm. you can't, especially when one of the players you just lost was your your biggest post and your only right. true true post because you're just going to get to that one matchup against that one really long athletic team that's just put their hands up and you there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you get dominant on the boards or whatever. So I, but even then, I still think they're a sweet 16 team at least. Um, I'd be a little yeah. surprised by that. That so I, I don't see the men's team if they do get to the NCAA tournament, they might win their first game, but I don't see them going past. It's a great story. I love the future, but this is still not a really good basketball team yeah. just because they're so young. Give me the NIT, uh, give me the women in the NCAA on this question, Tommy. Yeah. I, I saw Cormac Ryan apparently is a decent little player for uh, North Carolina. Yeah, imagine That's that. Crazy. <laughs> there was so much what that team the teams that mike bray's last two teams were so wasted it's yeah. absolutely ridiculous how wasted they were very disappointing riker ferg says for brian are there any u.s history books you recommend i'm currently reading the marshall plan by ben stell steel i should look into that ryan 
there's two that I have on my docket for next to read. And one of them you could probably see when I, uh, I think it shows when I'm at my house, it's, it's above the others cause I pulled it out to read. Uh, and that's grant by Ron Chernow. And then the other one that I have on my next to read look, but I have it at home. I bought it. I just haven't read it yet. It's called founding brothers by Joseph J Ellis. Who's one of my favorite, um, uh, revolutionary war historians, historians, as far as his books. So that's my next one on my, uh, the next couple on my, on my docket to read when I, when I can make time, something I've said, that's one of my 2024. I'm going to make more time to read because I love to read. Yeah. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I, yeah, just not, not enough time in the day, man. Not enough time. Yeah. Item Benami says, I could be wrong, but it feels like we haven't and aren't putting the full court press on tail and Taylor. Brian sold us on him a year ago as a must get and seems we're dragging our feet. We need I don't, I don't agree with that premise at all. Uh, I've seen this before, Ryan. This is about to be Taylor and Taylor's like what third visit in the last several months coming up. I think right, I think like fourth or fifth overall. Yeah, yeah, it's been a lot. Yep. You guys have to understand the coaching staff has a pretty good idea on who's going to be deciding soon and who's going to yep. play the long game. Because here, here, are they dragging their feet on Jeremiah Wusu Kormoa? We hardly hear anything about him. Nathaniel, Nathaniel, Nathan, sorry, Nathaniel Wusu Botang. <laughs> sorry, yep. completely got the name wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. I got the Wusu part right did, yes, did. Uh, with Nathaniel Wusu Botang. No, we're not because he has said, made very clear, I'm signing on the last signing day. Yeah. So <laughs> why use all your, you know, spend all your capital, all your ammo, whatever, to try to make that push now when you know you're in the game now, that visit got you in the game. So, you know, he's making summer visits. I haven't seen it with Notre Dame. That's because I don't know that Notre Dame for sure wants to have his official be this summer. Yeah. Right. Because he's not, I, if I'm them, I say, I'd much rather have him, him come in for the Florida state game than in June, you know, six months away from actually maybe eight months away from when he's going to sign with yeah. Taylor Ryan. I don't expect as of right now, I don't expect Taylor to be a summer decision maker. Things could change, but my understanding is, is that Taylor is, is, is thinking about committing or signing after the season. Now I know early he'd said the opposite, but that's my understanding of it. But even if he decides a summer guys, they're going to have five or six visits with him in the last year of getting on campus. There's mm -hmm. no evidence of that right now of, of him, of them dragging their feet. So I just don't, I just don't see it that way, Ryan. If perhaps you agree with, with Iden on that one, but I just don't see this as a dragging their no, feet I thing. I don't think I don't think they're dragging their feet on it. I just think that you're trying to read the room a little bit, you know. And I mean, he's I mean, he's literally coming back next month for another visit, right? So it's not like and he's only set up four visits. I believe it's Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, and Notre Dame for his next round of unofficial visits. So I, I think Notre Dame's clearly in that top group. I mean, it's going to be a battle. I mean, you have to beat Georgia. You have to beat Michigan. Was always a player for them, for him. Ohio State got into the fold a, a few months ago. George is another school that he's high on. Like, I, I think it's just going to be a close race in the end. So I think you just need to be patient with it. It's going to be a tough race. And the interesting thing with Michigan is Michigan has, has fallen with a lot of guys that they were battling Notre Dame for because their position coaches have left. That's not true yeah. at wide receiver because Ron Bellamy yeah. is still there. So the guy that's that had the impact with Taylor and Taylor is still there. Right. So, yeah, it's um it's a battle. But I think that they're I mean, they're they're putting forth their their effort. In my opinion, I haven't seen any evidence of of that, at least not recently. I think when there was the the changeover from, you know, Leighton Stuckey's tenure, he wasn't really recruiting anyone really that hard late in the process. And then right. Coach Brown comes in, you got to reassess the board and do all that. There was a law there, sure. but that was more of circumstance, not so much. We, you know, we're not pushing for Taylor. Yeah. Taylor. He wasn't really hearing from any, no, nobody was really hearing from Notre Dame for like a week there just because they're right. trying to figure out the board and all that type of stuff. And also coaching right. a bowl game. So yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. A very important bowl game that they had to win in my opinion. Irish blood, a favorite part of spring practice as a coach versus as a player. I think, I think as a player, you're just excited to get back to football routine. I mean, you've just been a student now for a few, a few weeks and you've just been, you know, the, just working out, which is, you know, work, the workout grind's cool. I think that a lot of players do enjoy that, but there's nothing like getting back on the field and getting back into a little bit of a routine, right? So I think that that, just the camaraderie of the locker room and getting back around the guys in a football setting compared to just a workout setting is pretty big. 
as a coach, I, I think it's kind of similar, honestly, Irish Bud, and now that I'm kind of working through it. Like, I think it's getting back to a routine. I mean, coaches have been on the road, and then they hit the the dead period, and they're still recruiting, and they're just kind of doing off-season workouts. And, like, I think it's just getting back to the routine on both sides of it, man. Like, you just want to get back on the field, back with the guys, back in that structure. I, I think that it's kind of similar for both, actually, when you think about it. I've never – was never part of spring as a player. So I, at the level I played, I was never part of spring ball. We didn't have spring ball as a player. So I couldn't really speak to what it was like as a player. I think Ryan speaks to what it would be like, I would assume, as a player. Um, as a coach, for me, Ryan, the big thing would be this is your first chance to really see what your culture is is developing and 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 how have the winter uh, workouts taken? Yeah. How how or excuse me? How have they taken to the winter workouts as in in your in your process of developing this team's? attitude and personality and those type of things is uh, is important and, and also who's been putting in the work sure right like yeah this guy's been working in the weight room but then he goes and drinks you know 15 beers every night afterwards and so you know you're kind of countering that off you know i mean there or, or who are the guys that are really serious about doing the things the right way and and becoming those players and that's um you start to see that a little bit you know this guy's a wh- wor- workout warrior but he's bending over puking after every by the end of every practice well he's clearly not doing something that he needs to be doing uh to to be a great football player not just a guy that goes out there and lists a bunch of weights the good thing with the way Notre Dame does it now though Ryan is if you're getting through the workouts now you're in good shape because they're much so much more you know a lot of the cardio you're getting is is actually is part of the workouts more than it used to be where it's like you know squats power cleans leg press bench you know, there's a lot more intensity from a, a cardiovascular conditioning standpoint in the way that they work now than there was when I was a player. I don't know about how it was when you were a player, but certainly when I was a player. Yeah. We had Ida Benami says, if Rocco Spindler is healthy, which he looked at, how does this change our rotation competition? Uh, quite a bit, actually, Ryan. That was one of the surprises for me. I thought Rocco had an ACL tear. Apparently it, it wasn't. He's going to be out there this spring to some degree. And I didn't take any team reps on Monday. And I don't know when that's going to happen. But to me, that's huge. Because I'll say it again. I still believe, with all due respect to Pat Coogan, that Rocco breaking out this spring, along with Billy Shrouth, gives Notre Dame its, most, its highest ceiling at guard for 2024. Now, Rocco had probably the worst moments of any of the starting five offensive linemen last year. I mean, the play where he tried to plant and redirect and pass that against Duke, and he just fell. I was like, that's – but Rocco also had some really impressive blocks in the run game. Like, so – and you and I have said this before, Ryan. Pat was the more consistent, steady player. His lows yeah. weren't like Rocco's lows, but his highs weren't nearly as good as Rocco's highs. Sure. And so if Rocco can use the experience he got last year, become a more consistent player – I think he actually fits this offense really well, much more so than he fit the one they ran last year. He is mm-hmm. a, I mean, Ryan, if you could, if you could say what is the offense that you, if if Rocco Spindler was going to excel, what would the offense be? It'd be an offense that's eighty-five plus percent inside zone and duo, correct? Yeah, that's that's what they're going to be. You don't mm-hmm. want Rocco pulling and trapping and getting out in space and doing all that with all, with that much frequency. He is a 320 plus pound phone booth player. And that's what they're going to ask him to be much more so than he was in the past. So that's kind of my stance on that one. But um, it's good that he'll we'll at least have an idea. If he doesn't win a starting job, it won't be because, well, he missed all spring. We don't know what he could have been. Right. He'll at all least right. have a chance to battle now, which is big for me. I'm interested to see how they kind of do the guard alignment if Rocco is one of the top two because if it's him and Billy Billy's been playing right guard and I don't want to move Rocco to left guard right like I don't want to do that so will they move Billy Shroud to left guard like I don't know just the interchangeableness of the alignments is gonna be a little bit interesting yep very interesting a lot of people at guard Ryan a lot of people yeah. at guard. they need to figure it out they need a couple guys at right tackle too to uh can to fight yeah, for a little I know, bit, right? I think seriously uh, Riker Ferg says, with the Wild West of college football with NIL, pay-for-play, transfer portal, et cetera, will it cause lower-level coaches like NAIA, D3, D2, FCS to stay there? Uh, no, uh, because uh, if you're making thirty-five grand at a Division three school, 
you will gladly accept all the problems that come with division one football when you're making five hundred thousand dollars. Look, I mean, so it's like, you know, you have the expression, you know, third world problems, first world problems, right? I mean, coaches leaving D one to go to the NFL because they don't want to deal with the Wild Wild West. Yeah, there's Division three coaches saying, "I'll deal with it. I'm making twenty grand. I'm making thirty five grand." You know, like the last coaching job I had was just, just ten years ago, Ryan. So it wasn't that long ago. I was basically the pass game coordinator, recruiting coordinator, and full time, and I made like thirty five grand. That's it. You know what I mean? I will gladly deal with the insanity that is Division One football to sure. have gone to a Power Five school and made five, six hundred thousand dollars. Gladly, oh, yeah. for sure, for sure. You know, it's just, it's just like it's the same thing with players. Oh, we're gonna, you know, I don't want to deal with this. There's tons of Division Two, II, Division Three players that would say, "Hey, I'll, I'll let you, you know, view me this way. Give me a scholarship to Notre Dame instead of taking out loans to pay forty grand every year to go to a little small school in the Midwest in Ohio. Sure, right. I'll take that problem." You know, so what may what may be considered as a problem to somebody, some people is considered a blessing to others. And that's the thing that some of us don't forget. So, no, no D3 coach is going to be like, nah, I was going to go D1 and get paid mm -hmm. a half a million dollars or more. But, yeah, I don't want to deal with all the Wild West and the NIL stuff. For I would have right. y'all know how much I hate this hey. stuff. Y'all know if I would have got offered. If I was still coaching and I was either at the FCS level or the D3 level, which are the two levels I coached at, in Notre Dame or Ohio State or Penn State or Arkansas State or Troy came calling and said, hey, we're going to pay you 250 grand to come coach here, where do I sign? Right. Now, you know, you got to deal with all this NIL stuff. Where I'll repeat, where do I sign? Because right now I'm barely able to put food on the table for my family making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 here at the Division three level. Right. So, you're all, yeah, regardless of what level you're at, you're also still going to be dealing with the transfer port or, uh, anyway. Yeah. Like, it's not like it's a but, but, but there's not the a thing perfect is, world. You played at that level. That's th this Wild West of the report has always been true. The Division three level. There's sure. never been a sit out sure. option. There were some leagues that had sit out options. And like mm -hmm. I had to sit out a year because I was changing positions and there's some other things kind of going on. But like there's no rule to say you can kids leave all the time. The Division three. This has been true at the Division three level forever. It's a different circumstance because a lot of times it's okay. I can't afford to. You guys were going to give me this loan. The school took my loan away, and I didn't get this grant. I got to go closer to home. I, you know what I mean? There's all type, but that's been true. So for Division Three, they're like, oh, wow, cry me a river. You guys can leave whenever they want. We have to turn over over half our roster every year because mm -hmm. not just the transfer portal, but kids come for a year, they can't afford it, they just go home. You know, drop out. Some yep. kids will just go to school. I, hey, I'd love to play football, but I got to work two jobs to pay for tuition, which is $40,000 at a little tiny school in the middle of nowhere, you right. know, insanely expensive. So, I mean, the, to your point, Ryan, this isn't that's, and I, I literally, one of the D3 jobs I had, I was the wide receivers coach, pass game coordinator, recruiting coordinator, video coordinator, and assistant head coach. And I got paid. 15 grand. So I get to go to a, a Virginia and make 400 grand and coach the receivers. That's it. Yeah. Sign me up because it's a, it's an easier life. I'm on the, I'm in the car for three straight months. I don't fly anywhere. I'm in the car. You know what I mean? Going from place to place. So yes, what, 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 what division one coaches may think is just, I can't deal with this life. There are a thousand division three coaches and division two coaches and any coaches are saying, I will gladly accept your problems. Now, a lot of them won't be as good as coaches, which is the ultimate problem for me, you know, but yeah, they would gladly take that. They're not, no coaches are going to, now could like a Larry Karras decide when he was still coaching? Yeah, I'm good at Mountain Union. I'm doing pretty good. And I don't want to deal with that. Sure. But the number of coaches like that, Ryan, are very, very small. Very, very well, I, I I was just going to add that I think that like if I was an FCS coach, for instance, and my roster was getting depleted every year because there was guys that needed to be supplemented and moved up in transfer portal, then it's disheartening as well. So even outside of the mm -hmm. money issue, it's still you're going to have to deal with the transfer portal because as players continue to move up, there's going to be a ripple effect and FCS teams are going to feel that as well. Division two teams are going to feel that as well. It's It's going to be a all encompassing yeah. issue, not just an FBS issue.
Yeah. Andrew Gilmore said BK must have been paid well at Grand Valley. He was there a long time. I'm sure he was paid okay, but let's be honest. Brian Kelly wasn't getting Division I jobs for most of his career at Grand Valley State. And, and look, Brian Kelly did a very good job at Grand Valley State over a period of time. But let's not forget, Brian Kelly wasn't winning like Larry Karras' his entire career at Grand Valley State. This is his first, let's see, that's his first 10 years at Grand Valley State. Nine and three, eight and three, six, three and two, eight and four, eight and three, eight and three, nine and two, nine and three, five and five, seven and four. He'd been to the playoff three times, lost in the first round every time. There were no division one offers coming, fellas. Then in 01, they go 13 and one, they're national runners up. And then the next two years, they win a national championship. That's when he got offered for, and they were putting up crazy numbers. That's when he got a job at Central Michigan. So Brian Kelly wasn't turning down division one head coaching jobs to stay at Grand Valley State. He wasn't getting those jobs because he wasn't winning enough. Then when he started winning, he jumped at the chance to go to the Division I level. So uh, that's how that one uh, played out, Ryan. Hey, Coleman Smith, this is thoughts on reports coming out on Saban's comments about his players after the Michigan game contributing to his retirement. I did not see this report, so I'm not really Basically, sure he's, he said one of the frustrating things was he didn't like how his players acted after the game. He's a big win with class, lose with class, or guys stolen their helmets. Okay. And he said, basically, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, Ryan, and it's shorting a bit, but basically, you know, after the season was over, he's having his exit meetings, and, and most of the players were talking about what guaranteed playing time am I going to have? Because A, uh, I'm, I'm going to transfer if I don't get guaranteed playing time. And then B, right. guys asking about what they're going to get paid. And he's like, this isn't how we built this thing. And and I, as far as I know, Nick Saban has no issue with NIL. But his issue is with what a lot of coaches are having where that is driving everything you're doing right. is, is, is this. And that becomes your focus. And it's not about winning and championships and things like that with more and more players. And for someone who was already kind of had his eye on retiring anyway, that's the kind of thing that's going to cause you to walk away and say, well, you know, what I built here is not, does not exist anymore. And so um, that was basically it. Gotcha. It's the harsh reality. I think, I think a lot of older coaches are still going to have to figure it out and get used to it because that it's just, it's kind of where the where the right. game is going, unfortunately. Right. So, but when you're saving and you don't have to deal with it anymore, I think that's kind of yeah. thing. And, and then now he's trying to use his voice to say, "Hey, look, we gotta we gotta bring some sanity back to this thing," you know. And and that's that's the reality of it because it, it can't exist the way that it is. But it's not going to exist the way that it is. It's just they're letting the courts decide it all. And then yep. when this thing crumbles, they'll start over from scratch and come up with some other system. And hopefully that system would be better. I just don't have a lot of faith um, that it will to be completely honest with you. We had PQ, what it do says, could you see the staff going with more experience in certain positions battle due to the tough road game week one, and then revisiting them as the schedule eases up after that. I mean, if you think a kid is ready to start, you start them. I mean, you, you can't, you can't get into that too much because then you miss a lot of reps that that kid's going to need in spring, summer, and fall camp. I mean, if a kid's going to be good enough to start for you, but you're worried about the experience, you just, it's, you go with it and you, you, you're playing. Cause right, Ryan, especially now in the 12 team playoff, it, you're not one game and you're out the way it used to be. You know, you play the young guys, you give them chances to go out and compete. You give them a chance to go out and win. If they're ready to play, you play. Now, here's the thing I'll say about this, though. If it's close, and the battle's like kind of even, then you may go with the younger guy until you really feel comfortable with the younger guy step, or you'll go with the veteran and then kind of work the younger guy in or maybe give him a chance and see how he does kind of coming off the bench, maybe in game two or three. So it would only be if it was close. That would be the only time that I would look at it and say, hey, they need to they need to consider kind of what they're doing here. South Paul 42 with a question. Do you think that Mike Denbrock has an idea uh, who he may want to feature in the offense? Also, shout out to the Notre Dame women's basketball team. Hashtag ACC tournament champs. Yep, definitely a huge, huge win. I mean, he has an idea. Look, there, and, and he should. Here's how it works, or here's how it should work, okay? Is you go into, you get here, and you get hired in January, February. You break down the film. You look at last season, and sometimes for younger players, you may even dive to some high school film, 
a lot of the top players that, that Notre Dame has, you know, like Jeremiah Love, he's already familiar with. You know, they did evaluations of him when he was at LSU. You know, but there's going to be times you sit there and you watch the film. And, and watching film is, is game film, but it's also a lot of practice film for guys that, that maybe didn't play a ton. And so you study the film, you look at who you have, then you go into winter workouts and you kind of see who's performing well in winter workouts. There are some things the coaches can be a part of and, and see who's really attacking it and who's doing well in the testing drills and things like that. And you go into spring with an idea of, okay, I think this guy's a playmaker for me. I think this guy can be a playmaker for me. I think this guy, this guy, this guy can be a playmaker for me. And so you go into the spring and you, you install your offense and you, you know, you put those guys in positions to see if they are or are not that, that type of player. But then you also have to have your your mind open enough to where, okay, I didn't know a whole lot about KK Smith, or I didn't know a whole lot about, you know, Keedron Young. We didn't recruit him at LSU or something like that. Or I didn't know a whole lot about, you know, Eli Raritan or Cooper Flanagan or, you know, pick a player that that maybe we're not expecting to be sort of that breakout player. And boy, during the spring, he's really performed well. So now let's see if we can build him to that. So you have to have an idea of of, of what you have as best you can. Going into the spring, you allow the spring to kind of either confirm certain things, change certain things. Some guys you think can be playmakers don't step up. Some guys you weren't counting on do step up, and then you adjust on the fly. Then you go into the summer, you have your program, and you come back in the fall, similar thing. Here's who I think we're going to build around. And then if those guys don't perform well, then you stop building around them. If other guys step up and perform well, then you build around them. And so you always have that type of, of you have a plan. But you have to be open enough to where that a plan is going to change based on guys showing that they're not capable of being that or other guys showing that they are capable of it. And that's how the plan goes. And, and I and I promise you Mike Denbrock went into spring with an idea of who his playmakers were going to be. But he's also going to allow himself to be kind of moved if certain guys go out there and earn it. Next question is from AST12321. Do you think Helmet Mike helps offense more with easing Riley Leonard's transition to new offense or defense more with helping new linebackers line people up? I actually think it's going to help the defense more. And the reason I think that is because you're playing a lot of teams that kind of go with a decent tempo. And so what you're going to be allowed to do is you're going to be allowed to communicate a lot with Drake Bowen if he's your starting linebacker, Mike linebacker, or Jay Nosbury if he's your starting Mike linebacker, or – King Savili Maas, if he's your starting Mike linebacker, whoever your starting Mike linebacker is, you're going to be able to communicate with him. And, and you know, teams that are going kind of with some kind of tempo, they're making movements, and you're kind of yelling in his ear what the check is, you know, and 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 having some communication up until the point when the mic's cut off. So I, I think it helps both, but I think it helps Drake Bowen or whoever the starting Mike linebacker is. I anticipate it being Drake Bowen more so uh, because of the nature of it. I think more often than not. I would assume it kind of helps the quarterback a little bit more, but I, I think it, it provides a huge benefit to the defense as well. I really do. Good question. Joe Papiti asks, what are the chances that all of the running backs stay until the season uh, or is a transfer or something that can be expected? And if so, who? I'm never going to speculate on who transfers are. I just don't do that, number one. Number two, I don't. I don't think it's fair for fans to just assume that, that every kid is not going to wins a job is going to transfer. I mean, we didn't see that last year. I mean, they had five guys last year and they didn't leave. Nobody left. Right. I mean, so we, we just have this assumption that every kid that doesn't play is going to leave. And I just don't think that's a fair assumption, especially when your two youngest players are freshmen. I, I just I don't see that being the case. I and if a guy was like that, then that's not really a guy you're going to win with anyway. Or you just promise him something and you didn't deliver on your promise. So, no, I don't I don't expect a transfer to happen. Could it, guys? Anything can happen in today's age. But am I am I like, hey, if this guy doesn't play, he's going to leave? No, I don't know anyone that's that way. I think everybody's bought in right now. Now after the spring, if certain things happen. And I won't even say what, because then it gets into the whole, this guy might transfer thing, but there are certainly things that could happen. Guys get passed up, guys, you know, outperform other players, whatever the case may be. And, and guys says, Hey, you know what? I thought I was going to be here, but now I'm here and I've got to think about what's best for my future. And that's fine. I don't, you know, I, here's the thing, guys, I, I will never say there's no reason to transfer. I transferred after my freshman year. I mean, it's just, that was life. I mean, I just, I went there thinking one thing was going to be the case. It wasn't that way. And so I, I left. 
so if a kid decides, hey, this is what's best for my future and, you know, more power to him. But I just don't I don't think it's a situation where every kid who's not playing is going to leave. Otherwise, Notre Dame would lose over half their roster every offseason as would every other team after the spring. So um, I, I don't anticipate any running backs leaving. And if 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 things change based on where the depth chart is now, maybe. But I'm not assuming it as we as we get into it. I, I'm just not. Hey, Ryan, welcome back. I got a question for you. It's from okay. Iden Benami. Ryan, when was the last time you had to sleep on your daughter's floor watching film? I'm assuming that's a relatively recently, right, Ryan? No, it's actually not that recent. I oh, really? so my 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 uh, daughter Juliet, who's three, is now in the stage of sneaking into mommy and daddy's bed every night. So I watch film in my bed while she's sleeping in my bed now, not on the floor as much. You're not in Raina's room on the floor, or she's still nah, in with you guys? No, nah, she's she's still in a crib, so okay. she's not uh she's not getting up and out of bed or any of that type of stuff. Okay. And she goes to sleep after her bottle. So okay, there you yeah. go. There you go. We had the worst 2K big man HD says mailbag are the first round of playoff games. The only games on a campus and are the playoff games a week apart like regular season games are. Uh, So first question, only the first round will be on college campuses. The quarterfinal semis and championship game will all be on neutral fields. Are the games a week apart like the regular season? No, they're not. I So I, the first round games this year, for example, are on the 19th and the 20th, I believe. It's a Friday and a Saturday. The next round is not till like the 31st and the 1st. So it's like 10 days, 10, 11 days, depending on which day you play. Yeah. So no, they're not. They're not. They should be, in my opinion. I mean, they should be first round games, Friday and Saturday. And then after that, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. That's how it should be. But such as life, that would also be something I would address in my uh, State of the Union of college football conversation, sure. Ryan, would be, sure. why are we playing our championship game on Monday night? Why are we, uh, you know, uh, why, why are we never made, kowtowing never made to the NFL's sense. late season, regular season games, which a lot of times don't get, nobody cares about. We're going to play on Saturday. And yeah. if ESPN doesn't want to do that because they have Saturday night games on ESPN, fine. I'm sure Fox and CBS and NBC would gladly pay us a ton of money to host games as well. So, um, yeah, it's ridiculous. I've, I've, I've always hated the Monday night's college football championship game. It's really stupid. It's ridiculous. It's really, stupid. really, really dumb. Really, really dumb. We had a question from Joe Papiti who says, I guess this is kind of la- tongue-in-cheek, but maybe not really. How close are we to scholarship players being considered contracts, which would give colleges the ability to trade players? I don't know that that's going to happen. I, I would be very but, surprised if there was a trade possibility of, yeah. of college players at some point. I'd be very but surprised. there will be some coaches that discuss it. There will absolutely be some coaches that discuss it. Because, like, look, here's the thing. Once you make them employees, that's a logical step. Like, guys, well, they're not going to cut players. Yeah, they are. If they have to, if the schools become responsible for paying these kids salaries because they're employees, you better darn well believe you're not going to have a fifth string running back senior who's making, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting on your roster, not doing anything. You're going to cut them. Right. Well, I mean, but they would still honor the a- academic piece, right? As far as like, you might not be an athletic. Right. Player, I would assume, but, yeah. I would imagine that would be something that would be negotiated. I, 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 I think that that's why it would, would never assume. go to a trade aspect because then you're talking about like also the academic piece of like yeah. trading it, and like, could it be something stuff, where right? trades happen in the off season? Certainly. But again, they're employees now. Right. right. And if you want to be treated like an employee, then don't cry. When you get treated like an employee, like if you think like these, some, there's so many of these idiots that, like I, I get so disgusted by the the lawyers that are involved in this, like in, in the things they say on Twitter, like this one moron was like, well, if you don't want guys to be treated like employees then then they shouldn't have to practice this. And do, I'm like, show me you never played competitive sports or were any good at comp- competitive sports w- without show. Like, so you're telling me that we're going to treat them like employees and then take away the thing that develops them in their careers that helps develop them to go make even bigger money in the National Football League because we because if if we're going to have them practice X amount of hours and do this and do that, then they have to be considered employees. It's I just it's I just want to freaking find people and just pound them into the ground. You know, it's just it's just the greed and, and I, all these like, Oh, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm an NIL. I, I care about the young people. No, you don't. You're just trying to get your piece of the pie. Shut up. Because the things that you guys are proposing are just as you guys are part of the problem here. You guys are just as guilty with all this crap as the NCAA is in my opinion. 
And and that's to me a, a big problem of this. But look, you can't be treated like an employee and then say, yeah, but I don't want the bad things that come with being treated like an employee. I just want the good things like getting paid. Yeah. You know, no, there's going to be bad things too. You're going to oh. get cut. Oh, you I, know, I, you're going to get I, traded. I, I think contracts will be terminated. I just don't think we'll ever get to a point of trades, though. I think that's I think that that's too weird. I don't and know. it'd be too I, hard I, I, in I 130. But if if they go to like a 60 team league, you know that right. type of thing, and it's not NCAA anymore, why not? You know what I, I mean? I, I like, just I just think what the, the academic piece is signed. I think I think it's just going to be transfer portal. The whole led. point like, of this whole thing, Ryan, is they're they're trying to get away with that. Being, a, I mean, go look at the lawyers. Go look at the meat. They don't care about the academic piece. You, your problem, Ryan, is you actually care about young people. That's the mistake you're making here. <laughs> is that you actually you're actually thinking about what's best for the futures of young people? Well, I just don't and understand the problem how is they would make any sense though. The I mean, problem I'm is not even they talking don't about care. the morality. Yeah, right. but they well, don't I just don't care. think it tangibly makes sense though. I. I like I'm not even talking about the morality piece. I I think we agree on that, but it's just I, I don't I don't trading. think it's going to come, Ryan. I'm just saying I think there's going to be people pushing for it. Right. I, I definitely okay. think there will be coaches right. pushing for it, whether they or not it happens for it, or but not. I don't think it's ever going to happen. We'll see. <laughs> right. But at this point in time, nothing would surprise me. Nothing would surprise. I me. I would be surprised if it ever got the trades. Yeah. I just think it's going to be the transfer portal and steroids, if anything. Yeah. Like I just think... well, if they become employees, then then the transfer portal will 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 go away in the the way that it is now. Because you'll sign a contract. You have a three-year contract. It'll be like the NFL. If you're if you're signed to a three-year contract, you can't transfer to the, the Bears, right? right. You, if you're an employee right. and you sign a three-year contract, you're under contract. I mean, you and, and if you hold, get out of that players contract. Players can hold out and then ask yeah, to get out of the contract. Yeah, that's fine. And I mean, that which, happen. Which but. has less impact when you're on an 85 scholarship football team. You know what I mean? Like if, if, you, if a guy holds, okay, fine. You want to hold out? That's okay. You know, it, right. it works in the NFL because you have limited rosters. Yeah, you have a 50, what, 54, Three. whatever, 50, whatever man roster, 53 man roster. Yep. I've got 85. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, like, I'll just use it this way. You look at this, like, Audric Estime wants to hold out. All right. Okay. Well, Jeremiah, Jadarian, Jabron. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just like teams are going to be so much better prepared to do that. Now, there will be certain players like Caleb Williams to hold out. You're kind of effed. But in a lot of these kids that want to hold out, it's just not going to matter as much to them. Right. So, now Joe, Joe Walt wants to hold out. It's a different type of impact. So it, it's just gonna. It's just. And, and how are people gonna re- react to that? They're gonna hate it. And that's the whole thing. You're you're destroying what makes this game what it is. And the old system, like this one idiot I was talking to, this one lawyer moron that I was talking to, right? He's like, "You're just mad because things are changing." I'm like, "You're just saying whatever stupid thing you want to say. I have no clue what I believe." I hate the NCAA. I don't like the way the system was. But what you idiots are advocating for is going to make is worse. There's this notion that change is always good, Ryan. And mm-hmm. change is not always good. You don't no. you don't have it like the transfer portal. The way that the transfer portal happened before was was wrong. But what we're doing now is way worse than what it was before. And that's the issue is is we're not actually fixing things. We're taking things we didn't like and we're making them worse. Sure. And so, but, but to your point, there won't be the transfer portal like you have now. I just, I don't see how you can have employees. And then like, there's two sides to the negotiation. There's the player side and then there's a school side. The schools are going to make their demands as well. And one of them is going to be, if you sign a three-year contract, then you're here for three years. Well, coaches can get out of it. Yeah, but coaches have to pay buyouts. So fine, you know, you, you can you can leave, but we've negotiated you were a five-star quarterback. We've negotiated into your contract that you have to you know, have whatever your buyout's gonna be. So this whole thing's gonna get super stupid and ugly, and I'm just not even remotely looking forward to it at all. Yeah. At all. Hey, Gregory Perez who says, and it's a super chat. Thank you so much, Gregory. What would your all potential depth chart look like in Notre Dame roster this year? All potential. So we're Banking on the upside of these positions. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Quarterback this year, 2024, Riley Leonard would be my pick at quarterback. I don't know if you just want to go back and forth on these. No, nope. yeah, just if, if I just if I have somebody else in mind, I'll just I'll just I'll add it in. Okay. Uh running back, I would go with Jeremiah Love splitting carries with Jadarian Price and then having Kedron Young as a short yardage back would probably be my mm-hmm. all upside team. Yep. Wide receivers, I would go with just strictly on upside. I would have Chris Mitchell, Cam Williams, Jaden Greathouse as my three wide receivers across the board, I suppose. And then obviously guys like, well, 
<laughs> my only difference is, is I would have Deion Cole. If we're just talking upside, I have Deion Colsey in my starting lineup. I, I'm I'm done with the upside talk on Deion Colsey. You've been doing it for three years. I'm done well, with that's, it. That's that's fine. It. I mean, that, 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 if <laughs> yeah. we're having a conversation about who's going to break out, that's a different conversation. If we're just talking upside, I, I look at the makeup of the boundary, his size, his experience, because we're talking 2024, right? Not just when they. Yeah. Like I think if Deion Colsey becomes the best version of himself in 2024. He's better than Cam Williams being the best version of himself as a freshman in 2024. Now, if you want to have a debate about whether or not Deion, who do you have more faith reaching that standard in 2024, that's a different conversation for me. Uh, But yeah, Chris Mitchell, I'm with you. Jaden Greathouse, I'm with you. I'll say this. I won't be at all shocked if Jaden Greathouse is Notre Dame's best receiver this year at all. No. At all. I wouldn't either. No. Tight end? Eli Raritan. Mm Mm-hmm. Offensive, offensive line, or offensive uh, Charles, line, left to right. Let's go left to Char- right. Yep, Charles Jagasaw. I'll go Billy Shrouth at left guard. I'm gonna flip him over there. Mm-hmm. Center. I'll go with. I'll go with Ashton Craig. Although I think Joe Wilding has a conversation of all upside potential, but I'll go with Ashton Craig right guard. I'm gonna move Sullivan Absher into right guard, and then I'll play Emil Wagner at right tackle. Okay. That the right tackle one's a tough one because I just right now I don't see Emil's upside as as much as I'd hoped it would be just because he just really struggles to move people. Um, but then the other problem is I don't know who the right tackle would be other than him because he certainly has more right. upside than Tosh. I I kind of think I'm just going to go all power and just put Sullivan over at right tackle and have him be my right tackle and then go with either Rocco or Sam Pendleton at guard right guard. I do agree okay. with you on the Shroud the left guard move. I would definitely do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's what I do there. I just – and then just say, hey, look, we're not going to have a great pass blocker at right tackle, but we're going to be a dominant run blocking team with that that's lineup. Right. That's why I go. But for the most part, we're close. How about uh, D-line, Ryan? Let's go Viper to big end across the board that way. Viper, Bubakar, defensive mm-hmm. – um, interior defensive line, I would have Riley Mills and – Jason Onye, and mm-hmm. then I would have as my defensive end of Bryce Young. Okay. I'd go Burnham at defensive end for this year. Uh, I'm I, The Jason Onye one is interesting, and I'd have to yep. think about that one, but I don't have an immediate pushback for you, Ryan. It's like, mm, okay, all right. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting one. Uh, mm-hmm. Riley Mills, Bubakar, completely agree. Linebacker, let's go uh, Will Mike Viper. Will Mike uh, do we want to go four two three? We want to go four three personnel or four two five personnel? Just do four three. Right? Just do four okay. three. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll have Jalen Sneed at Viper. I'll have Will. Uh, Will's tough. Um, no, where you you have him a Rover? Jalen Sneed a Rover? Yeah, a Rover. Yeah, I'll okay. Have a Rover for gotcha. now. Um, Will's a really difficult conversation. I am going to go with for twenty twenty four. I'll go with Jaden Osbury. I mm-hmm. guess. And then I'll go with Drake Bowen at Mike. We have the same three, but it's much easier for me to go with Jaden Osbury at Will than it than it was yeah. for you. Well, I was thinking about Kingston. I was thinking about Kingston. Yeah. And I think Kingston's ready to play. So yeah. that's kind of my only thing. Yep. yep. Let's go corners. Corner. Yeah, I, th- I think it's who we're, you're already seeing at corner this this off season so far. And it's Christian Gray and Benjamin Morrison at corner. Yep. And uh, mm-hmm. safety, Xavier Watts, obviously is one. Who would be your other mm-hmm. safety? A Don Scholler for now until Bronte gets on campus. So if we're going to go yeah. all upside. I'd probably go Luke Talich if we're okay. just talking upside. Um, if we went nickel, it'd be Micah Bell. Yeah. So, Agreed. yeah. So we're, we're pretty much on the same page, Ryan, as far as upside. Just a um, couple fewer freshmen than the, I, you have a couple more freshmen than I would have. But uh, if we're talking 2025, yep. then you and I then immediately get on the same page with mm-hmm. those. With, if we're talking 2025, Cam Williams is certainly a starting receiver for me and Bryce Young would be a starter uh, at end for me. So I'm still, uh, I'm still getting over that Jason Onye one, man, that, that I wasn't ready for that. I just thought you were going to go Howard cross. That's a yeah. really interesting one. I mean, I was going, we're, we're just talking upside, right? Six, five, yeah. 287 athletic, long arms, strong. Yeah. I, I'm, with mm-hmm. I'm with you. I'm with you. I dig it. Got a super, uh, had- super chat from Mark Scott Gibbs. Scott, thank you very, very much. Haven't seen you around in a while, Scott. So very glad to see you in the chat today and i appreciate that super chat from you man very very much very very much we have another super chat from the nd milton fan thank you so much nathan very appreciate it could devin ford be a starter by midseason at safety how difficult is it to learn a new position like safety um i mean it's a 
he's been playing running back now for what five years like just on the college level so i mean that's a big transition obviously for one season i i think this is more setting up for a long-term future nathan i haven't seen him at safety so i can't comment like how well it looked day one in an earning uniform but I'd be kind of surprised if he was a starter by midseason at safety in his first year playing yeah. safety on the college level. It'd just be a little bit surprising. I'd be, yeah, with you, I'd be very surprised about that. And how difficult is it to learn a new position like safety? It depends on how frequently you've played. I mean, look, it took Xavier Watts a couple of years to get back to being comfortable, and he'd only been away from playing safety for like a year and a half, two years right. in high school. I mean, I, you know, and I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen film of Devin Ford playing safety. Now he may have. Um, but all the high school film I saw of him was him playing running back and kick returning kicks. So I don't even know that he even played safety. He may have. I just don't know. But as you said, Ryan, he's going to his sixth year of college. It's been a long time since he's played safety, even if he did. Exactly. And so, no, that's a very hard move to make. I mean, it's not like we're talking about him going from corner to nickel. I mean, Xavier Watts went from receiver to kind of nickel to safety. And it was a couple year transition. Yeah, before he got comfortable really playing that. So um, I, that, I actually kind of like the transition from Devin Ford, though. I do like the transition because if his did you hear the he, reason why? Because he wants to get ready for the next yeah. level, and his next yeah. best best spot on the next level potential yeah. sticking point is as a special teamer, and that would be That's right. A, a yeah. Great idea. Thanks. For Love that. it. Love it. Really, just really respect that that mindset yeah. from him, Ryan. I really do. I really do. All right, we had another super chat from Zach Nichols. Thank you so much, Zach. Very appreciate it. As always, is Steve Angeli reaching his potential better than Ian Book? How would 20, 2028, 2018 play out? Hard to conceptualize minimal quality needed for a championship quarterback play. Wow. Um, I, I think I'm understanding the question correctly. If um, So you're saying just throw throw Steve Angeli now into 2018? Like, Is that my question? Let's say we took – because basically Ian Book stepped into the lineup in 2018 as a third-year guy. Right. Let's say you take third-year version of Steve Angeli and put him on that team. I would take that. I would take that. Really? Yeah, wow. in 2018. 2019, right. 2020, maybe not, because Ian had to do a lot more with his legs in 19 and 20. I would take that. But here's the thing, because I'm looking at Ian over his, the course of his whole career, but really what it comes down to is it comes down to how Ian played in the championship, in the playoff game. Because the thing about Ian, Ian was outstanding in the regular season that year. I mean, outstanding. But when he played against Clemson, that was our first glimpse into what would become Ian Book, which is sure. when the lights were brightest, he was just unwilling to take the chances needed and make the throws nope. needed to compete. I don't think Steve would have that same issue. Now, whether or not Steve could hit those that's throws. that's a coaching staff thing, though? I, I feel no, because like I just I kind of thing. felt um, I kind of felt that was just more of an Ian thing. I mean, he had the same issue in the NFL. You talk to different coaches on the program. It'd be, you know, like I remember talking to 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 Chip Long about this, and and he'd be like, you know, just. Every time I'll call it out play, he just he won't read it. I'm like, dude, how many times you got called out play before you realize he's just not going to read it the way you want him to read it? You know what I mean? So, like, to a degree, that's yeah. a coaching thing. But I just don't think Ian had that in him, to be honest with you, because um, I just I just don't. But regular season Ian Book in 2018 is the best quarterback play Notre Dame has had in the last 10 years over the course of a regular season. I mean, Ian Book right. regular season in 20, 2018 was really good. I just think Steve would have been more aggressive in 2018 that year. The problem is, is that the way that the the roster shook out the next couple of years, you kind of needed Ian's playmaking ability in some of those games right. because they didn't have the talent around him like they had in 2018, right. in my view. So it's a little bit different. But 2018 against Clemson, I'd probably take third year Steve Angeli. Regular season, it's a different story because, like I said, Ian was good. Let, let, let me just pull up the numbers here, Ryan. This is what Ian Book did in 2018 in the regular season. When he finally took over as starting, starting quarterback, so from Wake to USC, completions percentage of 73-5, 72-7, 71-4, 81-3, 81-8, 64-7, 62 56 4 and then 50 in the playoff game. So it kind of went down after the injury. Here's his passing yards. 325, 278, 271, 264, 330, 343, 292, 352. Yards mm -hmm. per attempt, 9, 6, 8, 4, 7, 7, 8, 3, 10, 0, 10, 1, 7, 9, 9, 0. 
and he threw at least two touchdown passes in every game and threw five picks in the uh, six picks in the regular season. And, and then, of course, he also rushed for a touchdown and, and had 43, 47, 31, 50, 56, 16, and 16 rushing yards in those games. That was really good play. But yeah. it just – when it when again, when the lights were brightest, he wasn't as good, in my opinion. Um, so that that's always going to be – and that's the one thing I've always felt about Steve. Steve is never going to shy away from the moment. Here's the thing, though, Ryan – and I'm curious if this is your pushback. Is your pushback because you think Ian Book had more physical talent than Steve Angeli? No, my, my, my pushback is I'm not sure that, that Ian Book had it in him, but I'm also not sure that Steve had it in him, mm -hmm. has it in him. And also I think that the – I do think that the coaching held Ian back, though, a little bit. I, I do think that that happened. Oh, I think it agree. helped the team sure. back. I think it helped yeah, the team back. Who would agree? Absolutely. I mean, Brian, Brian yeah. Kelly has, made a, has been a moniker of – falling short in the big games like that's not an oh, Ian sure. issue. That's, that's a, a Brian Kelly issue that's a great right? point I mean, it's a great yeah. point yeah and the quarterback's gonna be a right you know uh, he's gonna be what the, the, the coach is it's a good point it's a good point yeah. I think I think for me it's just it's they were both that way yeah but it's the great unknown right well how would Ian Book have been if he would have played for Mike like if he'd have played for Mike Leach who he's originally committed sure. to sure you know it's a good question very good really good questions today Ryan Here's one. I'm going to ask this one of you because I've actually I've actually talked about this recently, and I want to get your opinion on this, Ryan. It's from Coleman Smith. He says, "Where does Jordan Patelho need to improve for his final year to be successful?" Well, I think he needs to play with a more consistent approach from the start of a snap. I think his I think his snap jump was a little bit off time last year. I thought he was a little bit late off the snap a ton. I also think that he gained a little too much weight, and he was very. I think that he was a little bit more tight than he, what he was previously, because I think the best version of what Jordan was in previously and why he broke out, you know, two years ago in the bowl game was he could work the outside shoulder and he had good bend to his hips and he was able to work to win outside consistently. I think this past year, he was just a little bit too tight. He wasn't as flexible. And I think that it hurt in a ton. So I think better off the snap, better plan of attack and he needs to be a little bit more flexible, which is why I was, I heard he was good in the first practice. I know you said that, but, him being still up at 263 pounds, like that worries me a little bit. Like that, Ryan, he's a lineman in a non-padded practice. It was nice to see, but it's yeah. not. It's not. So what? It's a non-padded practice, right? Like yeah. I need to see him do that every day, because like that practice could just be a, a, a microcosm of his entire career. When the lights yeah. on, man, he's really good. But then the next four weeks, he disappears. So one yeah. good practice where he showed he can blow past Tosh Baker is like, okay, well that's what he's supposed to do. You know what I, I mean? Just, it's like, let's see, can really he do it like the this, next 14? I would still really just like the, him to be in the 250 to 255 range. I don't know why he has to be 263 pounds at his height. I just yeah. don't get that at all. But Agree. Could be wrong. Agree. Ida Benami, is it a downgrade or does it look bad, et cetera, if you move from tackle to guard? Obviously, if the guy is better there or, or, or only way he can get PT, I get it. But overall, seems tackle is more important. I mean, I, I guess if you're talking about it's more important because tackles get bigger salaries in the NFL, sure. Um, but look, you're not moving your elite tackle to play guard. So it, it's it, what's more important that you're the backup right tackle or that you're the starting right guard. I mean, that that's really what the choices are for the most part. I mean, sometimes you'll move a starting right tackle inside because it opens up a starting job for somebody else who's better tackle. Sure. Okay. That 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 can happen. Uh, we saw that with Josh Lugg in, uh, in in 2022, right, where he was the starting right tackle in 2021. And you move him inside because you've got Blake Fisher back and he's ready to take over. Okay, fine. But Josh Lugg should have always been a guard. Once the injury set in, he just wasn't a tackle. And so, uh, you know, look, for other players, I mean, it worked out beautifully for Quentin Nelson. Quentin Nelson was a tackle coming out of high school, and he started off a tackle at Notre Dame his freshman year. So did Jarrett Patterson. Moving inside made them made them have better careers than I think they would have had outside. So it just yeah. depends on the player. Like, would would moving inside to guard have been good for Joe Alt? No, because even if he was as good at guard as he was a tackle, Ryan, do you think? And let's just say NFL teams were not going to move him back out to tackle. Do you think he gets drafted as high as he? So on this question, no. I, 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 no. as he as he would play, All right? No, he won't. So, um, so yeah. So I mean, in those type of regards, sure, but. It, you, again, you're not moving your best player from tackle to guard if he's your best tackle. Right. You just, you, you know what I mean? Like you're just not doing that. 
Well, I think I think there's a big difference between moving a guy inside because it best fits the situation or best fits his demeanor, and having to move a guy inside because he's functionally not athletic enough. Yeah, there's a huge difference there, and I think that's the push you see in the NFL draft circles all the time. There's like a stigma over moving guys from tackling the guard, but I mean, I do it all the time projecting guys inside the guard because it's like their demeanor fits better there. Maybe there are shorter thresholds, but I think in college, like I would say it like this, Iden. If I'm moving Quentin Nelson inside the guard, it's because I think that he could be an elite guard. Could he still have been a very good tackle at Notre Dame? Sure, but he but he turned into an elite All-American level yep. top 10 overall draft pick and a guard, right? You, you've you found the spot that best fit his potential. If you're moving a guy because their potential is higher in a certain spot, that's great. But if you're talking about a guy that was okay at tackle, but you're like, okay, he just functionally can't play outside and we have to move him inside like that's a negative right because yeah. then you're just like you you moved him because you had to not because you wanted to and that's a right. big distinction i think that people miss i i've always felt ryan that quentin nelson could have been a liam eikenberg type of player at tackle in college yeah but he was a generational talent and i don't use that word very often at guard yeah and that, that that's that's really what you know what i mean so like him moving the guard was twofold one is they felt that was his best position where he could be elite and number two you had mike mcglinchey and ronnie stanley at tackle so it was also about putting your best five out there yep so i, I do think your point about if you're moving a guard because you can't play tackle that's a different animal right but guys who can't play tackle don't often go to guard and become elite players it happens I, but I, it, it not I, not often in my opinion I would say there's a much different feeling of Quentin Nelson moving from guard to tackle than Josh Lug moving from guard to ta tackle to guard, which was your original conversation point. So yeah. Yeah, much different feel around those two situations. Right. Here's one, Ryan, from Aiden Benami for you. It says, uh, Ryan, any early ideas on who the Colts will draft or be looking at? They're what, 15th? I'm looking at it Number now. 15. 15th? Okay. Number 15, yep. I thought I didn't. I, I I haven't seen what they've been doing in free agency today because I know the legal tampering period opened today at twelve. So there's been a lot of movement. Obviously, the two positions that I had only the one thing I did see the Colts do was they they signed Michael Pittman Jr. to a I think a four year contract I believe an extension for four, like seventy million or something like yeah, that. Yeah, three years for seventy. Yeah, yeah, three for seventy. So uh, wide receiver was one that was potentially on the table if Michael Pittman did walk, but obviously you have him back. So I think wide receiver is. Secondary wide receiver, I think, is still a need-ish, but I don't think it's one that you have to press as early as maybe you once had to. Defensive end is a spot that I keep mocking to the draft. Like I think that the the ideal scenario is that you have either Jared Verse or Dallas Turner staring at you in the face at number fifteen overall if you're the Indianapolis Colts. If you have both, which is kind of unlikely that both of them will be on the board, but if you do have both, then you can just pick the style you want. Like, do you want the more standy, stand-up, bendy rusher in a Dallas Turner? Or do you want the physical power, you know, speed the power guy like a Jared versus? I think Indianapolis with a defensive end and edge would be an ideal scenario potentially. So Ryan, a couple early signings. I'm just quickly looking at this while you're um, while you're talking. Yeah. Obviously, um, Kirk Cousins is going to the Falcons. Yes. Uh, you've got uh, 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 Saquon Barkley. Contract. Yeah, yeah. Saquon Barkley is signing with the Eagles. Yes. Uh, the Packers are signing Josh Jacobs and cutting Aaron Jones. A yep. um, couple more here real quick that look interesting to me. Um, John Runyon is signing with the Giants on a three-year deal. Um, Pack, uh, Panthers are cutting Von Bell. Yep. The Rams signed Jonah Jackson to a $51 million Good deal. Player. Yep. Yep. Was he with the Rams last year? That's a re-signing, right? Or no, is, is Jonah ja Jackson was he was a Detroit Lion. So gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Oh, they re-signed Kevin Dotson. That's who the re-signing yes. was, it says here. Um yes. Eagles signed Bryce Huff. Uh, yep. Rams signed Colby Parkinson. Uh, let's see here. Jaguars signed Gabe Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, Raiders signed Christian Wilkins. To a hundred and ten million dollar deal. By the way, a guy who was an All American and uh, got two degrees by the time he left. Yep. By the way, yep. um, and then the Broncos signed Brandon Jones, which I don't care about because Brandon Jones is okay they're, though. They're, they're, they're terrible. Solid safety. It's it's just not about safety. that. It's they're just the Broncos are yep. just really upsetting me right now. Um, yep. I was glad to see them get rid of um, well, what's his name though. To be honest with you, so yeah, those are um, those are the early signings. Welcome Ryan. to quarterback purgatory, Atlanta yeah. Falcons. Congratulations, yep. guys. You are yep. here.
it's nice and friendly here. You can join uh, the Broncos fans in that in that you're, category you're, as well. You're, you're gonna be like, you're gonna be like, man, Kirk Cousins is pretty solid, and then yeah. you're gonna get to a big game where you'd be like, huh, but he's not good enough. And then oh, yeah. lo and behold, you're nine and eight or ten and seven, where it really doesn't matter anymore, yeah. does it? Congratulations. <laughs> yep. All right, here we go. We had Jesse Ferguson. What is the biggest boomer bust position group on Notre Dame's roster right now? I'm thinking offensive line, plenty of talent and size, but a lot to prove both on the players and the position coach. I actually was also thinking offensive line, Jesse. That's an interesting one because, I mean, you have a lot of inexperience up front. It's a lot of high-level talent. I mean, you think about what Charles Jagasaw potentially could become, what Billy Shrouth could become, what Ashton Craig could become. I mean, there's a lot of top top shelf talent there, but – Talking about guys that have started one game, what three games and three games? That yeah, Jagasaw one, mentioned. Craig three, Shroud three. Yeah, yeah. So, Baker's I mean, got four career starts. If, if they all hit their ceilings in one season, then you have a very good offensive line, right? But if if two of the three just aren't ready to be that guy, then you're like, oh man, I'm not sure. You'll have some good moments, but you'll be very inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. Ryan, I'm O line and O line and linebacker are the two that immediately popped in my head about line, yeah. because okay. for everything you just said about offensive line, you can apply that to linebacker. Sure. Right. Lots of talent, but not a lot of experience. If they figure it out, they're going to be really, really good. If they don't, it's going to be inconsistent and there's going to be some rough moments. Yeah. Those are, those are the two for me because like safety is not there because safeties could be a bust, but I don't think there's the same boom factor at safety as there is on the offensive line. I like a Don Shula. I like Luke Talich, like Ben Minnick. Bringing in some talented yeah. freshmen, but none of those guys are Charles Jagasaw or Drake Bowen or Jaden Osberg, sure. Kingston Villiam Asa or or Billy Shrouth kind of guys, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that would be the one. Yep. All right. So we got B feeder ND08. It's a B feeder. Where do you think Audric Estime lands and how many yards does Phil Maffa run for this year? I thought he's upstaged Will Shipley last year. You want to answer the first part about uh Audric? Yeah. Some, someone asked, I think someone asked on a super chat on Friday. Uh, so a couple of teams that I know were interested in Aldrich Estime, at least during the combine season, we'll see what the top 30 visits look like, but the Baltimore Ravens had him for a formal visit. They showed demonstrates interest in him. The Cleveland Browns also did as well. Although I think the Browns may have signed a running back today. So I don't know if that will stay true, but they had shown interest. The San Francisco 49ers were another team that showed interest. I was told that the Browns really liked Audrick Estime by a couple people down there, but I think they may have signed a running back, so that may change that scenario there. But I, my favorite spot would be the Baltimore Ravens because I'm just dreaming of him running inside zone with Lamar Jackson, right, and some power yeah. read stuff where it's like, okay, have fun with that. Good, good night. Second, second part of the question, Ryan. Um, no, I don't. I don't think Phil Moffa upstaged Will Shipley last year. I, I think he was a very good back and Will Shipley was a very good back and Will's the better all around player. Phil had more success as a pure runner. I think part of it was that Phil Moffa had, was able to kind of become step into that role when the line started to play better down the stretch. And so as far as what he'll do this year, I think Phil Moffa is going to be very good this year. If he can stay healthy. I mean, cause I think yeah. the offensive line is going to be a lot better. He's a, I mean, him and Audric have some similarities, you know, bigger backs, uh, he's got a nice burst as he showed on that 40 yard, 41 yard touchdown against Notre Dame. He's got a nice feet. He's good back. He had a really good game early in the year. Had a really, I don't want to say he had a really good game against Duke, but he had a big run against Duke that helped spark them. So uh, he, he brings some, he brings surprising big playability in that offense for a 230 pound guy, in my opinion. He's, but no, I, I think Phil Moff is going to be very good this year. It, the key is going to be for their team this year is going to be Cade Klubnik figuring it out. That that's going to be the key yeah. for them, Ryan, because if he can figure it out and, and really just be the 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 productive playmaking game manager, I'm using a couple things there because I, I do think he brings some some gaminess to him. Uh, but he's it's about he's got to run the offense, he's got to get the ball where it needs to go. That's the big thing for Kate Klubnik. He's got to get the ball where it needs to go. Uh, if he can have play well, I think they're going to be pretty good because I think their offensive line had some really good young talent last year. Uh, injuries forced a lot of different guys into the field, so there's going to be a lot more experience. Uh, I'm, I'm high on Clemson this year. I really am. I mean, they had their last two recruiting classes hit well at some very key positions on both lines, right? And that's a big part of it. They have some really good young linemen. Obviously, Peter Woods, and I'm drawing a blank on the Maureen kid from Parker. Alabama that I like a lot. Morgan Parker. There you go. Uh, yeah. Those two guys hit. I mean, Peter Woods is, I mean, eight Notre Dame up in that game against the Irish last year. 
So I, I'm high on Clemson. I am. Not, are they going to be vintage 2016, 2018 Clemson? No, because they're not going to be as good a quarterback. But I think they're going to be a really good team next year. And it, But it all just depends on on Klubnik. And if Klubnik can be that, Ryan, then I think that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for Phil Moffa to just rip teams up because the way yeah. that they play offense is going to force you to have to spread the field out more than what you saw last year. And a very underrated player they have, and we talked about him going into the game last year, Ryan, is the tight end. Bring in he's a, yes, yeah. he's a good football yeah. player. And he started to break out a little bit late last year as well. Yeah, no, I like Mafa a lot. I think he's one of the more underrated running backs in college football coming back. I actually thought he might declare this year. With, with uh, he got all, he had a really nice strong finish to the season. It's yeah. a little bit of a weaker running back class in the 2024 NFL draft. Low mileage on his tires. I, if I was an advisor, I probably would have told him to jump to the NFL if that's something that he really wanted to do. But I mean, he yeah, comes got a big one with him coming yeah. back without question. Yeah, he had 84, 186, 96, 84, 89, and 71 in his last six games. Yeah. And and that was with Will Shipley also playing a lot. Shipley had 77, 126, 80, and 29 in his last four games. So they were splitting carries. He's going to get a, a much little bit a, a much bigger bulk of that this year than he did last year. And, right. and you know, obviously because he won't be he'll still be splitting carries because you can't just have one back all the time, but he, he's got a chance to be a good player. Yep. He does. We got PQ what it do says, what would your expectation be for the 2024 Notre Dame team if they played Florida's schedule? I have no idea what Florida's schedule is. Yeah, let's pull it up here real quick. It's very tough, Ryan. It is like it's okay. like the football gods are like, we don't like Billy Napier and we want him to get fired. So let's okay. give them this schedule. This is their schedule. It start I'll go chronologically. Home against okay. Miami, Samford, Texas AM, at mm-hmm. Mississippi State, mm-hmm. UCF. At Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia in Jacksonville, at Texas, home against LSU, home against Ole Miss, at Florida State. At, I I would I, I was just trying to roll it through my head of like if Notre Dame was in a position, I would say Notre Dame would be ten and two on that schedule, mm-hmm. maybe nine and three. Like it's a tough schedule, it's a very tough schedule. Yeah, I, I'd probably go I'd probably go ten and two, but it'd be tough, it'd be real tough. Yeah. Real tough. Florida's it's a not gonna brutal be, schedule. Florida's There's not gonna a, be very good this year, and Billy Napier is probably gonna be out after the year. So yep, yeah, a bit, maybe after in the, the middle year. of the season. Yeah. <laughs> after maybe. the year, we'll that'd be a minor victory if he can make yeah. it to the end of the year. That is an insane schedule, Ryan. Yeah. Absolutely insane schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, real quick note to Zach Nichols, who brought up the the EM book, um, Steve Angeli question. Zach, if you thought I was saying you were disrespecting EM book, I did not take it that way. I was saying I don't want to disrespect the EM book. That was that was what my comment was. So if you took it as me saying you were being disrespectful, I do apologize. That was not on my intent. Well, I was talking about I myself. Think so. Well, I, I think someone in the chat also said something about Ian Book disrespect, and I just don't okay, think that's gotcha, reason. gotcha. There's nothing, it, so. guys. Listen, we're adults here. Okay, yeah. Saying something about I don't think a player is good or does this is not disrespect. It's not hate. Be a grown up. It's an analysis of a football player. That's it. I don't hate Ian Book. I don't hate Steve Angeli. Neither does Ryan. OK, uh, yeah. we have our opinions about him as them as players, and that's all it is. It's not disrespect. OK, uh, and so, Zach, yeah, I didn't take your question as that either. Just so just so we're clear. Just wanted to make sure that he didn't that he didn't take it from that. I thought that that's was was the case. Sure. We had Brian Harrington, who says thoughts. Jadarian Price, leading rusher, Christian Gray, leader in interceptions, Thomas Harper. Uh, sorry. Jaden Thomas, leading receiver, and Steve Angeli, number two quarterback. So, Price leading rusher, Ryan, I think if you and I were to predict right yeah, now, I'm... we'd probably both go with Jeremiah Love. Yeah. Uh, but I, I've said this. I could see a scenario in which Jadarian Price actually leads the team in rushing, and Jeremiah Love leads the team in total yards of sure. passing and receiving combined. I think there's going to be situations this year where we see Jeremiah Love have a big game and we looked down at the end of the game, and he had 75 rushing yards. But he had 65 receiving yards and three total touchdowns. You know what I mean, Ryan? Like, I could see something like that. And then, yeah. you know, he rushes for 775 and has 450 yards receiving, and Jadarian rushes for 820 and has 150 yards receiving, right? Like, I could mm-hmm. see that happening. Uh, even though, as of today, I would probably pick J- Jadarian or uh, Jeremiah to lead the team in rushing, but I won't be shocked at all if, J- if Jadarian does. Right. But right. Uh, I will be surprised if Jeremiah doesn't lead the offense in total yards if, if as long as he's healthy. 
that would right. surprise me a bit. Yeah. It would. Um, go ahead. Thoughts, Ryan, on that one? Oh, no, I was going to move to Christian Gray because I yeah. agreed with the Jeremiah yeah. Love one. Um, yep. I would say I, I would not be shocked if Christian Gray was the leader in interceptions because I think that a lot of teams are going to look at Benjamin Morrison, what he's done in two years, and be like, I'm not going to throw at 20. So I'm going to throw at mm-hmm. 29 or 7 or whoever the heck's on the other side. So, or actually, I think Mickey, the Mickey changes number to two. Did I see that? I could be wrong about that one. No, he's still seven. seven. He's, he's still, still seven. seven. Okay. So, yeah, whoever whoever is the starting field corner, I wouldn't be shocked if they were the guy the teams, quote unquote, tried to pick on. And as they're trying to get uh, trying to pick on, they're going to get picked off occasionally, yeah. obviously, in those yeah. situations. The, the only question I would have is, does he play enough or is it going to be more of a rotation to your point? Because you've got two All-Americans coming back, basically, in the secondary yep. that you're going to want to avoid. You're going to want to avoid zero. You're going to avoid 20. And yep. you're going to say, OK, let's you got to pick on somebody. And you can't spend your whole game trying to go at the boundary safety. You know what I mean? There's only so many options you have to go at the boundary safety, Ryan. So it's like, okay, let's go at the let's go at the let's go at uh, number one, and let's go at number twenty nine. That's what you're right. going to do. That's Jordan Clark and and uh, Christian Gray. And then when number seven's in there, they're going to go at him too. So, uh, and to your point, I think that's going to give him chances to make a lot of plays. I I think you're going to if if Christian Gray is the guy at, at field, then I would feel very good about that. The only hesitation I have is, will they be more of a 50-50 split? And if that's the case, then I'd probably say I'd still probably go Xavier Watts. Hmm. He, he's not – I mean, it, do I, I don't think he's going to get seven picks again. I could see him getting like four and leading the team. And there's just a bunch awesome. of dudes with one, two, and three and things like that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But uh, I'll say this, Ryan. If Benjamin Morrison leads the team in interceptions and he has four or more, it means Christian Gray is going to be a future first-round draft pick. Because it's just like, well, we can't – I mean, because here, here's what I mean by that. If you're just like Christian Gray's a star, and so we're not – I mean, we can't avoid a, a great corner, so we're going to go to the boundary because that's where our best player is. And that's going to result in Benjamin getting more picks. I mean, that, that's sure. kind of how I look at it, right? And yep. um, I'll, I'll take my number two in the matchup against a corner that I'm not certain of. But if both the corners right. are dudes, I'm throwing to my dude. And my dude's right. most likely going to be the boundary, sure. is the way that I look at it. And then that would okay. result in Benjamin getting a lot of production. Like we had, we had a little bit of a wild card. Uh, Andrew Gilmore threw Jack Kaiser as the leading interceptor with his one interception in the last two years. So that would be a, quite a jump. Quite yeah. a jump. Very interesting. Uh, Jaden Thomas, leading receiver. If we're talking about catches, I could definitely see that. Yeah. Like I could see a scenario in which Jaden leads the team in, in in catches, and somebody else leads the team in yards. I could certainly see that. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. Ryan, I, I posted this yesterday in my receiver breakdown. Like, here's what Jaden Thomas did in every game that he was healthy. Now, with the exception of the NC State game, he did not play well against NC State, had a couple drops in that game, but that's not normal for Jaden. This is what Jaden Thomas did when he was healthy, and this is this is who he is. Four for 63 against Navy, four for 62 against Tennessee State, four for 63 against Central Michigan. Got hurt against Ohio State, only had five catches the rest of the year, goes to the bowl game, he's finally healthy, four for 59 in the touchdown. That's yeah. Jaden Thomas. Look at him last year, right? When he was, you know, you know, BYU, three for 74, uh, five for 66 against South Carolina. That's who Jaden Thomas is. He's not going to have a bunch of 120-yard games. He's going to be four or five catches every game, for 50 to 70 yards every game. And at the mm-hmm. end of the day, Chris Mitchell may have more yards. Jane Greenhouse may have more yards, but I could certainly see him averaging five catches a game and having, or, you know, four to five catches a game, having 50, 60 catches at the end of the year for 650 yards and leading the team in catches. And then two right. guys have more yards. I could certainly see that. Certainly could see that. Um, I think people are, I think people are sleeping on Jaden a little bit, man, because yep. of obviously the injury during the season. But I mean, to your point, every time he's been healthy the last year and a half, like he's been a guy that Notre Dame has featured in their offense. You so, can count on. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would be I would be surprised if he wasn't a productive player if healthy yeah. in 2020. But that's the thing though, Ryan, is he's gotta stay yeah. healthy. He hasn't been able to stay healthy in his career so far. That's gonna be the big key for him. It's the big key for Deion Colsey. It's it's that's gonna be a big part of this receiving core production because if you have Jaden Thomas in the middle of that stretch post Ohio State, I think things would look because you you look for example the Louisville game, you're not throwing yeah. that goal ball to 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 uh, Rico Flores. You're probably throwing it to Jaden. He may not catch it, but I feel pretty comfortable. It's not getting picked. That's the difference, right? 
having that that dependable four catch 60 yard guy is huge for a quarterback especially when you also have Mitchell Evans yep. and then that takes some of the pressure off Chris Tyree it takes some of the pressure off Tobias Merriweather and Jane Greathouse those other guys and that's the other piece of it if Jaden doesn't go down Jaden Thomas is go down Jaden Greathouse never moves to the boundary sure and his game only gets better and better and better and better so losing him was very impactful last year and mm-hmm. He's just not sexy as a player. I mean, his the way he plays the game is just not – it's not sexy. And so he's never going to get the credit, but he's just going to look – he's just that guy, right? And you watch, like, oh, did you see that pit play Chris Mitchell made? And did you see that play that one-handed catch Chris Mitchell Evans had? Did you see that Jaden Greathouse torching that doing a touchdown? And then you look down and Jaden Thomas has five catches for 66 yards. You don't right. can't remember a single one of them, but they were all mattered. That's the kind of guy he is. And Jelly, number two QB. I mean, I could see it. I'm not going to write Steve off on that. If I had to predict today, I'd, if, if the decision was made today, he's the number two quarterback. I just don't think it's yeah. going to be that way by the time we get the season. But I'm I, not going to say it's, oh, no way. No way it's going to happen. I, I'd say Angeli has the inside track, but we'll see if that is if someone overtakes him at some point. All right, we got Mark one. I'm in Las Vegas. The odds makers I've talked to are high on Notre Dame. One team surprised me is UNLV. Any thoughts? New coach did really good. Barry Odom, right? Is their coach, mm-hmm. Yeah, old Missouri coach. Yep. And then I, they've got uh, Brennan Marion's their OC, I believe, right? Yeah. Receivers he did a coach good jo- Pitt in Texas. He did a good job with them last year. I, I need to get a little bit more up to date on what their roster. I know they got – who's the quarterback? Oh, they got, they got the quarterback from Holy Cross, whose name's escaping. Oh, yeah, you like that he's kid, a, right? If I remember Matt correctly. Sluka? Yeah, it's a dual threat yeah. kid. He's very, he's very talented. Matthew Sluka, I mean, he was a dude on the FCS level. Now he's making a jump, but he's only jumping to a G5 team. It's not like right. he's going to a Power 5 team. So I think that – that jump will be good. He's a very, he's a different player than Jaden Mayava that they had last year. Mayava was a decent athlete, not a special though. Sluka is a legit like we're gonna run you type of dude at quarterback. Yeah. So I, I I think that UNLV is a, a ascending program on the G five level. I think that they showed a lot of signs last year. They also got Ricky White back at wide receiver, who's an absolute stud as a receiver, one of the best returning in college football. So I think Barry Odom has that team going in a re- in a good direction and. It's a great place to see, right? Because they are in a little bit of a like Nevada, Las Vegas, and just Nevada in general is a little bit of a weird football place, right? Because it's like Bishop Gorman and then a big drop off to a lot of the other programs. But if you're able to get a couple of those Bishop Gorman kids, not the high ranked kids, like you're not going to get Derek Meadows to stay home in Vegas, right? But if you're mm-hmm. able to get like the second tier guys that are more yeah. like three star level players to be able to stay and, and grow at UNLV. I think they got some, some yeah. talented work. And they can certainly get Cali kids, the same kind yeah. those type of kids from Cali as well. Ryan, just to back up your point last two years, yeah. Matt Saluka passed for 2,491 yards and 1,723 yards uh, passed for 26 and 20 touchdowns, four and five picks. Uh, the last two years he rushed for 1,234 yards, 11 touchdowns, and then 1,243 yards and nine touchdowns, over six yards of carry. He's got uh, – let's see, that's 24. He's got over 3,000 career rushing yards the, for the Holy best, Cross. Yeah. The, 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 so South Dakota State has been running FCS football the last two years, but their biggest headache was two years ago in the playoffs. They played against Holy Cross – and at one point in the third quarter, I think late in the third quarter, Holy Cross was beating South Dakota State because of Matthew Sluka. They he was just I think he had like over 200 yards rushing in that game. Like he was just a man amongst boys yeah. against the best FCS team in college football. It was tied 21-21 going to the fourth quarter. And they, yep. they ran away within the fourth quarter. To your yep. point, Ryan. It was 21-21. Yep. Uh first score of the game was Matt Sluka on a 56-yard run. To your, oh, he was to your a dude point. in that game. He was a dude so, in that game. Yeah. Um and as you said, they 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 dominated that. You know, he had uh, 125 passing yards, no touchdowns, one pick, went 12 of 26 in that game. Mm-hmm. But he ran 26 times for 213 yards and a touchdown. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a little different deal. Pretty good player. Pretty good. Player. A little different deal. Yeah, not, not bad at all. Not bad at all. No. All right, we got let's get some more here. Here we go. Michael Johnson says, "Do you see an issue with Riley Leonard in the wide receivers learning the playbook and being on the same page by Texas A&M?" Not compared to any other first, like a transfer quarterback yeah. coming in. I mean, it's the same. It'll be fine. It's the same intricacies that go into developing that, and they have several months to figure it out. So I think they'll be right. okay. I'm not worried about it, Michael. I mean, it, it'd be one thing if he was a uh, you know, post spring transfer, uh, but yep. having all all winter, or if he was going to, let's say, Ryan, he missed the spring, like people said he was going to, and wasn't going to practice this spring. Uh, he hasn't missed anything. 
Um, no, I'm not worried about it. I'm not. But the, the, look, are they going to be as sharp in game one as they will be in game 12? No. But Texas A&M's learning a new offense as well. You know, and they're going to have some new guys as well. The quarterback is back, but he's a he's a he's learning a new offense. So I, I'm I, I don't think his game one is going to be different than anybody else with a new starter. Much less, not even just transfer new starter from another school run, but just anyone who's got a first year starter is going yep. to be that. And and Connor Wegman's got like what eight or nine career starts under his belt. I love that kid, but he's got to stay healthy. He's and he healthy. missed a lot of chances last year to develop as a player. Um, you know, so no, I I. I they're not going to have any more issues than AM is going to have, but they will, they will get better and better as the year goes on. I do fully expect that, but uh, yep. right. I mean, I, I don't think people realize how much, how much throwing gets done between January and the end of July mm-hmm. at these levels with quarterbacks and receivers. I mean, if, if you're not on, if you're not caught up and kind of figured it out by fall camp, it means you're just not working. I mean, these yep. kids are going to throw thousands of balls to each other. They 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 are. Mm-hmm. And Tommy Gunn says, Coach D, based on your one practice snippet, rank the quarterbacks in following. So we'll go one by one here. Uh, rank them in footwork from what you saw. Steve Angeli. Number one? Mm-hmm. Okay. He's just the are most you, clean I, from what I saw as far as footwork. He was just the most I think, clean. I, I, I think he's asking you to rank the four quarterbacks. Oh, okay. Like, Steve Angeli, yeah. CJ Carr, Kenny Minchie, Riley Leonard. Okay. Arm angle. Well, it depends on how you mean that. Are you looking for someone who's more traditional or someone who could adjust? I'll just go I, I, I think, adjust. I, I think he's saying adjust, yeah. So I'll go Kenny Minchie, Riley Leonard, CJ Carr, Steve Angeli. Okay. Post-snap read. I Impossible to tell. that We didn't see yeah. enough of them having to do that. Uh, but, um, I mean, best I can give you on that would be um, – CJ, Riley, Kenny, Steve. Okay. And feel within the pockets in a non padded practice. Uh, Steve, yeah, with where quarterbacks can't get re- wear red jerseys. Uh, Steve and, and Jelly one, uh, Riley two, Kenny three, CJ four. Okay. In one practice. So, there we go. and, and, and I would hear that everyone, and then immediately dismiss it because it's one practice that means nothing. So good question. But good I question, did want to respect Tommy's question. It's just a fun question. It's good. Nerd. It's it's fun to hear from one practice, but it's not something to put any stock into as far as it meaning anything long term. If it's where it means something, Ryan, is if you start to see it week after week after week. That's where you start to see it. Um, question for you, Ryan. This is a follow up to what we were discussing earlier with Kirk Cousins. Andrew Gilmore asked, "Why would the Falcons do that? They pick Morris over Belichick and Cousins over trading for Fields. They have to be the dumbest organization this off season." What say you, Mister? Um, I really was never in on the Belichick to the Falcons thing. I, I, I know I'm going to sound like a hater on this, but I think Bill Belichick's a pretty overrated coach. To be honest, I really think he is. When you look at his record without Brady historically. It's not great, guys. Like he just hasn't been that guy with with Brady. Am I saying he's a bad coach? No, I think I think Bill Belichick's still a very good coach. But I always push back on the greatest of all time conversation, though, because I just think that he was in the right situation with the right quarterback, and when he hasn't had the right quarterback, he's not been the greatest head coach of all time, right? So I wasn't pushed. I, but that also to say, Andrew is although I wasn't a big Bill Belichick guy for Atlanta, I also was not a big Raheem Morris guy for Atlanta either. I, either way, I, I didn't think that was a great hire, regardless. The Cousins Fields thing, one. I'll start with the Fields side of it. Fields, you would have had to give up a draft pick, and and I, I you would have had to go a draft pick. What that draft pick would have been was, you know, obviously a question mark. I, I don't know exactly what it would have been for Fields. Maybe we'll still find that out. I'm sure we probably will still find that out. But then you would have also had to pay Fields, and while it wouldn't have been four years for eighty, a hundred mil, one hundred eighty million that you gave Kirk Cousins. It still would have been starting quarterback money in the NFL for a guy that's less proven. So I would not have done it. I think that it's going to get you in quarterback purgatory, but they viewed Kirk Cousins as a better option at quarterback than Justin Fields. And if I'm being honest, he is a better option at quarterback than Justin Fields. Is it worth 180? No. Is it better than Justin Fields, though, as a quarterback? Yeah, I would say it is. So, yeah. Yeah, because basically, Ryan, it's, it comes down to with, with Kirk Cousins, you just have to pay him money. Right. With Justin Fields, you're going to have to give up draft, draft picks. Right. right, right, right. 
And I mean, then could, maybe could you I, trade I, I for Fields and it works out? But that's quite a gamble if you're the Falcons, right. man. It's quite a gamble. Yeah, I, I would have said I would have said that he would have got you know maybe Justin Fields get what closer to what Baker got in in, in with this recent deal, like maybe three years, almost a hundred million dollars. I mean, either way, you're still putting a lot of money into him, right? So yeah, yeah. I think Atlanta's in a bad spot, though. I think they're in a bad spot yeah. moving forward. I, I I don't love it. I don't love it because for me, like Kirk Cousins is a is a player that. If you're a team that is literally just a serviceable, solid quarterback away from winning a Super Bowl, then you go Kirk Cousins. Sure. But Atlanta? What? What yeah. are we doing there, guys? Yeah. I don't get that. Like, I understand the notion of, hey, we're going to bring in a veteran to help stabilize things until we can find the quarterback of the future, but that's a whole lot of freaking money for a guy to do that. You know what I mean? Right. Like, that's right. Yeah. All right, and we got Andy Milton fan with a super chat. Thank you so much, sir. This is which 23 teams surprise you most good and bad? 23 teams? What? Meaning like which teams from 2023? Which uh, team surprised most good I thought it was going to be 23 teams yeah. for the 2024 no. season. Like, I, I, I didn't take right. – maybe that's what he meant, but I, I took it as like which yeah, – um, you're, usually you're, you're right. the one that reads these right. better than I do, so I'm glad. You're that probably right on this a, one, I think. Got a you're W right on that one, one Ryan. Um, Team that surprised me from a positive standpoint, I did not see Missouri breaking out the way that they did this season. No, I didn't no. see that coming. And then the other one would be like like Arizona going ten and three. That didn't shock me a ton. I mean, they showed a lot of promise the year before. Their schedule wasn't set up to where ten and three was going to be a super super surprise. Missouri going eleven and two in the SEC, I did not see coming. Uh, right. I, I I really didn't, especially with some of the personnel losses they had. So that was. That was a very big surprise for me. And another team that I just was shocked how good they were this year was Oklahoma State. And and not even just shocked at how good they were all year, but like this is a team that won 10 games that got beat by 23 by South Alabama at home in September. You know what I mean? Carter, like Carter Bradley, a quarterback, Gus Bradley's son. Like, so there you go. I did not see that coming. Um, teams that were uh, that were uh, surprised me most. I knew that TCU was going to take a step back. Yeah. I did not think they were going to be that bad. Right. To be honest with you, I, I did not see I, that one coming. I, right. I felt the same about USC. I know they had a little bit of a collapse at the end, but I did yeah. not predict them to go seven and five at the end yeah. of the year. Yeah. I they thought were. they'd take a step bad. back and at worst be eight, at worst be eight and four. Like, and that would have been a disappointing season. But yeah, USC is another one. But TCU was bad last year like AM not being as good as people thought they should never have been ranked in the preseason top 25 i'm not shocked at all that AM season went the way that it did yeah. um i'll tell you another team that i that i thought took a really big step back that i'm not sure how i feel about it whether i really am surprised by it or not but it was still kind of stunning um to me was was south carolina like it was a team like part of me is like yeah is expected because they lost so much but Brian, they just weren't competitive a lot. And that's the thing that kind of surprised me is they just they lost a lot of games where they just got their butts kicked. Right. And um, you know, it just I mean, their four their five wins last year were over Furman, Mississippi State at home, Jacksonville State, Vanderbilt, and Kentucky at home. You know, like they just that surprised me a little bit that they were as bad as they were. Their record was five and seven. It's not a huge difference, but that was a team that I thought would at least kind of somewhat stay level. And then yeah. now I got to listen to draft people tell me how great Spencer Rattler is. So that's always fun. He, he was better than he was the year before. There's no doubt mm -hmm. about that, but yeah, it wasn't great. Well, South Carolina's he, win by NIL, die by NIL is the best yeah. way that I would phrase South Carolina because they keep losing yeah. guys to NIL too, which is hilarious. Absolutely hilarious, yeah. but. Yeah. yeah, Rutgers, I think, was a little bit of a surprise, man. First winning season under Greg Schiano in the Big Ten. Like, that was a nice little surprise It was in a good way. I thought they mm -hmm. surprised. Uh, yeah, that was a surprising one. You know what? It's a, here's a deep one for you. Deep one. I did not expect New Mexico State to win double-digit games in 2023. Yeah. That Jerry killed awesome. it a great job. He really did. We were talking yeah. about one earlier, UNLV. I mean, I remember watching them play last year, Ryan, and they started off like 4-1, yeah. and one, and then they just collapsed or terrible the rest of the year. And mm -hmm. they came out this year, and they – Pretty good football team. So, yeah, I mean, when was the last time you thought New Mexico State? That's a good job. That's a good job there that they did. Yeah. Been, been a minute. It's Bob Davey. Oh, no, that was yeah. New Mexico. Sorry. No, he was in New Mexico, was yeah. Yeah, it was a little like, my bad. Yeah, it was a heck of a job. I mean, even the even the loss to Liberty, Ryan, in the, the championship game was competitive. I mean, they battled yeah. that game. Well, so. they, they were actually they were actually playing them really tough until the uh, yeah. quarterback, Diego Pavia, got hurt in that game. Yeah. But, yeah. 
Nope. Nice job by pop. Jerry Kill. Yes. Lucky Ducks 512. In 10 years, which school who joined a new conference this year will look ba- back and regret their decision and which will be happy they moved? Oh man. Uh, okay. The one the the happy they moved. Uh, I feel teams that'll be happy that they moved. The one that I think, um, boy, that's a good one. Teams that, I mean, who's going to be happy they moved? So you have Texas moved, Oklahoma moved, USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon. I think the team that'll probably look back and be happy is Oregon. Because I think Oregon can compete in the Big Ten if they continue to play the way that they're playing now. And the Pac-12 died. So Yeah, yeah. (laughs) yeah. But like... They it died because they all left. Is right. kind of is kind of what like boy we should have stayed and done this. Uh, but Oregon to me is the one team that that I feel they can compete athletically with the top teams in the Big Ten when they're when they're going right. They play yeah. a style of football that I think can compete. I mean they beat Ohio State at Ohio State like two years ago, right? You know three years ago, right? Um, and it's going to bring them recognition that they struggled to get really nationally by playing in some of those big games. The team that's the teams are going to look back and regret it. Washington is going to hate this decision. They're going to look back and really hate this decision. And yeah. I, honestly, I think USC is going to look back and hate this decision because yeah, they're going to get some money, but mm-hmm. I don't know that this is a move that made a lot of sense for USC. And then the I just other wonder team where is, they would have went though. Like where would USC well, have gone? What I'm saying is like go? they're the reason the Pac-12 died. If they would have stayed in the Pac-12, the Pac-12 doesn't die. Don't you think it's it happens eventually, though? It feels like the writing was on the no, wall that Pac-12 is well, dying. It, in the current landscape, yeah, right, I get that. But I, I still think if the powers would have stayed, mm-hmm. you know, like it wasn't that long ago that the Pac-12 was the one trying to do what the SEC is doing now. They were the ones trying to poach Texas and things like that. They were run poorly. You know, maybe that someone could have come in and, and said, hey, let, we're going to fire this guy and we're going to give this one more shot. Um so, yeah. I, but I'm not, I'm not sure trying to argue that point. I'm saying like, I think that, that they're going to look back and say, this move was not good for us. It, it, it did not work for us the way that we intended. I also mm-hmm. feel that way about Oklahoma. I think Texas is going to be fine. As long as yeah, Sarkeesian stays, they're going to be fine. I think Oklahoma is going to look back at this and say, we shouldn't have been Texas. We shouldn't have acted like Texas's little brother. We yeah. should have stayed in the Big 12 because the Big 12 is in a much healthier position to the point you're making about the Big Pac-12, right? Big 12 is in a much healthier position than the Pac-12 is in. They yeah. have a more solid contract. There's some other benefits to it. I think instead of you know following Texas around like a whip puppy, they're going to look back and be like, dude, we should have stayed in the Big 12 and dominated and mm-hmm. you know tr- tried to do what we can to build the, the league up. I think they're going to really regret going to the SEC. In my Oklahoma is also a team that's built off of being spread out and not great on the line of scrimmage for the most part. And now you're going in, into SEC country and playing against SEC teams each week where you're going to look at these defensive lines yeah. on a week to week basis and be like, oh, buddy. Yep. It's not great. Yeah. I, I think Oklahoma near future, especially, is going to be like, oh, that probably wasn't yep. the best because they, they were getting a little bit of momentum in year two under Venables. Mm-hmm. They didn't finish strong, but like you still built it a little bit. And now you're probably going to go what? Seven and five, yeah. eight and four. Yeah. Like, I don't think they're going to be a great team. And for year one, I think Colorado is going to really like the move to the Big 12. They should have never left that league to yep. begin with. Yeah, um, it, fits them all. it does. It does. And with the way that the Big 12 looks now, it's a much more manageable conference for them to be competitive in than it was before. Right. I think Utah um, and the Big 12 is a good one, too. I, I like yep. their fit in the Big their 12. Their style of play, I think, is, is going to fit really well. Uh, yeah. With if if that league gets good again, I, you know, I think when the league collapsed, I think Arkansas and Arkansas State found a very good landing spots. So I think that's going to be good for them to be in the Big Twelve, yep. uh, and then of course SMU gets to be in a Power Five league. I think they're going to like that, in my opinion. I, I, think, I, really, I really like where SMU is going, man. I think Rhett Lashley's done yeah. a really good job with that program. Yeah. I like what they're and they have money. I mean, they have so much money that they're willing to say, "We'll take not getting paid for the first few years." That's how yep. that's how much money's flown into that program. So uh, I think this is going to be good for SMU if they can keep him. That's the key, yep. Ryan. Keep him because they've had two, they've made two really good hires in a row at SMU. Yep. Mm-hmm. And if they can keep this one around for a while longer, but but going to the Power Five gives you now some more resources to to maybe do that, right? To keep him around a little bit while longer. And, and now they can buy gold Trans Ams and not say anything about it. No one can say anything about it's it. Legal. So that's good. That's it's legal up. now. What's up, man? 
pony excess is accepted nowadays. It's encouraged, yes. in, in fact. Yep. Andrew Burke says to give Notre Dame the best chance to win a national championship, construct their roster by choosing Notre Dame's best position groups of the last 24 years. Oh, gosh. I.e. 2017's offensive line, 2012's defensive line, 2015's wide receiver, et cetera. Wow. Oh, uh, I am not taking 25 wide receiver core. No way. No way. I'm give me 2008, uh, 2009 mean, mean yeah, receiver. I'm not taking the tw- Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not taking 2015 no. receiver core. Uh, I'm taking 09 receiving core. I'm give me Golden Tate and Michael Floyd every day of the week as my one two sure. punch uh, right now. There's uh, sure. no doubt about that, Ryan. A uh, quarterback. So we're going 2000 from 2000. Yeah. Uh, construct my roster. Okay. 05. Yeah. Quarterback. quarterback yep. Brady Quinn 05. Yep. Uh, running back room. Boy, there's been some good ones. Uh, am I allowed to say I'll take the one they're about to have? Can I do that, it's Ryan? Possible. I, I was I was going to ask if injuries are off too, because then I'll take twenty fifteen if I could take injuries off. But yeah, let's say let's say how it played out that season. Because twenty fifteen, if Torian's you're talking about if Torian's healthy and CJ do, yeah, doesn't Torian go does down late hurt. in the year, yeah, yeah, that could have been really. And now Josh Adams is your number three. Yeah. That'd have been really good. That'd have been yeah, a that, really that, good. That'd three. probably be my answer. I, I do like the mystery box possibility of twenty twenty four, but I will take twenty fifteen if healthy. I'm going to go 2024. You know, another sneaky good one, Ryan, was 2011 with Sierra Wood and Jonas Gray. was yeah, a was sneaky, good, yeah. sneaky good running back room. Mm-hmm. Uh, wide receiver room, I'm going 2009 wide yep. receiver room. Mm-hmm. I don't even care who their number three is. David Grimes, whatever. Uh, give me Golden Tate and Michael Floyd, and I'm a happy dude with, sure. that, with that group. Um, yep. Even with the injury to Michael Floyd, mm-hmm. I mean, you take it because of 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 how they how it's still it it still ended up panning out. I say right. 2015 probably is my runner up for that one, Ryan. Uh, mm-hmm. Tight end room. This is an interesting one. Uh, I'd probably go 2011. Tyler Eifert was a monster. 60 plus catches, 800 plus yards. Um, that was a pretty good. That was a pretty good tight if, end. Room. If you could turn the injuries off, then the year before that you had Kyle Rudolph and Tyler Eifert, yeah. right? If you wanted them, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you had Mike Ragone. It's talking yeah. about like injuries. Like, what could Mike Ragone yeah. have been if he doesn't tear his knee up? He, I liked him a lot coming out Cher- of school. Cherry Hole, New Jersey. Yeah, Mike Ragone, yeah, yeah. That would have been a really good room. And if they would have used it correctly, 2019 and 2020 tight end rooms were pretty flipping good too. Either one. You mm-hmm. had uh, Cole Komet. Brock Wright, Tommy Trumbull in 2019, and then you had Michael Mayer, Tommy Trumbull, and Brock Wright in 2020. Those are pretty mm-hmm. good tight end rooms as well, if you'd have used yeah. them correctly. You the, do the um, Fasano John Carlson back in the day too, 2005, yeah. right? The 2012 tight end room wasn't bad either with Eifert, and uh, uh, that was when Troy Nicholas kind of emerged as a really good number yeah. two blocker kind of guy. You had Ben Koyak. Mm-hmm. So they've had some really good tight end rooms uh, over the years, Ryan. I'm going to go 2011 yeah. just because I want that version of of Tyler Eifert. Plus, that version sure. of Tyler Eifert can get me through the four or five games where Michael Floyd was out right before he came back. Uh, mm-hmm. Offensive line, that's about as easy as it gets, Ryan. 2017 for me. As good as 2015 yep. was, 2017 was just better in my 2017 opinion. 2017 was great. Yep. D-line. This is an interesting – so from 2000 to now, uh-huh. it, it's kind of easy for me to pick my top two. But I'm gonna go with um, I'm gonna go with uh, 2018. 2012 is my runner up. That was pretty good. Yeah, I go 2018. 2018 now, is good. If yeah, we're gonna say good. just talent, Actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go 2012. If I'm playing a three man front, I'll take, okay. I'll take 2012 all day. <laughs> if we're gonna say just talent and not how they actually played, yeah, the most talented room they ever had, in my opinion, was the 2011 room. With, with Aaron with Lynch Aaron and Lynch. Stephon Tuitt yeah. and Darius Fleming, and you had Lewis Nix on that team. I mean, that that mm-hmm. was a Capron Lewis Moore. That was a really talented group. Uh, yeah. Linebackers, if they would have used it correctly, it'd be 2015, but they didn't use it correctly. Yeah. Should have been yeah. Niles. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go 20. Um, I'm gonna go 20. Man, it's to me, it's between 17 and 18. 17, you had the three-man duo inside with with Greer, Niles, and Tavon, and you had Drew at Rover. Mm-hmm. 2018 was the best pure inside, but you didn't really have a Rover that year. 
So that's why I'm torn. Like the best one, but so if I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go nickel. I'm gonna play, I'm gonna go nickel here, and I'm gonna take the 2018 linebacking core, Drew and Tavon. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. if I had to go four three, I'm taking 2017. Is that fair? Now, Manti and Jalen were great, but they were never around surround the best rooms, right? Mm-hmm. Like Manti was great, but I I don't want Dan Fox and Carlo Calabrese and all that kind of stuff. Um right. Yeah, 2015 with Jalen. If I had Niles and you know, could you know Greer and some of those guys, if they were used correctly, but I don't want Joe Schmidt as my start middle linebacker. Um, so I'm gonna go 18 in a 4-2-5, 17 in a 4-3-5. Okay. Cornerback room. Last year. It's last year and 2018 are the two co- two contenders. Last year's I think was better. I'm a I'm a I'll man guy. Year. I like playing man. I agree with you. And yep. then safety safety room. This is an interesting one, Ryan. I'm gonna probably go. Gil- Gilman and Elliott. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm Kyle Hamilton. Go, I knew I Kyle Hamilton go, too. That's, so. that's was, yeah. that was that was the question: is do you go 18 or 19? And I'm going to go 19 with those two starters plus Jalen Kyle or plus Hamilton. Kyle Hamilton. Yeah, I'm going to go 20. Yeah. Now that means I'm turning down a group that had, you know, Jamor Slaughter and Zeke Mod and this cat named Harrison Smith from 2011. I just think that's this the last. I think last the 19 room was just all around yeah. better. Yeah, you had, of, you had the number you had the number fourteen overall pick yeah. in the draft, and well, best safety in the NFL as a third stringer. I mean, as a backup the, at that point. The only so, thing yeah. I'd say is in nineteen he wasn't the fourteenth overall pick in the draft, but he's still really good. You can see it though. Like you can like see my, it. Well, can my, see oh it. no, no, I'm not taking that away. Like he was <laughs> he was not as good in nineteen as as Harrison Smith was in twenty eleven, but the other sure. parts around Harrison weren't as good as what was around Kyle. Alohi and Jalen right. were really good college safety tandem. Sure. And to your point, I mean, Alohi's that's two starting NFL safeties in one backfield, mm-hmm. correct? Because yeah. Alohi became a starter for the Chargers this year, right? Then I yeah, said because of the injury, like the but he, he yeah. played well. He played well. Played well. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. And then, um, so yeah, so 05 quarterback room for me, 2024 running back room. Ryan, you went 15, correct? Mm-hmm. 09 receiving core. Did you agree with me on that or did you go 15? Yeah, I went 09. 09. Okay. Yep. Uh, 2011 tight end room. Where'd you go that one? I went 2011. That was my pick. Okay. I think. Yeah. 17 O line easy. Uh, I went yep. 18 O D line. You went 2012 because you were going to play three down. Yes. Yep. Um, and then uh, 2018 linebacking core. Did you go with 18 or did you go with a different? I'm, I'm gonna go with 2015 because I can mix and match my my linebacker core the way I want if I'm okay. the coach, right? So yeah, I can dig that. I can dig yep. that. Uh, 23 cornerback room with 2018 yep. runner up and then 2019 safeties. That would Correct. be ours. Yeah. That was fun. That was fun. That's a good one, Andrew. I like that one. That was fun. All right. Mark McGlass says, what's more legendary, Kenny Minchie's arm strength or Braden Lindsay's speed? Oh, Braden Lindsay's speed. You could run. Yeah, because I don't know that I've ever said Kenny Minchie's arm strength is legendary. I, I don't have never made that point. His arm speed, maybe, and arm talent, perhaps. But I mean, Braden Lindsay speed certainly, because yeah. he uses the word legendary in quotations as if like you know talked about it but never saw it. And Braden in two t- late in twenty eighteen and late in twenty twenty two, we got a chance to finally see them use Braden the way he should have been used uh, during his career, and he was impressive. I was so happy to see him end his career the way that he did against mm-hmm. South Carolina. It's like, dude, this is what they should have been doing all year or last two years with him, and they just didn't. All right, we got Andrew Gilmore with a question. Is playing some teams this year who were down last year, who will be the most improved? I'm betting that it will be Stanford. I think their coach is good. I actually do like their coach, Troy Taylor, as well. I believe that he is a good coach. They'll be better this year than they were last year. Last year, they were terrible. They were a very bad team, but they're bringing in a pretty good recruiting class. I think that Troy Taylor is a good coach, and I think that they will be developed better, no doubt about it. I would agree there. I think Stanford's still a, a year away from the improvements manifesting in a jump in wins, Ryan. I, I think the team yep. that I think is going to be most improved from last year is going to be Texas A&M. The difference is, is Troy Taylor, I, I agree, he's a heck of a coach, Ryan. You've been talking about him since he was first hired. And, and right. as I studied, I'm like, yeah, this guy did a great job. The difference is Mike Elko is a very good head coach as well. Much, much shorter tenure, but he inherits a much better roster. Access to talent. Yeah. Access yeah. To talent. I yep. mean, you know, so, um, and he's in a quarterback situation is better as long as Wegman can stay healthy. So yep. I'm, I'm going to go A&M is going to be the most improved. 
you know, I think Purdue's going to be a little better this year, but not by a ton. I like Walters, I'm wor- but I'm worried just the roster's not great. Yeah, they, they got poached a little bit this offseason, yeah. too, man. They lost the end, scouts and their wide receiver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Stanford, I think, will be better, but I don't yep. know that it's necessarily going to manifest itself with an, an incredibly better record, maybe a game or two. Yep. I think Georgia Tech could be a lot better and it not really look much different wins losses record for the reasons we discussed above. Uh, some other teams that were down USC. I don't know. I, I, you know, I would expect them to be, I actually think they're going to be better this year, right? I think they have better I coaching do. on defense. I, I think, yeah. I think, I think Lincoln Riley put too much on Caleb Williams and didn't trust <laughs> other parts of the team enough. And he's going to be forced to, to trust them more this year. So I, like I think USC is going to be a too, lot man. better too. Yeah. I like the running. I think the running back that they got, the Marks kid from Mississippi State in a mm-hmm. USC offense, is a perfect fit. Like I don't, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't really love Marshawn Lloyd in that offense. I didn't think that one made a ton of sense. Yeah. I think Jaquavius Marks makes a lot of sense in the USC yeah. offense. A lot of sense. I think they'll be better as well. Yeah. Uh, I could see them being in that conversation as well. Those are the ones that I would most. I don't think Virginia is going to be much better than they were last year. I don't. I don't think Navy is going to be a lot better. I'm trying to think of some other teams. I, um, I love watching the Virginia quarterback that was a freshman last year because he was just absolute chaos. It's a gamer. So funny, dude. Yeah. So fun. Uh, Beef Eater ND08 says, did I be do a broadcast of the Blue Gold game last year and announce a commitment? Um, no. That was I don't believe before, so. Right? How much yeah, I love. With, with, well, we, we did the Brandon jo- Davis Swain where we talked about the fact he did commit, we didn't announce a commitment. Um, mm-hmm. The Jeremiah Love thing that we did, if that's what you're referring to, was during the regular season for the stamp the week the day of the Stanford game in 2022. But like I re- I remember we talked about Brandon Davis Swain committing after the spring game, right? But like, still yeah, weird. I think it happened like during the sh- didn't it happen like during the show? If I remember correctly, like he surprisingly committed. Like we didn't know he's going to commit, and then he just. I always say when kids like surprise like CJ May. I was not expecting him to commit during Ohio State game. You know, D- Brandon Davis Wayne, I was not expecting him to commit. A lot of times those kids that kind of surprise commit, if you look back, Ryan, they end up not in the class. Right. And uh yeah. So a little Brandon Davis Wayne was there. an in- interesting character, Brandon Davis Swain. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Jesse Ferguson, interesting to hear people speculate that Jay Harrison, uh, Jane Harrison could make an impact on wide receiver considering his modest production against Sunbelt competition. Do you think Marshall's scheme quarterback play was a factor? Quarterback play was awful, guys, like awful. Do I expect Jaden Harrison to come in and lead Notre Dame in receiving? No, but I will say this. I watched some of his film at Marshall, and I actually thought he was pretty good, pretty good wide receiver. Like, I would not be shocked if Jaden Harrison gets some reps in Notre Dame's offense, and maybe you get him a little bit of a gadget role at times. Like, I think he can get the ball in his hand a little bit. I'm not, so I'm not predicting him to be a, mainstay in the wide receiver room as far as being a, a, a high volume guy by any means, but I think he could be a quality depth receiver in Notre Dame's room. And I actually thought that the offense, not off, I would say the offense necessarily hindered him. I would say that the quarterback play really hindered him at Marshall because their quarterback play was very bad. It was not good. I have no idea what you're talking about, Ryan. I think 12 touchdowns and 18 interceptions is very good quarterback play. I think that's wonderful quarterback. The, the kid, had, hit, the kid that mainly played at the end of the season. I don't know if he was starting to begin number fourteen. He entered the transfer portal too, and he was pretty bad. Cam Fancher, yeah, yeah, he Fancher. entered the portal. Yeah. He had eleven picks, eleven touchdowns. Cole Pennington, Kate, uh, Chad Pennington's son, I think, had no yeah. touchdowns and six picks. Yeah, uh, I'm obviously being sarcastic. They averaged six point nine yards per attempt through twelve touchdown passes and eighteen picks. So yeah, yeah, they're bad. The yeah. offense had a role. I look, I don't think he's a natural receiver in that, like he's an elite route runner. And I mean, he's got some things to learn, but if you can't do something with that speed, then I just don't, what are we doing here? You yeah. know, so will his production look a whole lot different? No. Um, would he have been a much more productive in a better system? Of course. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kyron Lacey was never super productive before he transferred to LSU, and, and people are expecting him to have a breakout year this year because. So, I mean, in, in some ways, Ryan, you are somewhat a product of your system, good or bad, you know, I, in some, I heard in, the, to some uh, degree. 
So L- LSU likes the Lacey kid, but I've heard the kid that buys stock into in the LSU room is the uh, Lacey. I mean, not the Lacey kid, the uh, Chris Hilton kid, number seven. Chris Hilton, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, he was like a seven foot high jumper, and he's like uncoverable for them in spring okay. so far. So yeah. now, is that because he's that good, or their DBs suck that bad? Because well, they also, also believe that their DBs stink. I think. Yeah. I think they <laughs> also believe that. But you know, seven foot high yeah. jump that 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 translates. Yeah. That, that plays. Yeah. That plays. Oh, no that. doubt, no doubt, yeah. no doubt. <laughs> Adam B said, since football is the ultimate team sport, a team is only as good as its weakest link. Who do you see as the 11th best defensive starter or position going into spring? It's the the safety opposite Benjamin uh, Xavier Watts as of right yeah, now. Has to, would be I think mine. it has to be that. Yeah, I think it has to be yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. If it's not that, it's, it might be Viper. Honestly, the way it played last year. And, yeah, but and I mean, at least Viper. Be at least Viper, we've seen something of who's going to play Viper, right? Yeah. We haven't seen what the other safety looks like at yeah. all. So, yeah. Yeah, and and the guy you think we think might start is not even on campus right now, and right. is tra- transitioning to a new position. So, yep, that would be mine. Yep. Sean Kelly, do you like Rock? Uh, do you like Bro- Do you think Rocco will bump to left guard and and Billy will start at right guard? I would do the I, I'm with Ryan and what Ryan said earlier. I would do the opposite. I, I, I would put I would put Billy at left guard and Rocco at right guard. The only the only reason to put Rocco at left guard would be run game purposes because you're going to get a big power left side. But I don't want any part of Rocco Spindler pass blocking to my quarterback's blind side. Not not that Rocco's a terrible pass blocker, but he's going to have some Ole moments. I mean, he just that's just who he's been so far. But his game is just more suited to that right side. I mean, honestly, like I said earlier, Ryan, in, in a perfect world situation for me, you know, Sullivan Absher and Rocco Spindler have great springs and they force themselves in the starting lineup and it's Billy Charles on the left side and it's Rocco Sully on the right side. I mean, I, like right. of the current roster, that would be the best ideal scenario for me. And mm-hmm. so I'd still have my power right side. But I just think your two most naturally gifted players – should be on your left side, barring a reason why someone should be on the right. And I just think that's Jagasol and Shroud. So I think Ryan said that earlier when he was talking about the upside offensive line. I agree completely. I'd much yep. rather see Billy at left guard. Uh, yes. And even if even if Pat Coogan's going to be your starter, even if Pat's still – I'd move Pat to the right guard. I mean, I, I would. And I think there's merit to having a veteran now like Pat helping the right tackle position a little bit more. Uh, Cause I have more question. I, I have more question marks about right tackle than I do left right now, even though it's Charles Jackson doesn't play one game. It is. <laughs> it is very crazy. Good question, Sean. Nate M. Not that it matters, but do you expect Benjamin Morrison to be rejected first round pick at the start of the year? If so, when's the last time a Notre Dame defensive back from Notre a defensive back from Notre Dame has done that? Um, Two years ago, Kyle Hamilton, owner 14 overall, would be defensive back. I guess yeah. he's asking corner. When's the last yeah, corner, probably corner. The first overall yeah. in the first round? Was it? I think who's the last one? Tom Carter. Like Tom Carter. As far as a guy that played corner his entire career, because yeah. Jeff Burris was taken in the first round in '94, he mm-hmm. started at corner early in his career. But by the time his career ended, he was he was safety. playing safety and he was drafted yeah. as a safety. Gotcha. So it's Tom Carter, Carter in the '93 draft is the last yeah. time Bobby Taylor played corner, but he was a second round pick and he was yep. picked as a safety more so yep. than a corner, I believe. And then Brian, Troy Pride was um, a third round draft pick. He was a and... fourth rounder. Julian, Fourth? yeah. So Brock Williams was a third round pick. Kavari Russell was a third round pick. Never I think Alan that. Rossum was the second or third round pick. Uh, Sounds right, if I remember correctly. Yep. And then yep. Love and Pride both went round four. Yep. So, um, and then hopefully, hopefully yeah, Cam goes second or third this year. So, did yeah. you see? Uh, see, Jar- did we? Uh, did we talk about this last week? See, Jordan Reed had him mm-hmm. in the second yep. late second round of his that was yep. that was and then Sounds jim like, nagy was yep. pumping him up this weekend as well did you see that tweet jim, thread jim, pump, jim pumps his uh senior bowl guys it's up man. Good, sure i'll does. take it man i'll take it i'll take it um, i'll definitely take i mean it. as uh, benjamin morrison i think is going to be in all the mock drafts right now like i i, I think the early mock drafts are going to have benjamin morrison in the first round conversation probably him and will johnson are the two guys from michigan that you're going to see most often i'll say this nate to it though i don't think i would necessarily grade benjamin morrison as a first round pick right now i still think that there is a play strength thing that needs to kind of get figured out a little bit right but i think that he has a good chance to be a first round pick if that does get remedied because he has all the natural movement skills and coverage ability that you want 
it's just about a year of development. So yes, I believe yeah. that he will be in a lot of the way too early mock drafts in the first round. Yes. So you're saying it's projection, what you expect to be normal sophomore to junior play strength or weight room yeah. jumps should help him. Ryan, I said yeah. this the other day, and I don't know if I said it on the show with you or not. I might have, but I'll say it again. If the only air there's, there's technical areas, there's different things that Benjamin Morrison can still get better at as a cornerback. But if the only thing that improves from last year to this year is he's yeah. stronger, he's a yes. much better player. Oh, in no my doubt. opinion. Especially if he's going to play a lot in the boundary on the next level, because yeah. guys are just going to get bigger and stronger yeah, in the boundary he, on the next level. He was so. still really good last year. I mean, that's oh, like yeah. it's almost kind of like we 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 as in the Notre Dame fan base kind of view him as a little bit of a well, it wasn't good as but it's because our expectations were so high. He was a really good right. corner last year. He um, was. He, there's just room for him to get better, which is a good thing. Yeah. Josh Buff with the Motivation Business Banker said, if Mike Denbrock isn't the best offensive coordinator in college football, who is and why, in my opinion, Denbrock is from a body of work perspective? Well, I mean, he's in the conversation. So, so we're just talking count... offensive coordinators or we're talking play callers? Well, that's what I was going to ask you, Ryan, because like I kind of count Lincoln Riley as an OC. Because he calls I, plays. I count Sark as well. I yeah. Count Sark as well. Yeah. Um, and Lincoln Riley, I'd put ahead of him. Sark, I'd put ahead of him. Um, I, I think Sark is the best play caller in college football, in my personal opinion. Just my yeah, opinion. He's but, very yeah. good. If you're he's taking what he's done as a head coach and as a coordinator, yep. it, yeah, he's been very good. Yep. Um, I mean, he's in the conversation. Is he the best? If if we're just talking about offensive coordinators that call yep. plays, not head coaches that call plays. Top five for sure. I mean, Maybe Chip Kelly's three. now in that conversation for me. Yeah. I mean, we'll see how his transition goes, but you know, Chip Kelly still knows ball. Yeah. Um, you know, a guy that I'm I'm really intrigued to see what he does in year two because I've loved what he's done so far in his career at UTSA in Oregon is Will Stein. Yeah. I'm I really like what he's done. His, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he's got to establish a little bit more of a trade. I mean, he walked into a pretty good situation last year. Let's see now what he does with a new quarterback and new running back and some new receivers and all that. But he's a guy that I have my eye on as a really good young, young up and coming coach. Um, Colt Necky would be in that bucket too. Yeah. He's not, he's not better than Denbrock right now, but if he yeah. is, if he was in that conversation of top three to four OC in college football in like two years, I wouldn't be shocked at all. About yeah. Him. Yeah, he did a really good job. And the thing is, right, he didn't just do a good job at at Buff at Penn State or excuse me, Kansas. He also did a really nice job his last year at Buffalo. I mean, oh, he's they, great they, Buffalo. which helped when them they had get Jared, when he had Jared Patterson at running back yeah. and he ran for yeah. almost you know set the rushing record for a single game. Like yeah. yeah. Really so um yeah, those there's some there's some really good young up and coming coordinators that I got my eye on, and you just named yeah. two of the, the the best in that regard. Well, I named one, you named the other, Ryan. Those guys are top of my list. Um, I, I, if we're just talking pure OCs, I think you could make a case that Sean, the Mike Denbrock is just as pure OCs, just like yeah. not Sark, not Lane, Lane Kiffin, not mm -hmm. not um, you know, uh, Lincoln, although I'd put Lane Kiffin third for just for me of that of that trio. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I'm trying to just, I'm trying to think off the top of my head who, who are we might be missing. I feel like we're missing somebody, you but, said, you um, said chip. I think chip said chip. Excellent. Yeah. Said chip. Cause he now counts in, in part of that. Cause he's. Well, the crazy part is, is that, is that usually the really good offensive coordinators get head coaching jobs very quickly. So they don't usually stay as offensive coordinators too long. It yeah. seems, which is pretty funny, yeah. but. Right, we got Sean Kelly over under six players enter the portal after spring ball. Man, I Sean, I need to read me out for a second, man. We need to stop doing the whole number over unders. Let me get a half here, buddy. Yes. Five and a half, six and yes. a half. Oh, man, I need a half. Number let's go here. five and a half, Ryan, because six and a half, I'm definitely taking the under, but let's go five and a half. Look, I'm going to still take the over. Now, here's why, Ryan, at five and a half, you have to have four. And I'm just talking scholarship right. players, I'm not talking walk ons, I'm talking scholarship players. You're at 89 right now, now that Luke Talich is on scholarship. You're at 89. You have to have at least four. So two yeah. other guys are going to get beat out or not pan out, and they're going to leave. So, yeah, I'm going to go over five and a half. I would, go, I would go over as well. I would go yeah. over. Yeah, Because I think six, six is, might be the six number. Is number. Yeah, yeah, six is the number. So if, if, Sean, if I have to abide by your rules, I'm going to say push on six, right? But if you give me five and a half, then I'll say over. We got Andrew Gilmore. Brian, you have you have admitted that conference can you, you have to admit. You have to admit, I'm sorry, you have to admit that conference consolidation means more 
interesting TV for football fans. We we're going to see a lot more power matchups from traditional powers. Look at the first few weeks. No, I don't have to admit that because I'm not, and this is not meant to be disrespectful, Andrew. I'm not in my 20s. And, and what I mean by that is I grew up in an era where this was already happening. Right, I grew up in an era where Ohio State would go play USC or UCLA in the regular season, and Miami would go all over the place, and Florida State would go play everybody, and Penn State would go play, you know, top teams. And we saw because here's the thing: when you when you what's happened in recent years is the conferences were big enough where they could fill a nine game schedule, and there was no encouragement to go play a tough non conference schedule because if you won your league and played nobody in the non conference and you were in the Big Ten or the SEC you were going to the college football playoff. So why risk playing somebody good in the postseason? Which is why I've always said I respect the heck out of Georgia because they've never ducked a, a non-conference schedule. People say, well, you know, Georgia played a weak schedule this year. Not their fault. They had Oklahoma on the schedule. The SEC canceled that game because when, when Oklahoma decided to join the league in 2024, the SEC nixed that game. They've played Notre Dame. They've played Clemson. Remember when nobody would schedule Oregon except – or nobody would schedule Boise except for Oregon and then Georgia decided to play them for two games? respect that big time so there just aren't enough teams to do that but it used to be common i mean bama in the 80s no lou holtz coached i think twice against alabama in the 1980s at home they played a game against number 10 alabama in south bend in 1987 so no this used to be commonplace so it's not that the conference the conference consolidation has forced that But that's not the only way to get to that. The other way to get to that is what we've talked about before, which is to go back to the old conferences, give me the Big East, give me the Southwest Conference, give me all those, give me a smaller independent group, not as big as it used to be, but give me one. Go back to regional games where there's seven or eight teams per league, eight, nine at the most, and you have eight regular season games and you're encouraged to play at a conference. That's the one thing that I'll say, Ryan, is if if we could get rid of the NCAA, get rid of conferences, get under a TV deal where everybody in the power five basically makes the same amount of money. I'd go back to the old leagues and you're at a 12 to 14, 16 team playoff or whatever the case may be. You're now encouraged to play tough out of conference games because you need to build up your strength of schedule to get in. But more so you're now building to make a run. You'll see this in college basketball all the time. Michigan state will have a really tough non-conference knowing that they're going to drop some games because that's what they felt they needed to do to prepare them for their conference run and against the end tournament. Smaller scale, you don't play four teams like that. But right. that's what's going to happen because if you're in the Southwest Conference and you only play seven conference games and your five non-conferences are a bunch of garbage teams, guess what? You're not getting in unless you win your league. So, look, I, I know that younger people grew up in an era of crap non-conference games and they think the only way to do it is this. But this used to be a normal thing. LSU used to play Notre Dame in the in, in you know, Bama 80s. Go look in the 80s and 90s. Notre Dame played against uh, Alabama. They played against LSU. They played against they played Michigan every week. They played Ohio State multiple times in the 90s. I mean, they they'd play all Miami and Penn State, and you know, they'd play all these teams. That used to be normal. USC and Alabama played back in the day. Ohio State and, and, and USC used to play. So, uh, you know, that, that used to be the way it was. There's, there's ways to get there. They need to get there. But do I have to admit that the only way to get there is through conference consolidation? No, I don't have to admit that. Because you're going to have years that it does create those, those schedules, but there's going to be years where the way it's scheduled is you're not going to get those games. You're get, it's purposeful that they did that in year one because they're trying to make a point. Look at this. Look at the TV stuff. It's not <laughs> once they get all the the stuff consolidated, they're going to do exactly what they've been doing. They're going to go back to protecting their top teams. Sure. Once they eat up the other two leagues, they're going to go back to protecting their biggest brands. And that's part of the reason they want to get even bigger. Cuz the bigger you get, the easier it is to 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 create your schedules in a way to protect your biggest brands. If you think this is going to be what we're going to see the next 10 years, I'm sorry, you're just you're mistaken. Because this is all for bargaining power. That's the reason the schedule was made this way. In five years, whenever, when the, the, because here's the consolidation they want is revenue consolidation. That's what they're trying to get to, to where all the money in the ACC and the Big 12 and the Pac 2 and all that are now in their leagues. And when they get back to that, guys, it's going to be the same thing that they've done in the past. 
The conference schedules are going to be geared towards protecting Bama, protecting Georgia, whatever the big brands are at the time. That's what it's going to be geared towards. That's what it is. And that's what it's going to be all about. So is it going to help for the short term? Sure. But let me see it beyond one or two years. Uh, But also, let's not pretend that college football started 15, 20 years ago. Because big-time non-conference games used to be a thing. You could not win. And here's where the playoff system has hurt a little bit. It used to be you couldn't you couldn't win a championship if you played some weak schedule. You yeah. couldn't. I mean, we've seen undefeated teams not win titles. Why? Look at their schedule. You didn't play anybody, right? You you used to be encouraged to play tough schedules, and so um, yeah, you used to see this stuff all the time. And and why? Because the leagues were all spread out. You had twenty some independents. In order to get a, a eleven game schedule back then that that was good enough to be in the top five to win a ball game and could play for a title, you had to play good teams. Had to, because if you're if you're Michigan and you didn't play in your and you didn't play anybody good out of conference and you went ten and one and lost Ohio State, no chance at a championship, none. But you can maybe have a chance to lose to Notre Dame early and get that good win and then run the table in your league or vice versa. You know, beat lose beat Notre Dame and then that win over Notre Dame helps carry you even though you lost Ohio State, whatever the case may be, to get into the Rose Bowl, win the Rose Bowl and compete for a championship. So. I, it's it makes me a little sad that young people grew up in the in the era of college football that they did, because they missed out on what what I grew up on, Ryan, which was you saw these type of games all the time, all the time. You saw teams playing across the country because you had to. There just wasn't enough conference games. You had the Big Eight, and the Southwest Conference, and the Pac Eight, and the Big Ten with ten was huge back then. That was like the biggest league. Everybody else was like eight or nine teams. And uh, I kind of miss that a little bit. I do. But that's, this isn't the only way to get to that point. But it is going to be fun this year, Ryan. There's going to be some really fun games this year. It's really really games. fun games. No doubt. Yeah, Bobby S. says, what how, What are we at now scholarship-wise? I read somewhere we were at 891. If so, what positions would be be looking to make some cuts? Well, they can't make cuts. So uh, nowhere. Uh, I have them at 89, Ryan, for, for is where I have them, with Luke Talich being on scholarship. So, yep. I mean, look, where, where will they be cuts? Look, somebody's going to get beat out and passed up and going to leave. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get into who that might be because I don't want to play that speculation game, and I just don't think it's fair to the players involved. And But uh, it won't be a problem getting down to 85, Ryan. It, it won't four, be. four players have to come off. That's all. Yeah, and there's going to be, you know, like like right now, and I, I hate to say this, but like right now, would I be shocked if Kevin Bauman doesn't transfer but isn't counted towards the 85? Nope. You know, because medical, right? Going, You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's going to be something like that too. It's not just about transfers or cuts. It's sometimes it's about, hey, man, you know, this injury you're hoping to come back from, just you're not coming back from and you can't play football anymore. And that's another way to free up scholarships as well. So. Sure. Got MT41. I don't mind our 2025 running back class, but I, I felt like it was a bit rushed. Am I crazy thinking both running backs are more Jabron Payne level backs than Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love level backs? I, I think that's fair, Ryan. I, I, I would yeah. say this. I think Jabron Payne was better than both of them as a junior. I mean, as a sophomore before his injuries. Um, I think I think that's fair. But uh, again, it, it's it's about roster building. There's a couple things about 25, Ryan, that need to be addressed. You and I know this to be true. Number one, it's not a very good running back class nationally. Now, there's some really good players. I mean, James Simon, there's some really good players in it. But the reality is yeah. it was going to be – oh, I, that kid from Florida, really like yep. him. There's a couple kids yep. like that. You know, Usman Chroma is a good player. He's got some Richard Young to his game. But mm-hmm. it's not a great, great running back class. And with how well you've recruited running back three straight years with Price – Love, pain, love, young, and Aeneas. Mm-hmm. You have to be one to say, "Hey, look, this is a program year." And so you get a guy like Daniel Anderson, who's a who's not a dynamic special back, but he's just a good football player that, that is maybe going to need time. But eventually, he's going to be more bought in to the process. Where if you go out and get a a Waltez Clark, for example, or James Simon, and they're sitting behind Kedron Young and Aeneas Williams and Jeremiah Love for two, three years, they're not going to last three years at Notre right. Dame. And and so now you you bring in a kid like that, and all of a sudden Jeremiah leaves after his junior year, and then the next year Kedron breaks out. He's gone after his junior year, and now all of a sudden you're you're those kids transferred because they didn't play, and now you're sitting there stuck with like, okay, we've got Aeneas Williams and a a bunch of freshmen, right? So uh, whereas otherwise that all happens, 
and you've got Daniel Anderson, and now you've got Aeneas and Daniel mm-hmm. and Justin Thurman, who are now juniors, and yep. Aeneas is a senior, and now you're like, you've got a pretty good running back room. And then you've got this really talented freshman in the 26 or 27 class that's ready to step in. So, you know, I, I think they made the decision that we're gonna we're gonna get some some program guys and guys with some versatility or or unique skill sets. And with Justin Thurman, you get two of those. You mm-hmm. well, actually you get all three. You get a program kid, loves Notre Dame, right? Yes. Bought in. You get a kid that's got some versatility, can return kicks. He can maybe even play some defense. He's a pretty decent DB. And then you've got a kid with a unique skill set because he's really fast. Yeah. Right. And he's got and, a, and he's got upside. I mean, literally, he was yes. a one year starter in his high school. So I mean, he was only a part time player as a sophomore. So I mean, I I think there's a world where Justin Thurman takes a pretty substantial senior year jump. Like if he develops into his body a little bit more, adds a little bit more power, and the speed maintains. I mean, there's no reason to think that he can't be a rise. I mean, he's already considered a four star kid by basically every platform, but I wouldn't be shocked if he jumps to like a top 150 kid if it clicks as a senior. I mean, like he has enough athleticism for sure. Mm-hmm. Agree. We had Adam B who says, suppose going into College Station, you can pick one of the 2023 starter starting non-position players to get 5% better. Who would you pick to raise Notre Dame's floor performance in that game? Jordan Matelho, Jack Kaiser. Uh, the non-position players. I, I think he just meant to say position players, right? I I assume. I don't know. Just read it the way it was Who said. would I pick I to know. get 5% better? Well, I'll say this with Batelho. I hope Batelho is more than 5% better than he was last year. He well, needs to be better start. than that. Yeah, it's a good, a good start. start. <laughs> if I could say who who could I say to get 5% better than he was last year of the 23 – um Hmm. That is a good question. 5% better than he was last year. Who could I live with only being 5% better than he was last year? Riley Mills? Yeah. Maybe. Riley Mills Maybe. 5% better means he's just tackling better. I mean, right? Yes. right? I mean, yes, players, like, yeah. Ryan, you saw the post I put up this weekend. Like, look, mm-hmm. Notre Dame's the only team in college football that returns two defensive tackles that ranked in the top 20 in pressures and run stops. Mm-hmm. No one's surprised that Howard Cross was in those. A lot of people were surprised how highly ranked Riley Mills was. Riley Mills also had a higher win rate at, with Corn Pro Football Focus as a pass rusher than Howard Cross. And I, I look, I, I kind of understand the reasons, but it does get frustrating when you see how down people are in Riley Mills. You can say he needs to finish at the ball better. He said it. I've said it. Yes, his agree. production <laughs> should be better than five and a half tackles for loss and two and a half sacks for his yes. talent level. But you also can't ignore the fact he was still pretty good. So it's like he wasn't as good as we thought, so he sucks and he's overrated, right? He was still very good. He just wasn't as good as he could have been and should have been. And so if he gets 5% better, it means what, Ryan? It means he's tackling better. He's getting to the ball and actually making the stops instead of forcing someone to get tackled by somebody else. And I'd be willing to bet you nobody in the front seven – had more plays that resulted in someone else making a negative play than Riley Mills. It's possible. You say yeah. that's fair? Yeah. The thing for him is he now has to be the one to start making those negative plays when he gets those chances. Yeah. And you saw flashes of it. So I think that's a good one, Ryan. If Riley's 5% better, it means yeah. he's finishing at the ball better. Mm-hmm. And that would make him really good. Really good. Yeah. So, yeah, I like that one. I like because my thing is like with a lot of the guys, Ryan, it's like I hope that Charles Jackasaw is better than five percent better than what he was in the ball game. And oh sure. And you think about yeah. a lot of guys like that. It's like Jack if Jack Kaiser's five percent better, he's really good because he was pretty good yeah. last year. That means what? Um I mean he he hits home on the quarterback on some pressures, maybe a little bit more. I you know, he wasn't used to rush a whole lot last year. I mean, what it would even mean for him to be five percent better? He was on a per snap basis, he was one of their most productive defensive players on the team last year mm-hmm. when you look at a per snap. You know, because that's sometimes too you gotta look at Ryan. You gotta say, well, this guy only had five tackles for loss, and that guy had nine. Yeah, but this guy played, or, or this guy had seven, but this guy only played 350 snaps, the other guy played 600. That's gonna factor into why your numbers weren't the same. Howard Cross had more pressures than Riley Mills. He also yeah. had a hundred more pass rush snaps than Riley Mills. Only seven more pressures on a hundred pass rush snaps is means you weren't getting to the quarterback as much as the other guy was. So you have to factor that into as well. But you know, Riley, I like the Riley Mills one. That's what I'm going to go with. That's a really good one. Could it, 5% better Riley Mills is 
mm-hmm. you know, borderline 10 tackle for loss guy, four or five sack guy. Would you say that's fair if his game yeah. improved that? Yeah, that'd be a good one. I like that's a good one, Ryan. Not that I'm surprised you came up with a good one, but it just I really like that one. Thank you. Yeah. Michael Rice with the question says, fellas, good afternoon. Playing hooky for my birthday. Which cornerback <laughs> do you expect to have the most picks and which defensive lineman to have the most sacks and which linebackers have the most tackles for loss? Well, first of all, Michael, happy birthday, uh, buddy. So very much happy birthday to you. And um, Ryan, so we'll go cornerback to have the most picks. We kind of talked about that earlier, right? We went Christian with Christian Gray, Gray is kind of yeah, what we're sure thinking on that one. Yeah. Um, most the alignment to have the most sacks. RJ, who do you Oban. think it will be? RJ Oban. R- who do RJ Oban. who do you hope it is? Jordan Batello. Jordan Batello. I like that. Yep. One. But actually, and, has a good number though. Not like a four and a half. Jordan Batello yeah. is your leading sack. Right. Like, right. 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 I'm good. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. Yep. Um. All right. So and then um, most Line tackles for loss. loss. Drake Bowen. I'm with Drake you on Bowen. that one. I'm going yeah. on that one. I like mm-hmm. that one. That's my pick as well. Uh, so, Michael, happy birthday. I also, real quick, too, uh, reminded me as well, I wanted to give a quick shout-out to Oliver Silva, who is a Notre Dame Class of 2017 member and uh, big Notre Dame fan, uh, watches our show. And he just got married. A buddy of mine was down at his marriage, at his wedding, and he just got married this weekend. So, Oliver, congratulations very, very much on your nuptials. I know the uh, the best thing I ever did was getting married to Angela. It's the, the best day of my life uh, outside of uh, – giving my life over to Christ. So I uh, hope it's as, as big of a blessing for you as being married to Angela has been for me, man. So congratulations very, very much. And thank you for your support of Irish Breakdown. Appreciate you. And Michael, same to you, buddy. Thank you for your support and happy birthday to you, my, to you, my friend. Archer, what's up, Archer? With March being a big recruiting month, who do you think the next commit in the 2025 class will be? And who do you think is the top target still on the board? Well, Jerome Bettis is my prediction for the next commitment uh, in the Same. class. Biggest yep. com- top top target on the board for me, it's probably Dallas Golden. Yeah, Dallas I was going to say Dallas Golden me. or Mark Zachary, one of those, one of the two corners. Yeah. I would say, yeah. Yep. yeah. Same page a lot yeah. today, Ryan. I'm digging that. Yep. <laughs> Chris W. Why do you think Tommy Reese favored duo so much? Will Mike Denbrock run duo as well? Mike Denbrock appears to be much more open to multiple run. I disagree with that. Tommy Reese had a much more diverse run package than Mike Denbrock. <laughs> and Mike Denbrock is a happy inside zone guy. Um, I, look, it, Duo's a very good run. And there's going to be some of the best O-line coaches I know like Duo better than inside zone. Others like inside zone. It's like with a lot of things, right? What do you prefer? You know, yeah. and, and, and what do you think your linemen do the best? I mean, Notre Dame ran Duo right down Clemson's throat for two hours you know, a couple of years ago. Right. I mean, and yeah. you know, um, I just think he liked it. I think he, I think he, he felt that it fit better with the things he liked to do per- personnel wise, you know, with multiple tight ends and some different things like that. I, I think that, um, you know, inside zone is not something I want to run a million times out of 12 personnel just for mm-hmm. me personally, with the way that Tommy used 12 personnel. I just, and I just think some people like it more, right. And it's like with anything else, why do you, why am I running? Why did David Shaw run, you know, gap schemes and man schemes as much as he did? Just it's what he liked and it worked. Sure. You know, like, like guys, there's no scheme. That's like, this is better than this one. Like I love inside zone for me. It's, it's mm-hmm. my go-to run. Right. But that's a personal preference. If you're going to tell me, Ryan, you know, you're, you're taking over a team and you're going to establish power. O as your primary play. Okay, cool. You got the personnel to do it. That's the same mm-hmm. question I got to ask when I'm going to implement zone. If I got a bunch of slow footed big kids, I'm going to probably be more duo than I am inside zone. Right. And so um, there's, there's, it's a personal preference thing. It's like with anything, as long as you know it, you can scheme it at an elite level and you've got the players to execute it. it I don't care what you run, you know? Right. And, and um, my thing, my problem with last year, right? I didn't have any problems schematically with Notre Dame running a lot of pin and pull stuff. None. There's merit to it. They killed people with pin and pull in 2017. Never, it seemed like every time they ran buck sweep, it was going for a 50-yard touchdown in 2017. Mm-hmm. I didn't like it with the personnel they had. I didn't think right. it would fit what they did. There's other lines that, like, you know, I mean, Oklahoma back in when they had some of those really good lines a few years ago with Lincoln Riley and Bill Benball, they were pulling somebody every snap. I mean, they yeah. were running some kind of wrap, trap, pull almost every play. Mm-hmm. So it's just, but they had personnel to fit it. 
And so that's my thing is I just think Tommy liked that run. I think it's a, it's a run that from what I'm told is a very popular run in the NFL. And I think that's where Tommy gets a lot of his inspiration is mm -hmm. from the, the NFL, uh, which is why I'm not surprised he's, he's at that level now. Um, Mike Denbrock's more of an inside zone guy. Mike Zembrock is going to run inside zone at least 75, 80% of the time this year, based on what he did at Notre Dame, Cincinnati, and LSU. The thing is, how is he going to run it? That's the difference. Because right. what you'll see different on film, looks. Ryan, is they'll run five different th – th there's not one version of inside zone. It's not yeah. this is it. You put a tackle back or a tight end backside, and you're going to run split flow. You're going to run base inside zone. You're going to run inside zone lock. You're going to run all types of different things out of it. You're going to run an inside zone wrap where you're mm -hmm. going to actually block out and bring your tight end back around and lead him through the hole. And it does sometimes doesn't even look like inside zone, but it is. You'll run read zone. There's all types of different ways to do it, and Denbrock runs all of them. Yep. So, you know, there there is versatility, and he'll run a little bit of counter. He did run some duo last year. Not a ton. It was more game-oriented where it looked like they were doing a little bit more duo. Uh, but um, – you know, he's gonna he's not gonna have a wide array of run schemes. He'll have about four or five. He's gonna run one of them a ton, a couple others is gonna be mix and match. He'll run some outside zones, stuff like that. But it won't they won't be running a ton of stuff. They won't be running a ton of stuff. They're gonna be really good at what they do. And that's been true for Denbrock going back his whole career. Would you I mean you watched a lot of LSU? Would you say that's accurate? They were they were probably more heavy towards zone last year than he would probably prefer. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, I've seen a little bit more diversity at Cincinnati and even in 2022 at LSU, but I just think that's what he felt they had because then they could yeah. do a lot with Jaden off of that. Sure. Um, but, yeah, he's he's going to be very, very heavy to inside zone like Tommy was with Duo. Yep, I would agree. would agree. Well, Ryan, I, I believe that's it, man. Okay. So, yeah, I believe that's All it. Right. All right, well. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Monday for Notre Dame football mailbag. Before you go, if you could please just do us a solid, hit that like button, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. If you're listening to us on YouTube, if you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, please five-star reviews and make sure that you're subscribed over there. Fours.irishbreakdown.com. As we had a question, March and April are going to be very busy months in recruiting. So make sure you go there for the latest recruiting intel. And obviously we're going through spring practice now. So any team intel and obvious instant analysis, fours.irishbreakdown.com. That is Brian Driscoll. I am Ryan Roberts. And thank you as always, my friends, for joining us today on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.